Block 1 Eodema Rifle and Sword Adventure, 01 69, by Starmark underscore 115. Chapter 1 Plant Fall. For Lieutenant Samantha Rose, today was the culmination of a childhood dream to breathe fresh clean oxygen and to be like those great pioneers of the old world coming across the seas to discover sights unseen. Hovering above the spaceship she was a passenger of was her destination, a blue planet below her with its green continents and azure oceans. A youthful excitement filled her veins as Samantha's eyes feasted in or over its Arcadian surface. She couldn't wait to be off this sanitized floating hunk of metal and finally stretch her legs on solid ground. It may not be Earth but the probe did say it couldn't see the difference between it. Samantha could hear the excited squeals of the first wave colonists behind her who too joined in her relation at looking down upon the planet to these people. It was not just a lone blue planet in the cold vacuum of space but a new hope, new dawn, a new home. Upon the edges of the explored frontiers of space, the star system of Benham orbited an Earth-like planet. One virginal of the old world's consumption, innocent of its devastations and untamed of its wealth, a whole new world, lands of untapped potential for some. A new beginning for others await those intrepid explorers and colonists on board the colony ship, the Eodem lay before them like a wrapped present underneath a child's feet. All they needed to do now, is to prepare the colony ship for plantfall and set forth the seven-ringed flower of the United Federation of Earth atop of its soil. There it is, my first tour of duty Samantha smiled, remembering her mission's assignment, for she didn't travel across the stellar highways to go sightseeing. She was bound by oath by the state to be in Benham 3. Checking her dress uniform for any last second adjustments, Samantha looked down on her single silver bar lieutenant insignia and neatly tidied its placement atop of her uniform. Having freshly graduated and immediately deployed to her first tour straight from West Point Military Academy, Lieutenant Samantha Rose, a rough cockney accented voice approached behind her. The lieutenant, fresh out of West Point, turned around to meet an imposing man that easily towered over her by about two feet wearing what she could identify as the high-end military Hercules exosuit standing in attention to her. Examining by the insignia that hung by his shoulders, the man is a sergeant. Yes? She turned around. The armored man greeted her with a salute and was promptly saluted in return by her. I am Sergeant Lewis Crocker of Strider Group squad automatic rifleman and your second in command. Welcome to the colonial militia arm. The man replied with a seasoned composure. Colonel Polonsky assigned you to become the CEO of the Studies and Observations Group, call sign Strider. I am here to take you to meet him by the bridge, the sergeant explained. Affirmative, take me to them, Samantha nodded. The two soldiers walked across the EO dam towards the captain's deck of the ship. On the way, Samantha noticed many of the colonists were peering just like her at the planet's orbit looking just as excitedly as she was. Many of the colonists had families with them and their previous lives career paths of carpenters, hunters, soldiers, scientists, and farmers will complement to make another successful colony of the youth. When humanity finally had the ability and technology to make a new home outside of their crowded planet of Earth. They started with Mars. After their red planet neighbor, they began to colonize a moon at Alpha Centauri. Then another one and another one until the youth has now successfully expanded to over 26 planets in over 9 star systems with a new planet, named Benham 3 being the newly inducted planet number 27 designated for surface colonization. So, tell me something about yourself Lieutenant? Crocker asked her. You're pretty young for someone taking command of a squad. I am from Quebec Prefecture, an Earthborn. Samantha answered, joined the officers' corps through West Point, graduated under Thayers and here I am. Thayers? The honor program? How did you do it? The sergeant asked. Well I... Samantha was about to explain her history when suddenly they were alerted to a commotion happening by the storage bay. Their vigilant straining automatically kicking their legs to assist in the disaster. Help somebody. A frantic cargo worker ran out and cried. Moving into the scene, the lieutenant quickly scanned her surroundings. There was an unmanned cargo hauling drone. As its namesake, 
It's meant to automate the logistical heavy lifting of standardized cargo boxes. The wheeled machine was running amok by itself madly, its contents spilling over and threatening to run over anything and anyone in its cybernetic tantrum. Meanwhile a safe distance away, two men argued. What kind of programmer are you? Yelled a hard-headed man in yellow with the word foreman written at the back of his jumpsuit. I didn't know you were still using the last update of the drone's custom coding files. Cried squeamishly his feeble subordinate. Well whatever damn thing you typed on the drone has turned it into a bull in a china shop. The colony's supplies are going to be destroyed. You're. The foreman was about to angrily discharge the blunderous computer jockey when Samantha physically intervened. Gentlemen, let's be reasonable here. The lieutenant pleaded for Amity. This idiot is going to ruin the colony's supplies. The foreman flailed. He said it was a mistake. He didn't mean to bug the drone. Calm down. Samantha defended the computer technician. You need to listen to your colleague. You're a foreman after all. He's saying he didn't know the coding was all different. She pleaded. This was not how people should resolve problems. Meanwhile, Sergeant Crocker assisted the lieutenant by keeping the angered foreman away whilst Samantha consoled with the technician. Now is not the time to blame each other. We have to stop that bot. She rectified to the foreman. Arguing over spilled milk as they say back in West Point Academy only leads to indolence. One must think then act. By separating the two discordants, the ardor of both men tempered down. F fine. But what about the drone? The foreman gritted himself as he finally was given space to think. Lieutenant Rose re-examined the room once again. There is no way this rogue robot should be allowed to run amok any longer. The cargo bay housed many items, from other drones, cargo boxes of the colony's supplies and several other supporting equipment. One such item caught her eye, an old-fashioned Maximoff cargo jack, much larger and heavier than the Nimbler autonomous cargo drone throwing a coding-induced cyber tantrum, but most important, manual driving controls. She has a rather unconventional plan in mind. Samantha ran towards the cargo jack and brushed off the dust off of its dashboard, coughing slightly as she looked for the ignition. Frantically her hand landed on the key slot, but it was empty and neither a swift search for the key card across the driver's table could it be found. I need the key. Samantha cried. Ah, there. The foreman pointed to a nearby workbench. Sergeant Crocker rushed towards it and found the gold-colored key card needed to awaken the cargo jack. Catch! Lewis yelled as he threw the key card towards her that the lieutenant managed to catch. Returning back to the driver's seat, Samantha inserted the key card onto the cargo jack's ignition slot and the Maximoff industrial lifter stirred itself to life. Show me! Show me! Samantha focused her eyes onto the rogue cargo drone now. She needed to time her move just right if she had any chance of putting a stop to this menace. Studying the mathematical patterns of speed the berserk robot drift aimlessly around and familiarizing the top speed of her cargo jack, Lieutenant Rose thrust the industrial lifter forward valiantly charging head first towards the cargo drone. The robot struck to a dead stop by the cargo jack's heavier frame causing bits of robotic sparks metal and its cargo of several construction supplies to spill onto the cargo bay floor. Shaken but still conscious, the lieutenant climbed out of the now totaled cargo jack as Crocker and the cargo workers gathered around her. You did it mom. The foreman cheered. Sorry. About your stuff though. Samantha groaned. Ah it's okay. Nothing me and the other workers can fix. It's better we lose one drone that risk it smashing anything else. The foreman nodded. And the IT guy? What about him? Samantha asked him. The foreman sighed. He had to admit he was too harsh on the computer technician. He made an honest mistake. It. It was my fault. He confessed. Good. Get this clean up before someone else notices. The lieutenant turned around and left the foreman and his colleagues in accordance. The cargo workers congratulated the young officer with an spirited ovation as she returned to Sergeant Crocker. Well I can see why you got yourself in the first place, because Jesus fucking Christ. I haven't seen shit like that since my tour at Mars. Crocker applauded. Well, I hope your first tour with me and Strider group will go well for ya.
They say the first tours for the green bloods are the ones that stick it the most for them. Crocker smiled. Let's keep moving, the rest of the squad shoob around this corner by the engineering bay. Taking one deep inhalation of breath, Samantha straightened her back and followed the sergeant once again. Crocker opened the door towards the engineering bay and lead his heroic commanding officer inside. There, sitting at a bunch of boxes tinkering with their weapons and robotic equipment sat two men. One young African male who wore his hair buzzed shortly atop whose fingers dexterously navigated the inner workings of those complex machines and in contrast a bearded and very messily haired Caucasian man with wrinkled skin on his forehead who was cleaning several youth rifles. The former was professionally dressed in new thief uniform whilst the latter was still in his civilian garments. At Nshun, the black skinned induced the bearded man to follow his lead and together they saluted. State your rank and specialization, Samantha ordered the two. Private First Class Ken Mudwin. I am a combat engineer specializing in drone operations and sapping, the African answered in a thick Nigerian accent. I, I, a B die root. M. Private, I think. Sniper. I mean marksman ma'am. The old man stuttered. You must be the recruit that Crocker has mentioned. How did you learn your marksmanship skills? To begin with, Samantha asked. I am a member of the Interplanetary Hunters Association. I am sort of a mid-tier member of the group, but I have shot about 1,000 or so animals on record. From predators to invasive species, I know how to survive in a forest just like I know my animals mom. Abidaya explained. That's pretty incredible of you Abidaya. I do hope we will work together quite well. Samantha nodded. I am Lieutenant Samantha Rose. I will be your commanding officer for Strider Group. She introduced herself. Oh. A girl? I I. Didn't know Abidaya stuttered. He observed the lieutenant and her figure with an astonishment which slighted Samantha with a brief stint of annoyance but she caught herself before her nerves could act out on impulse to the undisciplined man. He was just hastily sign recruit and she cannot be choosy of those who would her squad mates be at this time. Ah. Don't get the wrong idea. If you are a lieutenant, you gotta be pretty gutsy and smart about it. Like my daughter? Sorry. Not quite used to the military slang yet, he apologized. It's called terminology and none has taken Mr. Root. It is in my best hopes that you, Kane, Crocker and I will work together well for the duration of our service here in Benham 3. She smiled with a forgiving tone. Yes ma'am. Abidaya and Kane saluted in unison. So, Mr. Root, you will be the squad's marksman, right? Kane told me you're handy with a rifle and have a good eye despite your advanced stage. Crocker asked him. I'm not old. I am experienced. He protested. He was quickly butted on his back by Ken as the recruit chocked on himself for a brief second before regaining his poise. Anyways, here are my volunteer papers. Abed said as he passed off a few pieces of paper, signed, sealed, and approved by the recruitment officer to Samantha. I see, so tell me more about yourselves. Samantha asked them further. Abidaya dropped his bag and brought out two unusual items from his bag. First was a long bolt action hunting rifle from his bag. This is my Ruger point three zero eight rifle Leah, after my wife. Although not up to par with the latest tech in sniper rifles there's a reason this why it's still in production and popular for hunters looking for a great value. But wait. That's my primary. This is my beauty. Abidaya demonstrated his rifle to the squad then proceeded to grab the show his next weapon. He showed them a silvery hand cannon which looked like it could house large rounds and cause serious damage whether near or far. An elephant killer I presume? Damn you must be eager to shoot some big game huh? Ken chuckled. That's right isn't she nice? I call her April, after my daughter. I built her myself. Abed smiled. Those are all outside the regulations of standard issued weaponry. Sam reprimanded. She crossed her arms to express her disdain. However, Lewis placed his hand over her shoulder. At this stage right now, we need all the muscle we can work with. There's a reason why I asked him to join us. Besides based on my experience, the farther you are from the core worlds of youth the laxer we are about some rules. The militia can get away with certain stuff as long as they don't put other men at risk. 
Trust me you'll get used to this with time, Crocker explained. Plus, he's an American and they love their guns. He further added, Samantha sighed and gestured to Crocker to move on. She was not used to such informality to be done during her first tour as a full-fledged Ufif soldier. And you Private Mudwin? Samantha turned to the African. Myself? Ken asked. Like what are you outside of being a soldier? Samantha asked her, wanting to break the ice at the moment to get to know her team more. Well sometimes I listen to audiobooks and I tend to be quite handy when it comes to building things like camp, equipment, and our guns. I always try to keep everything for myself and the squad tidy and orderly. Ken answered. He's also a bit of an early riser too, Crocker added. That sounds great. You look to be quite capable enough. It is an honor to meet you. Samantha smiled. So when do we start? Abidaya asked. Tomorrow. When we disembark the engineers to start building up the first vital structures of the new colony we are on protection duty and also on hauling off some of the supplies and equipment too, Sam said. Lieutenant, you forgot our orientation with the colonel and the other SOG groups? Crocker reminded her. Samantha mentally cursed herself for her failure to remember the meeting. She gnashed her teeth as she took a deep breath. Oh. Where is the meeting? Samantha asked the sergeant. Follow me. We must not be late. Crocker rushed. The squad embarked. Hastily arriving at the captain's deck where stride a group alongside such other personnel of the Benham Three Colonial Militia is to meet with their superiors. They entered the room together to see that the colonial leaders were expectantly waiting for them while behind a large holographic table that displayed a hologram of the planet Benham Three. Everyone. Grab a mission folder with your squad's name on it please take a seat. Colonel Polonsky instructed. Strider group walked up to a table where several classified folders were stacked neatly together in a pile with their squad's name written atop of the cover. They each grabbed one before proceeding to sit down together about three rows away from the front where Colonel Polonsky briefed them. Lieutenant Rose gulped nervously as she observed her first real mission briefing. It was exciting for her but also nerve-wracking now that she is finally in the big leagues. The same leagues as her late further was. She looked over the other SOG groups who were either attentively listening to the colonel's speech or quietly studiously reading their mission folders. Compared to everyone else she was the odd one out due to her green-blooded nervousness that made her shrink below in shyness as she read her folder. All right men. Within 24 hours we will be touching down on Benham 3 at the pre-arranged coordinates and begin the construction of our colony. Your job is to establish a perimeter around the initial construction site and scan and neutralize any threats from God the only one knows what kind of creepy crawlies might be out there. I know that some of you had just been transferred from other places or were just fresh out of the academy but I can assure you that if we follow the plan, Things should run smoothly for about um, at least a year and six months minimum. Governor Jeremy White will be our commander-in-chief for this operation, Polonsky briefed. The man, as Samantha can remember reading from her folder is a PhD in agricultural developments. Jeremy White is assigned to handle the civilian aspect of the colony's well-being but he also is involved in the colony's defense since he is effective thanks to his governorship giving him the ability to command the colonial militia. Although he does let Polonsky from time to time make most of the military decisions, he is a very cautious man who prefers to know everything that is needed to be known of a problem, a scenario, and or a task for his decision-making process. So far we are currently undermanned in our militia than what is supposed to be our minimum. We lack about 47 personnel out of 100 and we needed volunteers yesterday so we are forced to draft some men in to fill up the gaps. Colonel Polonsky said. Samantha continued to read her briefing folder meanwhile. The colonel began to talk down with the other SOG groups about their objectives and responsibilities upon landing at Benham 3. From her point of view, the colonel used more informal wordings than her instructors and professors would speak like back in West Point. So Strider Group's job is reconnaissance and collection missions. All exploring the wilderness the old-fashioned way as I read. Samantha nodded her head approvingly while her eyes browsed the file studiously. Indeed, 
although you and each and every one of you in this room will have to be vigilant for any signs of danger once you start running about all over the planet on your land cruises, you could also be called in to assist in peacekeeping within the colony we will be setting up soon upon my call. At this stage, the biggest danger could be more pirate attacks from above rather than the planet. Therefore you will all be equipped with radar sensors and your land cruisers some SAM launchers to shoot down any pests that you come across. Polonsky concurred. Samantha continued to read her file, her eyes curiously looking at her squad's badge. It was showcasing a flying crane, a symbol of freedom, and intrepid journeying with a set of binoculars signifying the squad's function as a reconnaissance team. Anyway, back to the planet itself. Unfortunately, we are undermanned for several of our squads due to several unexpected bureaucratic adjustments from the higher-ups. For those who are in short supply of men, you will need to round up some volunteers from the current batch of colonists we have to join the colonial militia at least until the second wave colonists touches down. Polonsky added, Bureaucratic adjustments? He explained Colonel. Samantha raised her hand. When we lost the probe several weeks ago, the higher-ups wanted us to extend the studies and observations groups twofold. Added try to warn Governor White we don't have the people to do so but he insists that we increase our eyes and ears around the colony upon touchdown. Polonsky explained. Your squad. Strider group is it not? You lack, a, a rifleman, a lifesaver, a radioman, and a grenadier? I think you can explore the stock of colonists who can fill up those roles nicely for the former too. He pointed out. I see. I will search for candidates. Samantha saluted. And you are. Lieutenant Samantha Rose. As in. The Rose? The colonel asked her. My father. Captain Desmond Rose is my father. She said. The hero of Beltavif and Medal of Honor recipient. She said. You have some big shoes to fill in Lieutenant Rose. But it is an honor to have the child of the hero of Beltave following in the footsteps of their father to be under my command. He solemnly cracked a heartfelt smile. Yes, I hope I can be like him one day. Samantha smiled. Dash. The very next day, with all systems checked for the first landing of the youth into the new world complete, the EODEM sets her feet down on Benham 3S soil. The activity inside was lit a buzz at the loading bay as people scrambled to get everything that is needed to build the colony out of the ship and onto the ground immediately. All right steady. Steady. Go. Cairn signaled a large truck to safely descend from the colony ship's rampart. Good that's the last one now, Samantha said. The EODEM deployed the engineers that she held as soon as it had touched down on the green fertile plain it has set foot on. The soon-to-be-established colony was surrounded on its south a small lake that will act as its freshwater source while on its north and eastern directions was a dense forest that will soon be cleared off to Admorum. By the west is by far the only unchallenged approach of their surroundings with a clearing that leads to the great unknown. Foundation digging and the moving out of the colony's supplies are being implemented as the makeshift colonial defense force began their routine patrols. Strider group, consisting of Samantha, Crocker, Cain, and a Bidia moved around near the ship's docking bay as they overview the dozens of people leaving the ship to taste the fresh air of the new world. One of those people was a middle-aged looking man with a thick black beard who approached them. He carried a large bag behind him that looked like it came straight from a department store's camping section. Sam shrugged and let go of her grievance with the American marksman. She looked back onto the ramp and then noticed that a man was being escorted by two armed guards. He was wearing a brightly colored neon jumpsuit with a serial number behind his back and a name tag on his left breast that said Diaz. Hey don't push me. Let gravity do its work, the prisoner said. Shut up you scum. You are needed as manual labor by the construction zone right now so make your thieving ass useful, said one of the guards. I didn't know that we have penal colonists with us, said Samantha. Yeah from what I have heard from the guards he was a bank robber who worked for the Ramera mob before he got unlucky, Lewis added. Hey, to be fair I wasn't even the intended target of that sting op I got caught in. It was the fencer was the real target. The prisoner turned around to face the squad. Hey, 
No stopping, off you go, the guard said as he was lifted by his two escorts and was dragged away to his fate. Please, I hear you are conscripting people or something. Please take me with you. I hate these two guys here and they call me the meanest things. The prisoner yelled while being carried away. He was kicking and struggling to be free but the two guards simply overpowered him. Like I would. Samantha thought to herself with a snickering feeling of elitism and moral superiority over a criminal scum like that yes fellow. The rest of the day went up with nothing else unusual for the squad other than the occasional lost child looking for his missing parents and a few radio calls from HQ back in the colony ship. By nightfall, the prefabricated houses that will serve as temporary housing for the construction crew and the security team were built alongside a storage house for the building materials and food that will be cooked in a mess tent that was built adjacent. The rest of the colonists retreated to Eodem because of the comfortable air conditioning provided compared to the cool light breeze that was washed to the outdoor camp. Samantha settled into her bed which will be her new sleeping abode for the next weeks until a real house can be built for her and the rest of the defense force. For the rest of the day, Strider Group Help coordinated the engineering and labor effort of the construction of the first Benham Three colony. Little did they all know, underneath the foliage of the bushes surrounding the EO Dam colony ship, a pair of eyes observed them quietly. With a sinister cackle, the figure retreated to the darkness of the forest. Dash. Another day has passed for Samantha's first tour of duty. It was all surprisingly quiet for her. She was expecting to be bombarded by hordes of paperwork, assignments or other missions but the colonial defense's high command was acting very conservatively as of late. As for her second in command however, if Lewis knew anything from his twenty years of service it's that something doesn't feel right about this place. He felt like he was having another sleepless night in the middle of a war zone where he is always alert at his surroundings in case an enemy tried a midnight attack on him and his brother in arms, a real fear when in the field, his eyes reddened with exhaustion and sand as he prematurely rose from his bunk bed. His squad mate K and took the top part of the bed while the new guy B. Dyer slept at the bed adjacent to his left. For the women like Samantha, she was in a separate barrack tent for the women members of the militia. Ah. Fuck. Another sleepless night again. Lewis rubbed his eyes. Walking out of the door of the barracks he noticed judging from the faint glow of the tent's clock that shone with glow in the dark paint on its hands and our signs that it was around 4 a.m. Even though many of the planets that the youth has expanded upon, scientifically speaking, Planets have a different means of rotation around their axis and to spin itself around 360 degrees of itself the earthlings are so used to the standard 24 hours a day, 7 days a week and 365 days a year plus 1 extra day for every 4 years that they have still maintained the standard 12 hour or military hour clocks and the Gregorian calendar despite the actual time on the planets to say something different otherwise. He can recall during his tours of duty that there were several planets where the sun stays up in the sky much longer than back at Earth that it was normal to sleep for six hours during a clear day in the sun or the other way around where it is pitch black as night but his watch would always say that it's only noon. Might as well just sneak off a bit and enjoy the peaceful air, it's beautiful out here compared to the last ones. He spoke to himself. Compared to all the other places he has been and serviced, Benham 3 was like a trip to a nature preserve. He was tired of the many shithole places he had to call his office space from desert wastelands to wintry mining colonies on the verge of socio-political collapses so he, with a few back scratching and kiss arsing to his commanders he was transferred to the quiet job of being part of an expedition to the lush continental world of Benham 3. Walking out of the barracks, he quietly strolled around the camp. He envisioned that the ongoing construction that was quietly sitting idle at the dug-up land to rise to a peaceful community, peace a word that he finds an elusive luxury to him. Perhaps after he finishes this tour of duty he will retire from active service and might even buy a piece of land here and settle down to live on the rest of his days quietly. But that kind of tranquility has today evaded him again as he noticed a suspicious smoke cloud rising above the construction yard. Smoke? There's fire? Lewis internally exclaimed. 
He stopped his strolling and began to jog forward to the scene. Something has gone wrong if a fire accident of some sort happened this early during the colonization period. Running past the tents, the sleeping construction workers he reached the source of the smoke. It was the storage tent where they keep a good chunk of their starting food supplies ranging from soup cans, luncheon meats, instant drinks and even a huge box of Grandma Curly's Italian spaghetti sauce which is the love of many children and soft-hearted manly men everywhere were on fire. Raised in flames and smoke towering above it, Crocker watched in horror and micro flashbacks of his previous tours that flooded his mind for a moment. His psychodrama was halted when he hears incoherent screaming and yelling coming closer to him. Large humanoid figures in what looked like they were wearing cloaks and some crude looking leather wear emerged from the smoke. To his shock, the cloaked figures had faces of real and normal flesh and blood humans and their said faces had a sociopathically painted on their heads. They were wielding an assortment of weapons of what Lewis can remember were commonly used during the late medieval ages such as swords, axes, and maces. He counted about ten figures walking closer to him as he noticed that they began to laugh and tease him as if he was some sort of prey. One such figure held a wooden crossbow by his hand and began to aim at. Fuck! Lewis exclaimed as he reflexively ducked and turned tail and ran. Normally he would fire back and seek cover at a similar situation back at his previous campaigns but he was essentially naked with only the clothes on his back and his skin. I need to wake everyone up. Lewis instinctively told himself, with the concerns and lives of dozens of people weighing him. He ran around through the colony camp towards his barracks while crying out to the civilians and any militia member of the horrible change of events. We are under attack. Attack. We are being attacked. He cried into the night. Several soldiers and civilian engineers were aroused by his shouts until they realized what was happening. Lewis continued to run, his heart racing and adrenaline pumping through him. This was the same surge of power he had felt in all of his long career of combat duty. Yet Lewis couldn't believe what he had just seen. Men in late medieval wear and arms? Is this a dreamlike sort of crazy stuck in another world show where the hero from a cosmopolitan modern background has found himself in the middle of a fantasy world filled with danger and monsters at every corner? Then a loud neighing of what would come from a horse followed by an even louder sound of a horn going off was heard. At first, Lewis thought it was the hazard alert siren that would warn colonists of an incoming natural hazard is approaching but the pitch was too low for it to be the real siren, plus the noise was coming from the direction away from the ship where the siren would be. Turning around to the direction of the sound he saw a man wearing similar clothes from the same earlier intruders on a horse. To his realized horror, the expedition didn't bring any horses. Higher, said the strange cloaked figure on the horse with an open iron sword unsheathed on the man's hand. His steed raised itself and stood upward on its hind legs and charged towards him. Crocker's instincts and body memory kicking into the old soldier. He rolled sideways and narrowly dodged a sabre's slash from the horseman, quickly standing up. He saw the horseman turn around to make another charging run to cut down and trample his quarry. As the intruder charged again towards him, Lewis bent his legs in anticipation. At the last possible moment, he dodged the blade of the intruder again. The horseman yelled in frustration as he harmlessly cantered past Lewis and turned around again, more determined to kill Lewis than before. Enough of this shit, Lewis cursed, setting one left foot forward and his right foot back in a get set position like in a grade school relay race. He set his sights on the center mass of the charging horseman closing in towards him. With a loud and mighty roar that was passed down from his Maori heritage from his mother's side, he charged aiming straight at the center breast of the horse and with a great big leap he tackled down the horse alongside its rider with it. Climbing out of the body pile with a sore shoulder he walked over the knocked down horse and over to the rider whose pelvis was crushed by the weight of the horse. Lewis knelt down and repeatedly punched him in the face until he was sure the man was not going to wake up from that any time soon. He began to pant heavily after his repeated pummeling of the poor man until his hands felt sore. 
If he was wearing his exosuit he wouldn't even feel that much soreness from his shoulders nor the aching of his unprotected knuckles from the repeated ground and pounding he delivered. Standing up and grabbing the sword of the unconscious rider in case he encounters another of these intruders or more like bandits seeking to plunder a defenseless camp of people. Reasoning that thought earlier made Lewis' blood boil again. Barracks. Barracks. Lewis suddenly remembered what he was supposed to do and dashed towards his objective. The once serene and sleepy environment was turned into a nightmare vision straight from the scenes of a terrorist attack at a refugee camp in the news as bandits flooded by foot and by hoof at the camp. Tents were set on fire and belongings were stolen. Lewis soon saw one such enemy bandit in front of him with a sword in hand and tensed into a defensive position. With all of his strength and adrenaline. Lewis charged and buried his sword down at the bandit easily penetrating his parrying stance and killing him outright. However, the sword was buried so deep into the hostile human that the soldier struggled to set it free. With a strong pull powered by his legs to his arms, he pulled out its sword only for the blade snap of the sword handle. Dropping the broken weapon to the ground, Lewis ran again this time to not get distracted by the horrors he is witnessing around him. Dashing and strafing away from any of these hostile bandits he made it safely to his barracks which was still unscathed from the bandits' hands. He could also hear the loud blaring of the alarm siren coming from the EO dam in the distance noticing now that the higher-ups have noticed the chaos from outside their ship. Quickly opening the door, closing and locking it behind him. He yelled at his fellow soldiers who were just truly awakened from their slumber by the sound of the alarm siren rather than the barracks alarm clock that goes off at 5.30 a.m. Wake up, we are under attack. Grab the guns. Chapter 2, A Fiery Dawn About six months before the events of Planned Fall, Emperor Old in the Black and Eyes could only stare in both awe and in anxiety as he saw a mysterious comet pass by his palace. In the most common of tongues, the comet was called Delta Gars comet that passes about every 200 years or more. The old story stated that whenever the comet ever made a pass from Gliese a great change was about to happen very soon. The emperor remembered his history lessons that whenever the comet was recorded to have passed by, a great and tide-changing event or series of events would affect the entire world for good or ill. One such recording of the comet's passing was the collapse and splitting of a once united elven continent from across his empire's borders due to political infighting, ideological disagreements, and courtly intrigues. The continent has been a state of cultural, political stagnation as no side seemed poised to decisively end the war. Emissaries of the two sides have been known to pay off mercenaries from all over the world to the meat grinder in an effort to break the stalemate but to no avail. The once proud elves were caught in a balancing act of both maintaining the war effort whilst also keeping their civilization relevant in the geopolitics of Gliesia. The next time it had passed, Several volcanic eruptions in the northern peninsula have caused the region to become unsuitable for farming but the aftermath of that disaster was the opening of several rich mining veins of a new kind of metal called scandonite. The metal is very malleable at its purest form but when fused with more commonly used metals such as iron can forge into very durable weapons and armor. It was to no surprise that with their new arms in hand the northern peninsula tribes began to raid their southern neighbors for goods and luxuries not found in their homeland. The Northmen sailed and pillaged to the farthest reaches of Alden's empire and beyond with no signs of stopping. And the previous passing of the comet was by far the most relevant to him, for when the comet passed, the ancestors of the Slaggy formed what would be known as the Empire of Slaeja with an iron authoritarian fist, forming great cities and conquering far-off territories. They stamped out all who dared oppose them from political, military and religious organizations alike. The Empire of Slaeja is without any kind of doubt the largest and the most cosmopolitan civilization in the world of Gliesia. Its capital of Herring Point is a city filled with giant towering castles that houses the vain and prideful nobility from the commoners below with Alden's palace being the biggest of them all. The capital sat next to a bay where many ships pass in and out with their goods and people. However, his empire, 
Despite its many modern features had the flaws that could have it all crashing down. The greedy nobles politic over lands, resources, and power. The military is more concerned with gaining a triumphal parade after they finish a campaign by bringing in many plunder, slaves, and an accounted number of around 25,000 slain savages. Racism against non-slaggies was common despite a few progressive measures such as citizenship and military services provided to them. For Emperor Eldin, in order to keep his empire from falling into a state of anarchy and go the same way as their elf neighbors, he had imposed several Machiavellian methods of keeping everyone happy from bread and circuses political subterfuge to observe and detect any kind of hostile takeovers and even some good old-fashioned public relations were propaganda of how advanced and safe the Slaagian Empire is. He has even created an organization of national heroes who have proven themselves to be both fanatical at the Empire's ideals and are skilled at quashing dissent and the occasional invasions from hostile neighbors and rivals. Yet the comet's rival has made the emperor nervous. What could the omens mean? To answer this question, he hurriedly walks to the empire's conclave of mages. The conclave is an organization that is dedicated to the study and harnessing of magic in all its forms. It has attracted scholars from all over the world due to its famed library and observatory in the capital. The services that the conclave can provide to the empire were education and private tutorials on harnessing magic from gifted individuals who can afford the tuition, the collection of magically attuned artifacts and crystals were most important in the light of recent events for Alden. Astrology. Grandmaster Owen. The emperor hailed. He noticed that Owen too has the face that turned pale with worry just like he is. If it's about Jeltogar's comet I am working on it. Come, the Grand Master said. The Emperor followed Owen, one of his most trusted advisors and closest of friends into the observatory of the Conclave. Entering the room, he was surrounded by many wizards and mages that formed the administrative power of the Conclave. All were nervously whispering to each other what the comet's passing could mean for everyone. Owen walked up to large luminescent crystal where several high-ranking wizards awaited him. It is called the Mirror of Answers. Its purpose was to detect fluctuations in the planet's mana energy levels and also used as a conduit of power to globally cast spells from within the confines of the conclave without having to be near the targeted area. The crystal shone brightly illuminating the room in a rainbow of colors as the wizard stood in front of it. My fellow wizards and nobility of the Empire, we are gathered here on this very hour in a time of great uncertainty. The appearance of Jeltigar's comet has caused the magic of this world to writhe and scream. Many of our more minor sensitive of colleagues have collapsed in exhaustion over this disturbance. Owen spoke to the crowd. Answerless, the founder of this very conclave and recipient of this very crystal, the mirror of Answerless from Aralea, the goddess of wisdom. The Grand Master Wizard turned around and raised his hand close to the Mirror of Answers. Magical energies poured out of his hand and connected to the crystal. I and my fellow Master Wizards will now use our powers combined to interpret the signs of this comet to foresee our future. He continued, but that's only theoretical possible. Seeing the future? The scholars said you need to expend a lot of magical power just to even get even a glimmer of foresight. Alden questioned. His eyes widened in shock, I know my lord, but the comet's passing has caused the magical energies of the world to be more sensitive and easier to draw from. Plus, I know it's theoretical but now due to our circumstances, we must put this theory to the test. It's for the good of everyone here and glee easier, Owen replied. The Grand Master, unlike many people who shared high reins of power, was always someone who's a concern for people lower is always given a priority. Having climbed his way up to his title of Grand Master at the Conclave of Mages by participating in projects, expeditions and campaigns that concerns the well-being of the Empire's citizens and military such as using wards to fend off rogue spellcasters who turn to banditry and using shielding spells to protect knights in the thick of battle has made him respected among his peers, the common folk, nobility, and soldiers. However, Despite such achievements and fame, 
He has been slowly aging and death which has many of his peers and supporters concerned of succession and also him dying with many secrets and ideas that remained locked inside his head. Owen closed his eyes and begins to concentrate his mana through the crystal in a bid to break through the fabric of time and see the other side. The other mages assisted by pouring their powers into the crystal. The passing of the comet has increased their mana reserves and output efficiency greatly. If they had done this within a time of the mana energies being in their regular climate they would have collapsed in exhaustion by now. Alden, the nobles, empire generals and the mages alike could only watch nervously at the people near the giant crystal. Many of them held doubts and optimisms of the Grand Master's assurance that his plan will work. For minutes that felt like hours, the hall was silent no one dared disrupt the master wizard's concentration. Then Owen's eyes opened, but instead of the whites of his eyes and his dark brown irises, his eyes illuminated brightly with the sky blue energies of magic. I can see the veil break open, I have reached heavens, Owen yelled. The crowd gasped in awe, yet I do not see paradise just nothing but the stars and Anadi's palace. The rest is all just the void. He added, the wizard's hands began to tremble to show the first signs that he is reaching mana exhaustion. Wait, I hear a great roar in the void. By the gods. It's a celestial messenger. Wait. No it's not of any of our gods. I see. The birth of a new god. It rises. Hungrily, the Grand Master suddenly shouted. His body began to sweat heavily. They are not gods, but demons, their bodies clad in iron and magic of fire and brimstone. Owen raised his voice louder, the celestial messenger sees our world and demands it as a meal. And, and, Wag, Owen and the master wizard's eyes that were shone with light exploded in geysers of blood as they collapsed. The magical energies exploded throughout the room causing a great shockwave that knocking down several members of the audience. Screams echoed the hall as Elden, his bodyguards and other members of the conclave rushed towards the bleeding master wizards. Grand Master, are you okay? Speak to me. Elden questioned. The revelation brought forth by Owen has opened up even more questions than answers about the comet's prophecies. After leaning on the lap of a healing mage who wrapped his now empty eyes sockets with bandages, Alden curled his finger backward, gesturing the Emperor to move closer. Alden leaned a mere inch from the lips of Owen to hear what he has to say. All the world will burn by the demon's hand. Lest we stop their messenger from seeing, he whispered to his ear. Dash. Samantha didn't have time to even wear her shoes when the sirens rang. She had to quickly rise up from her bed and run outside to find out what was going on. All that greeted her, however, was fire and screaming. Why this, can't be happening, Samantha said. Her mind raced within her struggling to understand what's happening. A fire? An accident? A natural hazard of some sort? Letting her mind be clouded with so many thoughts, however as to lead her to be unaware of a sinister bandit who sneaked up behind her and pushed her down. Samantha tried to push herself back up but a quick leather boot of the bandit pushed her. Fearing for her life she bit the man's feet as hard as she could, causing the man to yelp in pain and recoil his foot away from pressing down on her. She could swear she may have made her assailant's toe bleed, spitting out any possible dirt she might unintentionally put on her mouth and stood back up. The bandit yelled out in a language she couldn't understand but she presumed if she could it would most likely be get over here. He charged with his axe in hand ready to overpower Samantha with his superior weight and height until Rag, a voice yelled as a bright orange blur moved past her. Her eyes could barely focus on what she saw before the bandit collapsed to the ground with a horrible black iron cut on his face. The orange blur soon visualized itself with a familiar orange prison garb. The prisoner after checking to see that the bandit was definitely not coming up from a quick and hard blow from a concrete brick to his soft unprotected head grabbed the man's axe and began to grind it on his handcuffs. Oh. It's you again, Samantha said to Diaz. After Diaz cut his binds free he stood up now able to move his hands around freely again. But his newly acquired freedom, of movement at least was soon disrupted when Samantha grabbed him by the neck and pushed him to the wall causing him to choke. How did you get away from your guards? Sam angrily questioned. Diaz coughed hair and spit only being able to utter one single word. D. 
D. Duke, alarmed by his words and with only a second to react Sam let go of Diaz and ducked, just barely dodging a straight thrust towards her center mass. Diaz too also quickly dodged the blade by sidestepping as soon as Sam's grip was released. The bandit's sword shattered upon impact with the hard surface of the wall causing him to be stunned with disbelief over the loss of his blade. Capitalizing on the opening, Diaz uppercut the groin area of the bandit causing him to bend over in pain grasping his prized jewels. Samantha added her own damage by punching the man by the chin. The most vulnerable area of the human head or at the very least she assumed that bandit is a human. Their attempted murderer fell down face first onto the ground unconscious. Diaz gasped for air whilst Samantha cracked her knuckles. Teach you to assault a woman. Samantha spat. She then turned to the prisoner who had finally just removed all of his restraints. You stop right there. She ordered him. Blay. You talk like we are enemies yet we fought like brothers a second ago. Diaz replied. That's not what I want you to tell me. You stay and wait for the MPs to contain you. Samantha pressed. Yeah, I think a corpo like me would be the least of their concerns right now. Diaz answered, pointing to the raging fire that engulfed the colony ship's landing zone. Where? Would I run away to? He reasoned. I I I. Just don't try to do anything funny. Samantha gnashed her teeth and clenched her fist ready to pounce at the criminal if he as much attempts to weasel his way out of her temporary custody. Diaz calmly relaxed his composure and turned his arms left and right then faced Samantha. I still got a tracking chip on my arms so even if I ran you can easily find me. Plus I can't survive for crap out there. Kesseheim kid all the way. He he he. Diaz chuckled. Samantha absorbed the words of Diaz very carefully. She hates to say it but the criminal scum has a point. So, what now? We just sit here and wait it out or we gonna fucking do something? Diaz asked her. His tongue tweaked slyly as if taunting her. We cannot allow these marauders to damage the ship or our supplies. We must fight them off. Samantha growled. A redhead who actually is a hothead. Your hair is actually naturally red right? That's not like them sassy. Dies I see back in Kesseheim? He asked coyly. Just be useful or do whatever I say Corpo. Samantha augured. Of course. Lieutenant Tilda lead the way, Diaz said. Samantha can only roll her eyes over the criminal's attempts at suave words. The two, moving together as a pair, ran through the burning campground. Both of them could only stare in horror as they saw bandits stealing, rampaging and burning the whole site to the ground in an orgy of chaotic destruction. The sound of fire, guns, screaming, and sirens drowned their ears as they confusingly forged onwards. Hey, aren't those guys over there your squad? Looks like they are putting up a fight. Diaz pointed. Sam turned her eyes to his direction and saw Crocker. A bed and Ken making a stand against a large group of bandits by while guarding a few boxes of guns, ammunition and a group of civilians. The two lowered them to avoid stray gunfire and dashed for the cover and safety of the militia soldiers. Check your fire, check your fire, Crocker yelled. Samantha safely made it to the makeshift cover her squad has made followed by Diaz. Lieutenant, thank God you are here, Crocker said. His face was sweating and weary from the combat action he has suddenly found himself in. The same can also be said for a B. Dyer and Kane too. Hey aren't you? Kane commented on Diaz who followed Sam. Yeah, like fucking caused this shit to happen yeah? Diaz sarcastically chided before ducking down by a pile of boxes. I can tell you all this. It's not the corpos this time. Really, Sergeant. What the hell is going on? S. Citrep. Samantha asked. Shit, where can I start? I saw a bunch of these assholes burning and stealing our stuff. Me and Rest grabbed some guns from the armory and placed them here so we can pass along some of the guns to the other militia soldiers and anybody willing to fight back. Most of them grabbed a gun and head straight to the retreat point which is the colony the ship for safety. The colonel radioed me and saying we should hold our ground here and cover the evacuation. Crocker explained. Damn it. How did these people avoid our security systems? Samantha asked Crocker. According to the TACOM they thought it was just animals. Nocturnal animals coming out for the night. 
But then they started bashing our drones angrily and lighting our encampment on fire. Ken explained. Go grab a gun and let's fight them back. Crocker shouted. Samantha and Diaz turned around to see a case was opened that revealed a handful of spare arms and ammunition. Additionally, she saw the frightened and crying faces of the civilians of that were trapped in the middle of a battle. A mother was holding her three crying children and a young woman had her hands clutching her head while swaying her body back and forth. There's many of them. An engineer panicked. Mommy, a child screamed, caressing the bosom of his mother. Samantha felt the weight of the world and the heat of the battle burden her as she nervously grabbed a rifle from the weapons case alongside Diaz. But before the criminal could get his hands on a weapon, Samantha grabbed his forearm firmly. And what are you doing? Samantha questioned firmly. I got a right to defend myself, right? You're barely keeping this corner standing with the MG and all. Diaz replied. Sam began to reason herself to the scenario at hand. She recalled from her leadership training that there will be times where there will be choices that seem to be unsavory at first glance but if certain criteria have been present can ultimately be the correct choice. She bit her lips and swallowed her pride. Fine but under two conditions. You return that pistol as soon as this is over and if I see you do anything funny I will kill you myself, she said. Yes, mom. Diaz nodded while cocking his pistol aiming his gun at the enemies and opened fire cutting down three of the intruders within a split second. Wow, nice shot kid, Abidaya commented. I had practice. With peers. Diaz chuckled. Oh fuck me. I can't believe I'm fighting alongside a corpo. Lewis added, the team dug into their fighting positions holding their ground valiantly against the hordes of bandits. Kane's flying drone armed with a machine gun turret worked in tandem with Lewis' saw gun. When they had to reload their weapons, Samantha, Diaz, and Abidaya covered for them. The bandit intruders who have never seen such kind of firepower before either charged blindly to the kill zone or took cover from the tents to avoid its sight only to get sniped by after about 12 grueling minutes suppressive fire. The hordes of bandits seized their advances. By Samantha's account, she can confirm about 56 combined kills from her team. Everyone sighed in relief as they stood up from their cover and observed the aftermath. Bodies of the slain littered the ground as the squad and the civilians stood to watch in awe and fright from the scene. Did we really do this? All of this? Diaz said. Yes. I can't believe I used my rifle and revolver on. People, a bee dire swallowed. He didn't knew how many he had killed but he did knew that his hunting weapons had tasted the blood of people by his hands. The first time is always the hardest old man, take it from me. Cain placed his hand over a bed's shoulder. All right let's regroup to the ship and Samantha was about to relay her orders when a sharp ring coming from a radio interrupted her. Crocker grabbed a radio that was tucked by his shoulder and pressed the answer button. Strider group. We need backup. Shit. It's static. Attacking the ship, said Colonel Polonsky on the radio. Colonel, I rendezvous with my commanding officer. Repeat that phrase again. Lewis replied. There's a fire rock monster, thing attacking the EO Dem. Need back up now. Polonsky concisely ordered. A, hey, Roger. Lewis balked in disbelief before dropping the radio. You heard that right? A monster is attacking the ship? Samantha interrogated. Fire and rock creature right? Did my ears really hear that? Lewis questioned back with a confused face. Yeah, I heard that too. Diaz raised his hand. Me three, Abidaya added. I am confused. Ken said. Well, we can all ask questions later. Everyone, the ship is running out of time. Move out. Samantha rallied, snapping the squad back to the task at hand. The group, alongside the civilians they protected made haste to the EO Dem. They can see smoke and eruptions of fire that silhouettes the ship from the distance as they walk. Most of them could struggle to breathe the air and had to crawl down to avoid the fumes. Covering their faces to avoid smoke inhalation the group followed Samantha through the smoke. Blay. We are just in front of the ship. I can barely breathe. In here, Samantha ordered as she pushed down the door of an intact storage house. The team alongside the civilians hurriedly went inside and quickly closed the door. With clean air, everyone breathed easily. Cough shit, I bet that fire creature Polonsky said did all of this. Lewis checks those windows, 
Make sure no smoke gets inside for now, Samantha said. Lewis walked up to a nearby window to check if it's closed, confirming the window's closure. The saw gunner curiously looked outside. He saw the fire creature wreaking havoc at the EO dam. Its height was about 20 feet tall, 10 meters wide and covered head to toe with fire and rock. The creature's hand shot fire that scorched all that touches. Lewis could see the people in the EO dam struggling to even hurt the creature but the bullets didn't do anything to it. He also noticed that behind the monster was a man in a hooded cloak who was holding a stave at hand and waving his arms like he is commanding the beast. A distinctly blue-colored amulet was also on the man's chest that grew brightly like a beacon of energy that powered the summoned creature. The gunfire from the militia pinned down in the ship tried to desperately bring down the monster but to no significant dent to the body. Damn it, the boys are doing jack shit to that thing, Lewis said. Sweet Jesus. Mary and Joseph look at the size of that thing. Abidia panicked. LT, what do we do? Cain yelled. His voice was the tone of one who is panicking. Damn it. Think Sammy, think. Samantha thought to herself. Everyone in the colony. Every soldier. Every civilian's life was now hanging by a very thin thread that will be burnt if the ship goes down. Her eyes scanned the contents of the storage room, looking for something to gain the edge in battle. There are food stocks, barrels of water, liquid petroleum gas canisters, and several fire extinguishers. Hold on. It ain't over yet. Lewis grabbed those fire extinguishers. Samantha ordered. What? We are going to fucking snuff out the fire with them? Really? Lewis questioned. Yeah actually. Samantha said. We need to find that monster controller too. It will buy us some time, she explained. Is it really time to be thinking like that now? Lewis asked again. To save you from having to explain something I learned from chemistry and physics. Yes, it's a time right now. Now go get them. Samantha yelled. As Lewis gathered the fire extinguishers, Samantha walked up to her two panicking squad mates who were still panic praying. She slapped both Abidia and Diaz out of their state and yelled. I need you to aim at those fire extinguishers after Lewis tosses them at the monster, Samantha said her plan. I have to toss them? Lewis questioned. Yes, Sergeant. Now get ready all of you and wait for my signal. The team gathered outside the building with Samantha, Kane, Abidia, and Diaz crouching behind cover while Lewis gathered the fire extinguishers and stacked them on a pyramid next to him. The fire monster continued to ravage the EO dam leaving the squad undetected to set up their ambush. Samantha raised her hand signaling to Lewis went to get ready. The sergeant grabbed the first fire extinguisher from his pile and carried it over his shoulder. With a quick downward twitch of her elbow, Samantha signaled the first release. With all of his might, Lewis threw his load at the monster directly hitting him but not hurting him. The fire extinguisher simply impacted the monster's body and dropped harmlessly onto the ground. Fire! Samantha yelled. Abidia, with his hunting rifle, scoped the fire extinguisher causing the canister to erupt in a bright white smoke. The creature yelled loudly as if it was in pain, confirming Samantha's hypothesis. If there was anything she has seen in rebounds per game games is that fire elementals such as the giant monster right now are weak to fire and theoretically no differently weak to a good old fire extinguisher. Holy shit, that looked like it actually hurts. Diaz smiled. Again, Samantha yelled. Lewis grabbed another extinguisher from his bile and threw it at the fiery beast. It was another direct but harmless hit. This time it now got the creature's attention. I got this one. Cairn yelled. He aimed his gun at the fire extinguisher and opened fire. The white smoke discharged out of its metal prison. The fire retardant chemicals touched the burning skin of the fire monster causing the plasma-like body to solidify into the black rock. From the looks of it from Samantha's point of view. She looks like she is halfway into freezing the monster to death with fire retardant chemicals. Her plan turning the tide of the battle into their favor she signaled again for Lewis to throw one more fire extinguisher at the beast. Rag take this you burning piece of shit. Lewis roared as he threw the last fire extinguisher at the monster, hitting right at the head of the beast. The monster reflexively grabbed the canister. It's a hand covering most of its body but the nozzle. 
This is my shot, Diaz said, with a focused aim from the iron sights of his rifle. Diaz shot a precise bullet directly at the exposed nozzle of the fire extinguisher, bursting forth its content right at the face of the creature and at the arm it was holding it. The fire monster was now completely frozen, its once fiery form now at a fragile dark rock state. Everyone, light it up, Samantha radioed every militia soldier. The soldiers in the EO Dem, Samantha's squad sprayed hundreds of bullets at the defenseless beast cutting it down to a fine ash mist bringing it down to the ground to never harm another innocent again. It's going down, the beast is dead. Hua, radio chatter from everyone connected blanketed the airwaves in the noise of celebratory cheers. As Strider group cheered, a figure emerged from the shadows using some sort of form of invisibility to hide from those who would prioritize attacking him. It was he who controlled the Gillum creature to attack this strange settlement that dared enter his territory and it was he who organized the attack in the first place. He was dressed in robes that opulently dazzled fabrics and wearing a bright blue necklace that irradiates from his chest which caught anyone not blind to stare at its aura. His hands, face and eyes glowed into the rhythm of the blue necklace's humming noise as he panted angrily at Strider Group. Ladak chief in Wies Tamelope with the mags. The man shouted in an unknown tongue. His hands glowed as he began to conjure a form of energy from his body readying some sort of alien action to smite down Strider Group. Being quick on the draw, the lieutenant aimed her Militech Mara five peacemaker assault rifle at the strangely robed man and bursted several rounds of 5.56 mm ammunition onto their attacker. The strange fell backward to the ground succumbing to his wounds. His ethereal, almost magic-like powers fading away from his hands until only a weak spark fizzled out from his corpse as a final spark. What the hell was that man saying? Cain questioned. I I don't know. But if he spoke any more, we would have been dead. Samantha answered as she and the rest of Strider group walked up to the strange robed man's corpse. Good job everyone. All of you. Samantha rested her rifle by her shoulder, the barrel facing upwards to the sky. She walked towards her confirmed kill and noticed the brightly colored necklace the deceased mage is wearing. The necklace blinked brightly like a beating heart with a neon blue light as if it was alive. What a strange piece of bling. I wonder what my fencing friends would say of this thing would be worth, commented Diaz, marveling at the bright necklace like a jewel locked behind a glass dome. Don't think so. He's fuck all kilometers away from you. Lewis castigated him. I bet the scientists on board would love to get their hands on that thing. We should give it to them, Cain suggested. You're right, Samantha affirmed. She yanked the necklace from the corpse and firmly grasped the crystal. She took a moment to stare at the necklace's beauty. Its shimmering reflection impressed her. Lieutenant Rose, I would like to congratulate you for saving everyone in this. Hey, why is that prisoner carrying a gun? Colonel Polonsky walked up to Samantha. He noticed Diaz, who was still wearing his orange prison clothes holding a rifle. Yume, yeah, I should keep that promise now, Diaz softly said. He dropped his gun to the ground and knelt while placing his hands behind his head. I deal with you later Corpo. Lieutenant Rose, congratulations on taking down that fire golem. If it weren't you throwing those fire extinguishers at that monster we would all have been dead. Polonsky saluted. Well, I came up with the idea. Lewis was the one who threw the cans at the creature. My team was the ones who shot the extinguishers to make them explode. Samantha humbly explained herself. If that's so, then you truly are honoring the West Point name. Polonsky smiled. Wait, even the prisoner helped too? Polonsky questioned. Yeah, he shot the third one. That was actually pretty amazing if I say so myself. Abidaya commented. Yeah, I got to say that was an impressive shot coming from him. Lewis added. Is this true Samantha? Don't lie to me. Polonsky asked her. Yes. He shot the last canister when the monster nearly covered it. Samantha swallowed her pride. Well, Mr. Vincente Diaz, convicted for multiple armed robberies, corporate espionage, Sabotage and the sale of counterfeit goods where are your corrections officers? Polonsky asked Diaz. 
he knew about his dangerous history and he had worked closely with the Bureau of Justice to make sure he was accommodated and be put to work as best as he could. According to his classified dossier provided by the Bureau of Justice, the judges sentenced that the best way to mitigate all the damage he is capable of causing was to exile him from all of his networks and assets by physically removing him off-world from any youth core worlds, the farther the better. Okay, first off I did not kill that ice cream vendor, and second yeah, they died. Some of them bandits chopped them up. I barely managed to wiggle out of there with my skin intact. Diaz replied. Well in due part that you did went out of your way to help fight of this invasion and the additional fact we are, thanks to the damages we have incurred would require more warm bodies to assist us in repairing the damages. How are you interested in being a member of the Mili Polonsky diplomatically proposed to the corpo only to be cut off by him? Yes, Vince said. Militia. Okay, but do not take my mercy kindly Corpo, you are still leashed under several restrictions to keep you in check. For now I am having you assigned to be a member of the SOG team known as Strider Group whom I believe you are now fairly acquainted with now. Second I will have Lieutenant Rose and Sagrient Crockaby as your new parole officer. Polonsky added. Wait what? Samantha objected. At this point in time Lieutenant. We need every man on deck to clean up this shit. I have to make dozens of calls to several people right now and I have thought of a way how to explain what the hell happened a while ago. As for your new squaddy, keep him from causing too much trouble and if he does, you have the right to terminate him on the spot. That is a direct order. Polonsky raised his voice. Silently absorbing her pride and clenching her fist she looked at Polonsky in eyes. Yes, sir. She saluted. And that necklace on your hand. Give me that. I want Dr. Malona to see this. Polonsky added. Samantha handed over the blue necklace to the colonel and stood up tensely at him. Her face was cold but receptive to orders as the colonel observed the object before placing it in his pocket. Good. Do not waste my mercy for I will not give you a third chance. I am only doing this because I am in need of people right now. You are dismissed. Polonsky warned him. The colonel turned around and grabbed his megaphone to call out the people taking refuge inside the colony ship. All right, engineers, I want this mess cleaned up by sunset. Polonsky turned around, massaging the stress in his head leaving the squad alone as people disembarked from the EO Dem. Come LT, let's give Diaz a proper welcome and be done with it. Colonel's orders, Crocker said. Stick dot with dot me dot corpo. Samantha punctuated. There was a tone of disgust over being associated with a criminal that she exhibited towards Diaz as she leads him to the barracks. The former prisoner shrugged his shoulders as he followed his new commanding officer. Dash meanwhile, miles away, Dash, in a house covered by nature's hands, a vampire enchantress threw her personal belongings all over her room. She just fought off a raid of burning horse bandit family when she noticed that her favorite mano infused necklace was missing. It was the most prized possession from her deceased family passed down to her. The blue colored mano infused necklace of the purest quality money and labor can create was used as a magical amplifier and battery for her experiments. She was on the verge of what could be a significant scientific breakthrough but she needed her necklace to make the final push. She pulled her raven hair in anger and yelled, Curse you burning horse bandits. May the skies rain death upon you for my name is Aris Kudahagan, last child of the Kudahagan vampire bloodline. She yelled, her voice echoed causing night flying birds to run away in fear. Eodem Chapter 3 Vampire Nights. About ten hours later after the bandit trade on the camp, Governor Jeremy White, the appointed colonial governor of Benham III courtesy of the Youth Bureau of Colonial Affairs and Initiatives was having the worst day of his political life. What was supposed to be routine colonization to a pleasant climate and uninhabited planet was instead a firestorm of questions, dead bodies, and destroyed government-issued equipment. There were over a tally of 54 injured, 8 dead, all non-combatants, from the casualty report. These bandits in contrast, were completely wiped out with a death toll of 151 dead including what ashen remains were left of the giant fire monster that Samantha and her squad heroically took down. Additionally, 
The squad had also acquired a strange crystal blue necklace from the monster's handler or more colloquially called by the men as a mage. Jeremy sighed as he sank down on his desk, he was so confused and so tired from his heart racing up when he was nearly attacked by the unidentified men who attacked them earlier in the day. The crew of the EO Dam colony ship was left reeling to mend their wounds. Medical base staff were overclocking in their workloads to heal off the wounded men and women. Supplies were reaccounted to check in store how much was lost during the attack. In the meantime, that rationing and corner cutting were enforced to make do with what remains until the next supply run. The militia doubled their patrols and tightened their defensive formation around the EO Dems perimeter. Based on their on the ground reports, they said that the initial probe scouting reports were significantly inaccurate which further confused the governor as the equipment was considered the best in the youth's technology. All right science team, I want a status report now. White opened the doors to the laboratory of the colony ship, there he found several scientists who were holding papers of their findings at hand. Some faces showed nervousness while others showed confusion. After a brief silence, a scientist who was sitting by a chair stood up, Dr. David Malona wiggled his way through the laboratory. Being more of your typical fat nerd who doesn't care about the input of food he takes, he had to carefully move around his laboratory without accidentally knocking over the expensive equipment. This doesn't help the fact that he wasn't expecting this morning to be greeted by what everyone could only describe as a banded trade with a giant fire monster only made him more stressed out than he normally is supposed to feel. A native Hawaiian who got a PhD in physics by education. David was the go-to scientist who Colonel Polonsky can entrust the task of analyzing the mysterious blue-colored crystal necklace they have acquired from a dead bandit that day. The necklace was tucked neatly inside a vacuum container that had various recording and observational gadgets attached to it like a prize piece in a jewelry store. The computers attached to the gadgets recorded the strange necklace producing curious signals and frequencies that the physics doctor could only be astonished to see. No radiation, yet the compute says it can give off energy that are close to a kilo of uranium-235. I am surprised nobody reported any signs of radiation poisoning sir, Dr. Malona said. His eyes showed his disbelief over the readings on his computer screen. I am just as surprised as you are too doctor. Other than energy readings what else can you get from it? The governor asked. I have recently cross-referenced the scanning probe recordings of Benham 3 with what the scouts reported. I noticed that they have reported that they too have experienced seeing these kinds of energy patterns while the probe was doing the initial explorations. From what they have said, these particular energy patterns were causing their equipment to at first suffer technical fluctuations before coming back to normal and then they lost it soon after some destructive anomaly. The next bit that I managed to learn from our new piece of jewelry here is that the energy readings are similar to energy readings from a coordinate not too far away that I triangulated. I believe the blue crystal that we have here is just a piece of a larger deposit I theorize of whatever this thing is. I suggest you some men over to check out if my readings are true. If they are we should send in some harvester drones and grab some more samples that I can work with. Plus I can send over these harvested crystals to other scientists who got better equipped laboratories to study them. Dr. Malona replied. He passed over a file of paperwork that detailed his initial findings over to the governor. That's good to hear Dr. Malona. Let me know when you have more findings. Now as for you Dr. Lee Hainwell. Rodriguez turned to another doctor who was beside the Hawaiian. A physical contrast to Dr. Malona's masculine, tall, weathered and fat physique. Dr. Hana Lee Hainwell, a newly licensed surgeon was short to 5 feet and 2 inches ideally feminine and a bachelorette of 26 years of her age. She too was rudely awakened by the bandit attacked and was tasked with examining the corpses of the slain bandits alongside other qualified doctors, yet instead of a face of astonishing confusion, her face as if she just saw a ghost, she was frozen in place, her lips not moving like a lifeless department store mannequin. You look scared Hana. What's happening? Dr. Malone asked. They are human were the only words that escaped Hana's mouth. They are human? Both the governor and Dr. Malone said. 
everything in their bodies that I and further Bishop dissected are human blood, human organs, human bones. We didn't kill aliens. We killed dot people, Dr. Lee Hainan Ol said. Her eyes were on the verge of tears. She has always been a utilitarian pacifist who upheld her Hippocratic oath diligently but the sight of bullet-ridden bodies has made her descend into a state of shell shock. In her few years of experience as a surgeon, she had never seen so many dead bodies before that no field trip to morgues could prepare an upcoming doctor to face. God damn it, how am I going to explain this to command, to the press, to everyone upstairs? White exclaimed, the governor's burdens have become heavier by the hour as more developments happened around him and all that was bad news and more bad news, he wishes just for once can he hear something that produces to fill the many questions that are on everyone's minds right now. Who are these people? Were they some sort of lost colony of men? A clandestine attack on them by some pirates? Or corpos? These questions flew into the governor and the scientist minds as they reviewed their findings. What did we just get ourselves into? White begged. Dash outside the EO Dem Dash. Vincent Diaz looked at the mirror inspecting his new clothes. Having now traded his orange prison garbs for a comfortable plain olive t-shirt that had the colonial militia insignia imprinted and a vest that had pouches for magazines and a pistol holster, he smiled at the new conditions he has gotten himself in after ditching his dirty prison cell for a nice bunk bed inside a barracks though he does miss the privacy that he traded off for the barracks but it was an acceptable trade-off. At Nshun, Samantha marched into the room alongside Kane, Lewis and Abidia following her close, alerted by her appearance, Vincent clumsily tensed his body straight and saluted his superior. Sloppy. I have seen children salute better than you. I said at Nshun. Samantha yelled like a drill sergeant. Vincent adjusted his posture and saluted again to Samantha. He silently expressed his frustration over being ordered by a woman younger than him painted his face with feeling. At Nshun, Samantha yelled again, erasing his earlier face. Vincent again tensed up and saluted to his superior with a cold and stoic face below his saluted hand. Much better prisoner and I will call you that until I deem otherwise. Samantha said. What are your orders sir? I mean ma'am. I mean you. Lieutenant? Vincent asked. I am called Lieutenant or CEO from the likes of you. I am here to formally receive you as a member of my squad. Samantha's hands held an assault trifle over to Vincent. She was hesitant to say another word and her hands trembled, promptly grabbing the gun and holstering it to his shoulder Vincent saluted again. So, what's our duty today madam? He asked. We will have to report to the colonel right now. He says that he is assigning us as a study group or something. Samantha answered. Sounds exciting. Adventure. I mean yes ma'am. Dash. At the EO Dems conference room near the bridge. Dash. Satellite pictures and photos of the necklace acquired by Samantha were stickered by the whiteboard. The lieutenant and her squad were the only people being briefed in the room. The colonel swallowed himself as he began to speak. Strider Group. Your mission today is a recon of an area as seen by these photos here, the colonel said. He pointed at a satellite picture that's contents looked like a bird's eye view of a forest. Governor White passed me these pictures from Dr. Malona and he said that the blue crystal from that necklace you managed to nab from that mage this morning is but a piece of what could be a larger deposit of them. The nerd wants to have more of these blue crystal energy gem things for more experimentation. Tomorrow, noon I want you and your squad to investigate the area, find out what exactly is there and report what you find. Go in armed and ready for a fight if the worst happens. God only knows what could be out there. Also, you, Lieutenant will also be given a camera. He added, a camera for me? Is it like one of those laser designators that call down airstrikes? A GoPro? Or a thermal camera? Samantha asked. No, just a normal professional camera. It's for documentation purposes only and nothing more. I initially wanted to give the camera to Ken but I wanted you to use it because I believe you will be more observant than your squad, the colonel said. I see, I'll take as many as I can, Samantha said. Dismiss, the colonel told everyone. Dash, the next day at the armory. 
dash. Abidiah sat down by a crate and cleaned his weapons. The morning of that day was a pleasant shine from Benham 3's sun with a few clouds dotting the sky. Being a perfectionist, he always demands his good old rifle and pistol to be at the optimum quality for the best possible performance. Having been a long-time member of the International Hunters Association has taught him to treat his rifle like if it was his. Not that his real wife who was brought along alongside their young daughter would have minutes since he too named his rifle and pistol by their names respectively. Okay, Leah's bolt is spotless and the cock of April is greased. He smiled, satisfied over the conditions of his weapons that are as pristine as the day the weapons rolled out of the factory. Ha! A cock on a girl. That's funny. Oh. It's your revolver you are talking about. Sorry Abidaya. Vincent's voice suddenly erupted from behind him. The ex-prisoner was holding a cup of hot coffee that he sips for his daily dose of caffeine. It's okay, I am in a calm mood today Vince. Just getting ready for the recon we doing. Abidaya turned to face him. Finally. A decent response from someone and I am finally getting sick of being called prisoner and thief from everyone. You seem cool by my eyes. Are those your guns? Vince asked. Yeah, the rifle and the six-shooter are named Leah and April after my wife and daughter. Abidaya demonstrating the weapons to the new guy. Fine weapons, I am more of an assault rifle user myself. Although this government-issued rifle I have is a bit larger and heavier than what I normally am used to wielding. I bet it's still there back in Kesselheim locked up asking where is Vince? I miss shooting stuff with him. Oh, boo-hoo. Vince chuckled reminiscing his days as a criminal. Yes. Ha ha. I sometimes treat my guns as if they were really my family, much to the annoyance of my real one. My wife would ask about which Leah that I am talking to. What about your gun Vince? Abidaya said, that I can relate old man. My old rifle was a customer styled gun that shoots .308 Winchesters because the barrel also acts as a suppressor because, well not to sound creepy to your old man but I need my gun quiet, I call her blackout. Vince said. .308 Winchester? Shit that's the same ammo I use for Leah. Glad to see someone uses .308 other than me. A bed stood up and shook Vince's hand. Why are you farming folks really that cut off from the city people? Pa. What the hell am I saying? I made a friend now right? Vince asked. In a way yes. What's your opinion on Gosriff? Abidaya was about to continue the gun talk with Vince when he was interrupted by a loud voice from their pockets. We are moving out in 3-3 three, three minutes. Get your gear and hop on the land cruiser, everybody, said Sergeant Crocker over by the radio. Let's continue this talk on the road. You and I sit together by the turret, Vince proposed. A B dialogue the bolt of his rifle and twirled the chamber of his revolver. He smiled silently saying yes to the thief, dash. Meanwhile in Iris Kada Hagen's house, dash. The young, at least in her race's standards, vampiress has the whole day getting into her. Her frustrations over the loss of her prized necklace and the halting of her experiments and the fact that the burning horse bandits have ransacked her home became gotten her into a very agitated mood. She used her magical powers to commence the repair and cleaning of her dilapidated abode. Various cleaning implements such as mops, brooms, and towels began to wipe away the filth and damage from her home to make it a worthy respite for the vampire witch. Her house was situated in the middle of a forest so she can be near to as many alchemical ingredients as possible without having to worry about people competing with her over the many herbs, roots, and plants that the forest has. Normally, venturing this deep into the Verdon Valley forest would be dangerous as there are bandits and predatory animals that lurk inside the place ready to pounce on unsuspecting victims. Most of those hazards she can easily fight off with her vampiric abilities, enhanced reflexes, strength, speed, and a more refined magical attunement with her mana energies compared to normal humans. She could incinerate trolls with the thought of a fireball, electrocute bandits with bolts of lightning, and poison predatory animals with the breathe of miasma. Yet despite her abilities, she is just one woman against hundreds of dangers and even she can be overwhelmed. She cursed herself, 
gripping the right side of her chair hardly when she had to fight off the burning horse bandit's fire galoon to protect her home from getting torched. But the monster was just a distraction for the bandits to run inside his house and steal her Pumana crystal necklace from her. Mana crystals are often found deep underground in mines. The most common crystals tend to be tainted with other impurities that negatively affect the amount of energy the crystals can give off so it needs to be refined to remove the impurities before it can be used. Energy from mana crystals is used to fuel spells from your mundane candlelight and healing to the more destructive elemental spells cast by wizards. Oftentimes mana sensitive users become mages who can extract the energies from deep below Gleesia's earth and cast their spells but it takes a while and the time to charge their powers is dependent on the users to make spell casting more efficient. Mages such as Aris herself would wear special pieces of jewelry that would allow them to quickly tap into the energies instantaneously, which of course she can't do because of the now aforementioned robbery. Relax Iris, you are going to give those bandits a piece of your mind once you finish cleaning up this mess. She said to herself as she gestured her hands to command a broom to sweep up her littered floor. The broom animated to life by her magic went to work as Iris sat down by a chair and wiped of the sweat off her brow. The magic she has used has caused her to burn several calories that lightly bathed her ivory skin for a moment. There was a relative peace behind all of this destruction. Her hectic scientific work has reminded her that she had taken her moment of rest for granted. The vampire's A's began to feel weighted as she drifted to sleep, unknowingly cancelling the spell she cast on the cleaning implements as they dropped on the floor. Dash, a few hours later outside Doris's home, Dash, Diaz, take point. Samantha ordered HMMPH. I am, compelled to agree. Vincent pouted. He moved past his squad mates and approached the rusty door that was of a wall that was slowly being reclaimed by nature in a blanket of vegetation. He opened the door causing the rusty hinges to shriek from the friction of movement. Strider Group has just stopped their land cruiser by the triangulated location of the energy signals that Dr. Malona pinpointed. To the squads surprised. What was expected to be a small clearing to investigate was instead a walled house that was in the middle of a forest. The growing greens of nature provided the perfect camouflage to fool the youth's UAV recons. The forest's trees also covered the shadow of the house to also not give away its position. Samantha was perplexed by the house being put right there in the middle of the forest. Who would build a house right here away from civilizations? You know guys. It feels like that there's more to this house than meets the eye. We should keep a toes up just in case. Crocker advised. You just read my mind's edge. Samantha nodded. The squad entered through the door and were greeted to what looks like a garden in disrepair. There were several random gardening tools that were laid down on the ground and the soil showed signs of uprooting with empty holes and plants with their roots laid exposed to the surface. Whatever happened here? The people must have left in a hurry. Did you think we were spotted and they bailed? Ken theorized. I don't think so. The gardening tools and plants are spread across the place. If you're planning to bail with your plants you wouldn't just uproot them. Samantha answered. Hey, boss lady. The house looks interesting. I'll bring the squad around check it out. Lewis reported. All right, see if you can find anything interesting. Ken nodded. Crocker nudged Vincent and a bee dyer to follow him to the house. Just like its walls, the vegetation blanketed the structure in jade-colored leaves and foliage. Damn, in all of my years as a robber, this place is a fucking shithole, Vincent commented. He looked at his shoes and probed the wooden floor by stepping on them. Every time he tapped his feet, the wooden floor made a loud creaking noise that irritated his ear. You can say that right kid. I will only live here if I was paid a million dollars, Obey Dyer said. Amen to that. Lewis smiled. The two new members have been so far being quite competent for their jobs despite them having no prior military experience. The sergeant grabbed the knob of the door and pushed it open. To his horror, his face became pale. What the hell? He opened the door further and saw that the room looked like a living room in disrepair with a sofa, chair a fireplace and several cleaning equipments and other stuff littering the floor. 
But what stood out the most was there was a woman sitting lifelessly on a chair. She was in absolutely pristine condition with no visible scars and a face as white as snow. Lieutenant, I found a body. Lewis radioed in. Okay, see if you can examine it, Samantha answered. Lewis, Vincent and Abed walked inside the room and approached the body. The woman looked like she was no older than around her early to mid-twenties. Her body showed no sign of any kind of decay or any violent means of death like wounds or bruises. Wow, she's pretty, Vincent said as he examined the body. No signs of a struggle or any skin discoloration. Suicide. Maybe she offed herself, Lewis said. He caressed the woman's left cheek and felt her icy cold skin. She looked like she had died recently for about a day or two. Lewis's index and middle finger stuck together and passed below the woman's jawline towards her neck. He pressed his two fingers into his absolute shock. He felt a pulse. Before he could react, the dead woman's eyes flashed open. She pounced at the sergeant and grabbed his body and opened her mouth to reveal four canine fangs. She dived her mouth onto Crocker's neck and bit it. Vincent, reacting quickly, tried to pry the woman away from Lewis but with inhuman reflexes, the woman grabbed Vincent's hand and pushed it away with her strength forcing him back to a wall. Standing up, the woman dashed towards the robber and bit his neck too. Her tongue feasted upon the blood that erupted from the veins of his neck. Losing blood and feeling weak, Vincent passed out. After tasting the blood of the two soldiers, the woman turned around to the third man who intruded her, Abidiah. She turned around to see Abidiah aiming his revolver at her. Die. Abidiah yelled. His finger squeezed the trigger and a clap of loud thunder and bright flash followed. Dash. Iris's puff. Dash. Iris' body jolted as she felt a great and concentrated force pierce her chest. She looked at herself and noticed that she received a wound right by her right breast. Thanks to her vampiric regeneration and resilience, she can easily shake it off. Then another loud thunder from the bearded intruder's strange metal magic wand was heard and this time, her abdomen ruptured with blood. Again another wound she can easily shake off. Then a third thunder. A fourth thunder. A fifth thunder, her body was struck from her center mass by the intruder's magic attacks. Was this person a mage that can cause people to bleed at random places by aiming his wand at her? Then a sixth thunder from the man's metal wand was made and Iris' head felt a great force that pierced her left eye. Yet even that, she can easily walk off the wound and all those she had felt despite the injuries. She slowly walked closer to the man while she slowly regenerated her body. The man's face grew pale with dread as she fully regenerated her body from her wounds. What? The hell are you? The man spoke. I am Iris Kudahagan, the last of the Kudahagan bloodline. Know your place filthy peasant. She roared. She raised her hand into the air ready to strike the man down. Did you just speak in ing? The bearded man was about to question back to her before Iris' hand knocked him out cold to the ground. So... Such is the fate of humans to the vampires, to be bullied down and be treated as dumb cattle. Her kind, the vampires used to be the dominant species in Gleesia for millennia, being allowed to feed on the backward humans as they please. However, they are in a state of decline in terms of population for over 500 years due to the rising human kingdoms who have begun to build vast empires and states within those years. This has caused many vampires to scatter out due to competition and being hunted down. Several vampires have been infiltrating the human kingdoms and blended into human society with mixed results. Others, like Iris, chose to hide in isolated areas of the planet's wilderness and only come out to a feast for blood or obtain certain luxuries found in the human-built settlements. She rues the day when the vampires finally rally together and descend upon the humans in order to put them in their rightful place as slaves and cattle for the vampires to use as they deem fit. She observed her three victims who lay down on the ground paralyzed from the venom she secretes from her fangs to paralyze cattle. Their clothes were strangely colored green with several strips of brown and black dots covering their attire. Their metal wands were just as strange as their clothes. Since the usual shape of a wand and magic staff is a stick or polyam with a magical crystal infused to it, 
There was no crystal on sight which has confused her. What are you humans even using? She mumbled to herself. Iris picked up the metal wand from the bearded man's body and observed for a closer look. It had a stick-like part with a hollow inside that she noticed have been intricately carved into a circular motion. Then she looked at the handle of the metal wand which was made of firm leather and was ergonomically designed for someone to hold it comfortably and firmly. She has never heard of any mage who would customize their wands to be this intricate. Perhaps these humans were vampire hunters who were sent to kill her but failed. Iris cannot wait to suck the blood of the three men dry but first, she needs to be sure that there won't be more vampire hunters after her. One of her kind's abilities, called the Rite of the Blooded Mind is that she can while draining the blood of her prey can absorb the memories and knowledge from the person's blood. It's an intricate process that she needs absolute privacy and intimacy as she has to combine. She observed her three victims and looked at all of them with disgust. The first man who tried to touch her earlier has an impressive physique but she despises men with shaved or bald heads. The second one was much more lean and fragile than the man who has some really attractive short hair but that man has tattoos on his skin and Iris dislikes the ink as it tasted like sour milk to her. The bearded man was simply just too old for her own preferences as she likes her meals young and healthy. It looks like Hyres must have to suck up her own pride and choose which of the poisons would taste the least bad to her. As she was contemplating who to perform the rite of the blooded mind the sound of footsteps was heard coming from her living room's door. Hey, you! Get down on the ground. A loud voice erupted. Iris turned around to the sound of the voice and was greeted to the sight of a woman with red hair pointing another one of the metal ones. Staff sat her. She was around the same height as her and despite the battle gear the woman was carrying she was quite appealing to Iris' taste. The red hair reminded her of blood. Her fair skin that was almost as white as hers but with a slight tan and then her blue eyes which is her favorite color to paint one's eyes with. Iris smiled menacingly at the woman causing her to sweat anxiously. It is rude you know to attack your master human swine. Iris mocked. What? Did you just speak in English? The red-headed woman asked. I do not know of this English you speak of. Now come here to me. Iris answered. She pounced at the redhead and grabbed her by the throat and leaned her over the wall, knocking her weapon away from her hands. Let me go, the woman angrily yelled. She fought back by smashing her fists downwards at Iris' head and kicking the vampire's abdomen to create some distance between their bodies. Your puny attacks are no use to the superior race human filth. Now hold still while I drain your blood, body and mind. Iris laughed. Her fangs drew out from her mouth paralytic venom secreting from her saliva glands and ready to perform the rite. Cain, Cain, help, the woman cried before Iris sank her teeth to her. The redhead's resistance dwindled as her stamina was sapped out from the venom. Her kicking and punching slowly weakened until she fell down limp from the blood that was drained from her. Her eyes rolled up in ecstatic bliss as she drifted to unconsciousness. Iris stood proudly before her new victim and reveled at her power. The intel she will gain will be the most useful to find out who are these people are how they managed to find her. As the woman's blood nourished her, the life essence of her began to reveal the person's secrets. Iris could see the most recent memories of the woman were now being projected in her head. She and her team of four other people have arrived at her house because a Melona told them there was magical energy in the location. Iris doesn't recognize what kind of person would have that kind of name. Perhaps it's from some far off nation she has never heard of, and for the other member of her team, she will deal with him in due time. With that aside, what the memories have intrigued her the most is that she could see that the intruders weren't vampire hunters. They were instead hunting for magic crystals. Iris knew that during her experiments she had unleashed large amounts of energy from within her house that can attract unwanted attention if not the fact it was right at the middle of the Verdon Valley Forest, one of the most dangerous areas within the local region. Additionally, she has also casted several wards around her house that helps out any magic detecting devices and spells from sensing her abode. But right now she can feel the bliss of consuming blood from her enemies. She closed her eyes and savored the taste of fresh blood that was still in her mouth. Lieutenant, Samantha, say again? 
A deep and static voice suddenly interrupted the tranquility of the scene. It came from the unconscious redhead's body. Examining the body, she noticed that it came from some sort of box-shaped device with a stick pulling out of it. Lieutenant what happened? What happened to Sergeant Crooker, Abidia and Vince? The voice in the box said. Hello? Who is there? Iris said to the box. But no reply was heard. She began to probe the box with her lithe hands to see if she had to press something in order to be able to talk to the voice. Her fingers slid to the left side of the device and she felt that it was rather loose and slightly detached from the object. Nodded that this could be a button, she pressed her fingers causing the device to make a click noise. Hello, who is in here? Iris asked again. Who are you? What did you do to the lieutenant? Said the voice. You do not know me? How naive and stupid can you be human? But I digress, my name is Aris of House Kodahagan and you have intruded into my property. So, I have decided to take you all down and turn you into my thralls. You filthy peasants. Iris taunted. Human? What have you done to my friends? What? What are you? The voice questioned. Damn you. Ha ha ha. You are more naive and pathetic than I thought human. I am a vampire who is skilled in the arts of magic and enchantments. Your friends are safe by lying on the ground sleeping. Once I am done finding you, I will make slaves of you all. Now, I smell that you are in my garden. Please wait there, I shall attend to you shortly. Tilda Aris laughed. Dash Cairns puff dash. Shit. Cairns swore. He was the last man down on his squad. His team are knocked out or worse and he has to fight. If there is any credit to what the woman said, she is a vampire who can also speak English with a seductive Romanian accent. HQ. I need backup. There is a vampire who captured or maybe even killed off my team and I need backup. Ken said to his headphone mic. This is Colonel. Say again? Did you just say vampire? Polonsky asked. Yes. I think she is. I mean she spoke to me in English saying she is a vampire. Ken answered. She spoke to you in English? Polonsky asked emphasizing his shock on a native of the planet to be able to speak English. I do not know how she can do that but I don't want to be around and end up as my squad so hurry. Cairn yelled. Roger. ETA 15 minutes, Polonsky said before signing out. His fading words were then followed by the cold static sound of Cairn's headset. Refocusing himself. The engineer observed his surroundings looking for a means of survival against this scary of opponents. He has never fought a real vampire before so he was to trust his instincts. He can hear the faint howling of wolves and hooting of owls that indicate that night time has now arrived. If Cairn remembers his popular vampire knowledge which was quite limited to him since he was never interested in the supernatural to begin with, vampires are nocturnal creatures. Damn it all to hell, Cairn thought, realizing that his odds of survival have dimmed. He desperately looked at his backpack for anything he might have. To his amazement, he had two packs of thermite charges that are perfect for heliophobes like vampires. His personal etiol with an imprinted smiley face on the head that he calls optimism. For it always seizes the best in what Cairn is tasked in building or blowing up structures. A shot of adrenaline drugs. Good for countering the vampire's venomous fangs. Last but not least was a spare MRE pack that contains a hearty meal of grilled chicken breasts with garlic and herb seasoning. Other than the contents of his backpack he still has his 12-gauge shotgun by his side too. Ready or not. Here I come Tilda Aris spoke into his headset. Bring it on bitch. Ken cocked his shotgun. After gathering his belongings Ken crouched down and sneakily stride his way through the garden in order to avoid the detection of the vampire as much as possible. He held a pack of thermite by his side. He honestly doesn't know if the thermite will work on the vampire. The best case scenario would be the kills her with just only one and the worst case would be she is immune to the burning that the thermite will inflict. So, your leader Samantha her name is. She is quite the feisty one. Isn't she? Among your friends. She was the most defiant of the bunch. I got to say, she is quite beautiful for someone who serves as a soldier. When I am done with you. I can't wait to make her bend on her knees and beg for me. Iris said, you stay away from her. Cairn objected, and you, my, my, 
Your skin is black as night. I have never seen a human whose skin is like that nor have read about a nation as dark as yours. You will make an excellent addition to my collection of thrall. Iris taunted. Ken is it not? I am nobody's slave. Ken angrily roared. Such implications unnerved the Nigerian of being the ebony butler to this vampiric lady sickened him. Oh being my servant will be quite an honor. All you have to do is lay on your back and allow me to take good care of you. Tilda Aris laughed mockingly. Well I hope you like the very sunny weather because take this. Cain said. He emerged from his cover and primed the first pack of thermite and tossed it at the vampire. Iris quick reflexes dodged out of them and laughed again at Cain. You resort to throwing rocks at me? How pathetic. Iris didn't have enough time to finish her sentence when the thermite detonated causing the fire eruption to occur right behind her. The vampire witch back burnt painfully as she knelt down the floor and cried. Adrenaline soon floods her body with power as she conjured an ice storm spell to kill the flames latched on her dress and flesh. I have got to say, Nightman, that was clever but how much longer can you hold out? Iris teased. Nightman? Oh great. Cain sighed. The vampire is also a racial chauvinist. You're just a blood drink cash shit face. Ah. Uh, bitch. You thing. The engineer dissed while picking up his second pack of thermite. Please save the flattery after I enthrall you with my beauty Cain. Now ready or not here I come Tilda. Iris dissed back. She stood up and began to scan her environment for Cain. You know. You are quite strained you know. Your metal wands and stuffs? Tell me. What is your secret nightman? Iris asked. Like I will ever tell you. The engineer yelled. Found you. Iris happily announced. Her eyes darted towards Cairn's position. She turned her body towards the direction where Cairn hid behind some bushes at. With his thermite in hand, he primed the device, counted one to three, and tucked the explosive behind the leaves of the bush and slowly backed away, hoping his timing and angling was right. He positioned himself at the opposite end of the bush. The thermite then detonated just as Iris' body was brushing through the bush causing her to be caught right into the middle of the blast and setting her entire body aflame. Grah! Iris writhed in agony. She dived at the garden soil and rolled over repeatedly to kill off the flames leaving her open to Ken who readied his shotgun. Die witch. Ken yelled as he aimed his shotgun at the vampire. He unloaded shell after shell of buckshot at the witch which tore her flesh apart from the sheer cutting power of his weapon. Iris screamed louder and louder after every shot she was inflicted with. Rah! I will feast on your blood. Get over here and kneel. Iris angrily yelled. Desperate times came for desperate measures as it was do or die now for the vampire. While still on fire, Iris picked herself back up, her regeneration slowly healing her back to her original form from all the damage she received from the engineer. Ken stood in astonished horror over how the vampire was able to survive such blows from him and his gadgets. Why won't you die? Ken yelled in confusion. Iris grinned her teeth, licked the blood off of her mouth and strut slowly towards Cain, conjuring another ice spell to shake off the fire from her body. You underestimate the power of the vampire's nightman. I must say, that trap of yours actually caught me off guard. Perhaps you humans aren't that stupid after all. I could always use a new butler who is smart, plus your skin would make quite a trophy for my peers. She said sinisterly, I am not anyone's slave. My people, where I came from will never be slaves again. Fight me. I will not go down easily. Cain defied Iris. Fight you? I do not want to spoil my new slave. You, humans, are so easily broken by us and I wish to relish my new servants. I can't also wait to know what you know about your strange magics. Now, look at your mistress and kneel. Tilda Iris reached her hand towards Cain. Her eyes glowed bright red as mystical energies began to form at Iris' body and shot forward towards Cain. The energies pierced his brain causing his mind terrible pain. He tried to fight it but the energies had probed his brain and began to fiddle him with commands. The magic forced his body to kneel down before Iris and throw out his shotgun. Now standing triumphant over the engineer she laughed at the change of situation as now she has the advantage over him. I honestly never use this in the middle of a fight but I was forced to right now. I hate having to harm my new toys. 
It's not every day that I encounter such a handsome fellow like you, especially with that delicious looking skin color of yours. Iris said, she now at an inch between herself and Kane staring at him like a child looking at a beautiful toy in a store. Kane tries to fight back but whatever magic the vampire witch inflicted upon her has left him completely motionless. Like I will tell you anything. Kane barked in a last ditch effort to keep himself alive before help could arrive. Oh, you do not have to tell me what your brain knows. Your blood will suffice now tilt your head and close your eyes. Iris whispered to his ears. She caressed Cairn's neck and tilted left. She pulled out the fangs from her mouth, closed her eyes, and dug her canines right into Cairn's carotid artery. The vampire began to will her magic powers into extracting the deepest memories of her newest victim as she indulges her appetite for blood on the Nigerian. She began to explore the very nooks and crannies of Cain and began to see his thoughts and minds. I can't believe I will die here by some horror movie monster. Cain's thoughts echoed at Iris. She has no idea what a horror movie is according to her knowledge. Perhaps it's just another means of act that the humans use to communicate with each other while enjoying themselves, like a play that she sometimes sneaks into and watch just to see the prey dance and act silly in front of swathes of crowds. More memories of Cairn began to reveal themselves to Iris. This time she sees through his eyes what looks like a table with many similarly colored people sitting aside Cairn. They were all facing him in happy faces like if they were celebrating some event with Cain. Happy 10th birthday my son. I made this knife just for you. Said a large woman carrying a giant bowl of soup by her hand that had a pair of candles that spelled out the number 10. Iris could feel the great warmth of the birthday party release a hearty aura coming from Cain that she is sensing. It had honestly made her smile over the sight of Cain and his family celebrating his birthday. She laments such moments due to her upbringing be a very lonely life. She then saw Cairn blow out the candles and hungrily chowed down on his knife soup. As the food entered his mouth, an explosion of flavors flooded Iris' tongue causing her to fall into ecstasy over the food. During the rite of the blooded mind, vampires can also sense not only the sights and sounds of a person's memories that they are ingesting and experiencing themselves but also the taste and smells of those memories too. Another vision from the annals of Cain's memories was revealed. She now sees herself in a giant lecture hall in what looks like a college. There she saw a frail old man whose clothes and posture is sage-like in appearance took up the mantle and began to speak. Welcome to the introduction to engineering class. I am your professor and I am going to be your best friend and your worst enemy. Now, onto the board, the man said. The man's eagerness to share his knowledge with complete strangers astonished Iris. She has never met a mage who has openly talked about his secrets to people was completely alien to her. Normally mages only entrust their knowledge to worthy apprentices who are either just one or a three according to how much a mage can handle teaching them. But the classroom she has seen was filled with perhaps fifty people who were listening intently to this man. The sage person began to write to speak in tongues as he wrote down numbers arrows and shapes that Iris couldn't understand causing her to get a headache. Then the sage started to show pictures of massive towers in alien geometries with great glass windows that covered every inch of the structure which began to confuse her. Then she saw the sage demonstrate great iron beasts that build these structures in mere days that scared her. She became more terrified as more information flooded her primitive mind. Numbers, equations, formulas, theories it all made sense yet Iris lacked the mental capacity to fully understand it. Her mouth loosened its grip on Cairn's neck as she turned away from him, eyes widened and face frozen from the revelation. Then she screamed, too much, too much, too much, too much, too much, she repeated. She gripped her head as the information she has absorbed from Cairn overloaded her brain. For each second in her cracking state, she saw more visions of grand towers great steel beasts and humans who come from another world with powers to mock gods with. As the vampire slowly crumbled before the revelation that she drank the blood of some sort of divine being whose powers were beyond her and every person and living thing in Gleesia, 
The sound of helicopters disrupted the silent night. Then large spotlights lit up the darkness and aimed themselves at her. We need that one alive. Hit her with the tranks, said a man in the megaphone from one of the choppers. A sniper on board aimed his rifle at the vampire girl and unleashed a tranquilizer shot at her. As the drugged bullet pierced her skin, Iris could feel relief from her revelations as the sedative effects lifted her headaches as she fell to the ground in a blissful sleep. As the vampire lay knocked out on the floor before him, the magical influences that had impeded him waned and the engineer regained full control of his body. Feeling the effects of the vampire's venom he could barely move a muscle and collapsed onto the cold stone floor of the garden. Youth soldiers rappelled down from their choppers and rushed towards him. Thank God you are still alive Cain. Where's the rest of your squad? said Sergeant Mendoza. Another soldier of the youth whose squad is also assigned to studies and observation just like Strider Group. They are in the house I think. She mentioned she kept them down but not out. They may be still alive. Cain muttered as Mendoza's men carried him over to the chopper. Meanwhile he noticed that Iris was also taken by the soldiers and was trapped into a bed with reinforced straps to prevent her from trying to escape her confines. She was then dragged to an awaiting helicopter where the vampire will undergo studying from the EO Dem science team. As Cairn stepped into the chopper, he reflected upon the experience of fighting the vampire. He had felt like he was wrestling with God due to the vampire's impressive regenerative abilities and magic. Yet he was also just as equally astonished that Iris mentioned that she was impressed by his creative use of thermite charges and most embarrassingly, the fact that the vampire actually called him handsome. He was never the type of person who would go out of dates due to his duties as a soldier and engineer. To be called handsome was something that caught him off guard but perhaps it was an attempt by the vampire to flatter him. His mind continued to entertain such thoughts about that day until he noticed four shadows approach the chopper. Cain. You're okay. R. This venom. Makes my body. Weak. Samantha said. She was carried over by one of Mendoza's men alongside the rest of the squad. I am happy to see you. You won't believe what just happened to me. Ken softly smiled. As Samantha took a seat across him, Sergeant Crocker followed him alongside Diaz and Abidia. Crocker had an ice pack on his head as he sat adjacent to Samantha whilst Diaz and Abidia sat next to Ken. Fuck this venom. I can't think straight. Vinny. Say something that will make me think or something. Crocker said. Oh. You. Think. Think. Oh I got it. I guess you can scratch get bitten by a hot vampire chick off of all of our bucket lists am I right? Diaz joked yet judging by the tone of his voice he was practically forcing the words out from his lips while battling to regain control of his half paralyzed body from iris venom. Crocker cringed and threw his ice pack at the one who traded his bars for stripes. You can't joke for shit you flip cunt. You're on latrine duty once you get your feet back in order. Crocker spats. Hey your arm is working again. Diaz pointed. I guess you're right. No more latrine duties. Crocker said as he turned his eyes to his now functioning arm. And thanks for the ice pack by the way sergeant. Diaz said as he indulgently lay the ice pack on his forehead. Never mind, latrines for you. Crocker teased. Do. Diaz cringed. He then proceeded to flip his middle finger and stick out his tongue as a silent fuck you to the sergeant. A rebellious one. Very entertaining to fuck with. Stay you. Diaz, stay you so I can have a clean toilet for my midnight shits. Crocker smiled, as the chopper was about to took off from the garden. The team sat there relieved that they have survived another dangerous mission together. Ken felt the proudest of the bunch as when the lives of his team hang on a wire, he managed to hold off until help arrived. You did great Mudwin. You did great. Samantha approved as she slowly gave a thumb up to Ken as she drifted to sleep. The cabin fell into silence as everyone closed their eyes and began to get a much deserved moment of peace from their recent adventure. Ken soon followed with them as his dark eyes enshrouded itself in darkness. Yet, he feels like this was only the beginning of something much more dangerous and fantastic that he could ever hope to imagine. Chapter 4 The Revelations of Iris Kudahagan When one falls under the effects of a major tranquilizer drug, 
the individual will experience under than a temporary physical disable, is a great reduction of activity in their brain which will remove the feelings of anxiety, fear, tension, agitation that the person is blighted by. For the vampire witch, Iris Kadahagan, the darts that punctured her snow-white skin had what she would describe as the very first feeling of relief in all her long living life. The countless hours, painful studies and grueling experimentations felt like they had all melted away and in just her little bubble. She could feel absolute freedom of thought. So, this is what bliss feels like. Iris spoke to herself inside her mind. It was absolute darkness and the only things she can feel in her catatonic state except for the hearing of her own heartbeat that was softly being heard and the feeling of being submerged in a set of thoughts. Yet for Iris, her own memories were only filled with nothing but failure and sleepless nights in her study. Whenever she tried to re-experience such memories, she was struck with great shock that hurt her mental conditions and her mind suffered like an animal whose foot was caught in a leg trap. With her memories practically off-limits for her to think about she was there again swimming inside her mind. At first, Iris didn't mind but the nothingness of her brain soon got over her as she eventually got bored being idle within her mind. She began to swim through her memories searching for something to keep her stimulated. Then she came upon the memories she siphoned from that nightmare that she performed the rite of the blooded mind on. At first, she hesitated due to the last time she had done the rite. She suffered an epileptic shock that nearly killed her. The many memories, knowledge that the nightman has stored were so much to bear for Iris. At first, she thought that the nightman was some out of the ordinary adventurer far away from his homeland, wherever it is, in search of riches. Then after a brief demonstration of some fire magics from him, did she think that the man was some sort of wandering mage? But after Iris bit him and drained his blood did she saw images that she couldn't comprehend. They all came so fast yet the memories were as clear as spring water to her that she was lucky she could handle the mental shock of them all. There were numbers, symbols, geometries, shapes, and theories that all sounded she could understand but for some reason could never grasp. Perhaps I went through them too fast. Maybe I should take it slower. Iris reasoned. She focused her mind to re-enter the memories of the nightman but took care not to overdo herself lest what had happened earlier occur again. She closed her eyes, took a deep breath and then entered into the memory. The first thing Iris sensed was the sound of soft chirping birds in ambivalent background, then the sound of horns and the footsteps of people that sounded so near to her. She then opened her eyes to a bright blinding light followed by the sights of the said sources of the footsteps. She was surrounded by dozens of people who walked past while inside an urbanized environment that she can't recognize yet feel so familiar. Many of fashion wear didn't fit the description of any Gleasia's nations. She noticed some people wore black coats with a neckwear that dips down to the length of their torsos. Another group of people wore colorful clothing that would not be out of place of a traveling troupe entertainers, and they even have to outlandish hair to complement their clothes. The buildings she was surrounded by tightened above her. Their height could even match the Slaeges, palace district in Herring Point and the elven spires of their ethereal continent, and they were virtually everywhere as far as the eyes could see and perhaps even beyond the eyes vision too. The buildings were all covered head to toe with glass panes that reflects all images that passed by her. Iris peeked at the mirrors and observed herself. Her reflection was the image of a tall black-skinned man in a blue long-sleeved shirt. She must be experiencing Ken the Nightman's memories again. This time however, she doesn't feel a slowly growing mental knife being punctured into her brain so her taking its slow approach must be working. Whatever she is in, she has stumbled herself into another world although it's only virtual in nature but memories do not lie. She began to walk forward experiencing the memory before her. She can see what looks like vendors selling food in the streets. Some of them look like sausages that were placed in a loaf of bread that was sliced in the middle to allow room for the sausage to fit in between. She passed by strange metal carriages that move without horses that Iris couldn't understand how it can even operate without them. Was it perhaps magic? Were people in this city all powerful mages? 
It's more practical to walk than to magically lift yourself to move around. She turned her head to the buildings next to her. The glass windows revealed a trove of exotic treasures being sold to the public. Iris could make out the merchandise our jewelry, delicious foods, perfumes, furniture that this world offered. Some were styled over familiar designs with intricate patterns similar to the fashions back in Gleesia. Others however were of a more minimalistic approach with singular colors and blocky shapes. Continuing to a window shop, Iris then came across a window that displayed women's clothes of formal flavorings. There were gowns, blouses and dresses that sparked Iris' eyes with much desire. The vampire witch eyed a stylish purple dress that was the centerpiece of the collection and imagined herself wearing it. I could be the talk of the Terrian annual ball with that dress. It would make even Princess Arya and those snooty Slaeage and nobles jealous. She thought, she could imagine herself twirling around the Tyrian annual ball held nearby from her forest home in the purple dress. It was so one of a kind that no tailor in Gleesia can hope to fabricate. No tailor, in Gleesia. Iris soon began to realize to her amazement and horror, the strange black metal magic rods that struck her. The city, the culture, the numbers symbols, they began to slowly make sense, these humans aren't from Gleesia let alone some far off nation, then where did they come from? In our next piece of news today in Good Morning America, said a voice from next door. Walking over to the next set of windows she noticed that crowd of people were staring at whatever the windows had in display. Examining them, she noticed that the people were looking at a set of what she can only describe as magic mirrors. There was a person in a well-pressed coat being displayed on the screen. Additionally, there were was several smaller screens that were being displayed inside the bigger screen that showed images and words. Thanks to her acquired knowledge of these new humans she can read the text on the magic mirror, new habitable planet found. Called Benham 3 the text said, The United Earth Federation's Bureau of Colonial Affairs is now seeking applicants for a new colony to be built on the planet. The man on the magic mirror just said, that person then leaned his head to his hand as if he was listening to an inaudible voice. The man seemed to be listening intently to whatever being was speaking to him, then his eyes widened in surprise. This just in, for folks who are listening from New York. Check out your window and see the brand new colony ship the EODEM perform a routine test flight. The ship will be used for the colonization efforts of Benham 3. The crowd watching the magic mirrors dispersed to look up into the sky in search of the EODEM. A ship that can fly? What kind of boat can even do that? Iris asked herself. Look up in the sky. There it is, said one of the people. The crowd began to cheer as a slow thundering sound began to form. Iris turned her head skywards to see that her eyes were shadowed by a great object that blocked the sun. Refocusing her vision, she noticed that it was a large wingless object that floated above the city and to her amazement it had the name the Eodem written on its surface. The crowd cheered as the flying ship floated above the cityscape. What new discovery across the stars will she and her brave pioneers and crew will find? Perhaps you can be one of them. Sign up and explore outer space and the heavens beyond today at the Youth Colonial Affairs Bureau website today, said the magic mirror. Across the stars, giant flying boats, exploring the heavens, have I attacked gods? Iris' mind flooded with more eldritch questions. She had more answers but now even more questions that are harder than the last. Who are these humans? Are they the Gleesian pantheons of gods from all of her world's races now descending upon their world? Are they demons coming to conquer their planet? What and who are these people she has seen? Iris began to collapse on the concrete floor of the city laughing hysterically before slowly screaming in terror. Dash back in the real world Dash. No, Iris yelled as she opened her eyes and quickly rise up, yet she recoiled back to the soft cushioning of a bed. She looked at her own body and noticed that her arms and her waist were restrained by belts. Normally if a vampire who is caught in this predicament would most likely be locked in some prison by vampire hunters where the unlucky vampire would be tortured for information. The very thought of that angered Iris as she struggled to break free from her bonds. Let me go this instant. Iris growled. Ah, you scared me, 
said a soft voice. Who is there? Show yourself, she said. A woman in a white gown rose up from beneath the ground and scratched her head. The woman's skin was pale as iris and her hair was as black as night just like the vampire witch. Who are you? What have you done to me? Let me go. Iris roared. Please calm down. You miss. I am not here to hurt you. The pale woman said. But Iris continued to struggle. How can I trust you? Maybe you are a vampire hunter coming to torture the secrets out of me? Iris said. I am not a torturer. That's against my Hippocratic oath and I am here to study you. The woman said. Study me? Well get your knives and holy water out and cut me up. I will tell you nothing. She defiantly pouted. Please miss, I won't even dream of doing that to you. Miss. You. Tell me your name. You do have a name Miss Vampire? The woman asked. Iris' mind was pierced by that question. The pale woman asked for her name. If she was a vampire hunter she wouldn't even bother to ask that question as they often dehumanize the vampires as nothing more as deceitful monsters who must be driven to extinction. So, for a moment, Iris calmed down and lowered her guard. Iris, Iris Kudahagan. What is your name? She replied then followed it up by a question. The pale woman softly walked towards Iris and sat next to her by the left side of the bed. I am Dr. Hainwell. But you can call me Hana if you want, she said. Hana that is a beautiful sounding name. Iris responded. Iris too sounds beautiful too. So, Miss Kudahagan or if you want I can call you just Iris if it makes you feel more comfortable if we skip the formalities. So, tell me about yourself Iris. Hana interrogated. Iris sighed in relief. This questioning was nothing like the horror stories that the sparse survivors and escapees of the vampire hunters would have entailed, but she is still bounded by the bed so for now she will indulge Hana with the pleasure of talking to her if it means buying her time to formulate a means of escape from wherever she is. Well, I assume you know by now I am a vampire. Iris began confessions. I know that already Iris. Now I want to know from the reports that you were shooting out magic from your hands at a private first class Ken Mudwin. Does he ring a bell? Big tall man with black skin? Yes. The nightman I bit. There's something I have learned from him. Iris answered. She paused while recollect the memories she had seen from his mid. Before we talk about PFC. Mudwin first I want to know from you how you can perform this magic that the soldiers have seen you do. Hana pressed. Well how should I start this? I mean you are asking me how magic works? Well we draw out our powers from the earth through these crystals that provide a rich source of power called Turnbull from the elven words of magic crystals who first discovered them. It is said that the crystals that are deep within earth can allow one to harness the magical powers into five types. There is destruction, restoration, conjuration, altercation, and illusion. Some people can wield magic better than others and whilst others are more specialized in a type of magic, as I assume you have known miss, I mean Hana, I have demonstrated to Ken my powers in destruction magic. Iris answered. Interesting, so what kind of mage are you? Hana continued, I am proficient in destruction magic that's a start. I have begun to practice conjuration but on the field of summoning monsters and the undead but I find that unappealing since I am more of a hands-on person. I am also an adept arcane crafter of destruction based magic. Iris answered, arcane crafter? What is that? Hana asked, well, I can basically give magical effects to items. Most of the people who practice arcane crafts live in the cities where they perform more practical and harmless enchantments like nourishment, metal hardening and fortify magic siphoning. I practice more destructive enchantments like fire explosion, poison cloud and blizzard which has been under scrutiny by the Slay Aegean Empire for decades. Iris said. Why under such scrutiny by these Slay Aegean Empire people? Well, the Slay Aegean Empire. The liege of the Principality of Tyrian where I live in the Verdon Valley Forest has been cracking down on people who can perform destructive based spells and arcane crafts for over decades due to the rise of magical insurgent attacks by bandits and northmen. Iris said with disdain. That sounds reasonable to me. I do not like the sound of those destructive enchantments you have told me about. You do look upset about it. Why is that? 
Hanu asked. Iris sighed then bit her lip. She had looked like she is hesitant to say her next words. The intended target of the destruction magic band was my kind of vampires. We are hated and feared from all over the continent due to our powers and long history with the humans. I am surprised you are so unaware of all of this. What part of Gleesia are you from that is so isolated from the rest of the world? Iris asked a question to Hana now reversing the tables. To tell you the truth Iris we are not from this world at all. We come from a far away planet from the sky and traveled here to this planet that we call Benham 3. I assume that Gleesia is what you call this planet am I correct? Hana replied. In the first time in her long life, Iris felt humiliated. She has seen. Yes, I guess. If you are from the skies are you gods? They say that people who come from the sky are gods. Iris asked with an eager tone. Her eyes widened in excitement and fear as she leaned forward and stared at Dr. Hanu intently. No, the United Federation of Earth are not gods. We are just like normal humans. Although I believe you think we are because of Clark's third law. Hanu said. Clark's third law? It quotes any sufficiently advanced technology as indistinguishable from magic. According to the report Strider Group made when they came back, Kane threw several packs of thermite charges at you. Thermite by the way produces fire. So, by your logic, you think Kane is a fire mage or something like that? Hana hypothesized. Yes, though I find it strange that when he threw those spells at me, I didn't sense any magical energies within him or those thermite spells. Iris remembered. Her observations of her nightman adversary was a curiosity to her. Thermite is not magic Iris. It's a compound that burns. Although it's best you talk to an engineer like Ken for a question like that because I am a doctor not a soldier, Hana said. She struggled to continue smiling after explaining her limited knowledge of military hardware to the vampire. May I ask Ken to be her right now? Iris asked. The man who you attacked his team and bit? Why? I doubt he would even agree to even her about you after what you did to him. Perhaps I can get maybe Sergeant Kincaid or Dr. Shimezaki to. Hana said but was interrupted by Iris. No, I need him. I need him to explain these numbers and symbols in my head. Iris said, just thinking about the eldritch images caused her to get a headache from the sheer confusion it brought to her. Hana was astonished by Iris' reasons of asking for Cain. When she mentioned about numbers and symbols in her head she knew that something as seriously was wrong with her. She leaned forward closer to Iris and pressed for more information. What are these things you have in your mind right now? Why ask for private first class Mudwin specifically? Hana asked. When I bit him, I did something more to him. I also bit through his mind and began to siphon then examine his memories and thoughts. Originally, I wanted to know what his magical knowledge was but instead I saw his memories that included great flying boats that titans over buildings, giant skyscraping towers made of glass, magic mirrors with people and words moving around then these numbers and symbols. They all make so much sense yet I just can't grasp it. Iris said. Hana was understandably shocked by what Iris just told her. This soft-headed approach to interrogating such fantastically hostile creature was indeed paying off. The revelation of what the vampire witch is capable of has both terrified of her and fascinated of her. This vampire was able to siphon the memories and thoughts of Ken. She has thought that perhaps these numbers and symbols that Iris has described that she was getting confused by were in fact scientific symbols and math formulas. That would explain why she said that it made sense but unable to grasp it. She wasn't expecting much from such a primitive native of this fantasy world of Benham III or also known by the natives as Gleesia. However the amount of scholarly capacity that Iris knows about her respective fields is something that can be useful for the colony in being able to survive under these new world conditions. I will get Ken and see if it will be okay if he can entertain your questions but I don't have any guarantees that he would agree to come. Stay here Miss Iris and don't try anything. There are guards outside this room right now and I would hate to see you hurt after what we have accomplished so far. Hana said in a reassuring voice. She stood up from the bed and began to collect her notes and place them in a bag on a nearby desk. Are you sure you will come back to me doctor? Iris asked. 
Just give me a while to sort through these notes and I will get back to you before you know it. Hana smiled. The Korean doctor walked out of the room but before she exited she showed a reassuring smile to the vampire which the captive Iris was comforted to see. After getting outside of the room, Hana Sai then pressed her hidden earpiece by her right ear and called out to her contact from the other side of the device. You have heard all that Governor White? Hana said. Yes, we heard and saw everything. The plot thickens doctor, it is a good call having you doing the interrogation of the vampire Dr. Hainwell, what could have taken days was accomplished in about 30 minutes from you. Governor Jeremy White answered from the earpiece. Right now, we have Iris Trust right now and it's best we capitalize on it. Get me private first class Mudwin to report to the medical bay as soon as he can. Hana said. I don't know if he will agree to it after fighting her. But I will call Lieutenant Rose now and try to persuade her to send out Mudwin. The governor replied. Dash 30 minutes later dash. After what had seemed to be the longest and the most tense moment of Iris life, the door to her room opened. The first entrant was Dr. Lee Hainanel who strided quietly towards her and sat down. Then a large man in the same garments that Iris remembered seeing the youth wore when they invaded her home. By the sight of the man's left breast she noticed that the name tag there is stated to be Mudwin. However, Kane was wearing several peculiar accessories compared to what the vampire remembered seeing him. He wore two different sets of neckwear a wooden crucifix and a braid of garlic. By his hands he held in his left a mirror and a wooden stake on his right. Iris grinned her teeth at Cain as she laughed that this man thinks that these mundane items, crucifix aside, can even remotely harm her. I don't think you can harm me with those nightmen. Iris mockingly teased. That's exactly what a vampire begging for her life would say. Are you just going to just keep calling me that? Nightman? Cain frowned. Private. Iris, please settle down. Hana mediated. The two stilled their emotions and calmly rested themselves. Ken however was still under tension as he stared daggers at Iris, ready to pounce at her in case she tries to make a move. Now we are gathered here today because Iris has been shown to be cooperating with our interrogations after she had been I mean after she checked into our medical bay. And Iris would like to ask a few you question for you private first class Mudwin. Iris said. What kind of questions? Why do you want to know? Ken asked. While I bit you Nightman during the first time we met, I did a bit of a. Let's say a ritual that allows me to collect your memories while I drank you blood. Ken stood up with his eyes widened in shock. Then his face painted with anger as he cruelly pointed his finger at Iris. You looked into my memories? What did you see? You cannot know what I know. Ken yelled. Please. These symbols, numbers, and images in my head? I must know. Iris pleaded. Like I will every tell you. This conversation is over. Ken angrily stood up and proceeded to storm out of the room. No. Ken we just barely begun. Hana begged but the Nigerian ignored her. Iris simply couldn't lose this opportunity to find the answers that plagued her mind. She was at the verge of breaking down in a panicked cry as she tried to find a way to keep Cain from leaving her in a void of ignorance. May I at least ask you about Maeve? Iris said. Cain paused as he was about to turn the knob of the door as his ears heard the word of Maeve coming from the vampire. And what do you know about it? Cain softly spoke in a stark contrast to his tone a few moments ago. You were served this brown soup called Maeve during your tenth birthday. May I at least know what exactly it is? Iris asked. Her words seemed to be able to pierce through the Nigerian's tough exterior as the man loosened his posture and began to breathe slowly. It is my favorite dish back when I still lived in the U.S. My mom used to cook that for me. Cain said. Your favorite? It actually tastes quite good. Iris said, now calm to see that the Nigerian is now more sociable. All right, I will entertain some questions for a while vampire. Cain walked back inside the room and then sat down next to Iris left side. Now with the answer right in front of her. Iris readied herself for the questions she will ask and the revelations will she obtain. So, what do you want to ask me vampire? Ken asked. My name is Iris, not vampire. Iris objected, says the woman who calls me Nightman. And I am the only racist in this room? Ken rebutted. Fine, Ken Mudwin. 
What are these symbols and numbers in my head? Iris asked. Well you got to be more specific on what kind of stuff you're seeing in your brain of yours. Ken sternly scolded. I can draw it. Iris said. Oh, here you go. Dr. Hana said. She turned the papers on her clipboard over and passed it with a pen to Iris. After receiving the writing implements and drawing medium, Iris drew the letters PB then drew the numbers of 82 on top of the letters. She turned the clipboard over to Ken for him to examine. That is the periodic table you must be seeing. And this is one of the elements. Lead. Yes. That's what could 29 is. Ken said. Yours magics have elements too? That is a strange way to say fire, ice, dark, light, life, or something. How can lead be an element? I mean I only recall lead ever being used to make official seals, paint, and statues. Iris commented. Oh, you won't believe what kind of things we can do with lead. Power, ammunition. Cables can't live without. Maybe I can show you one such thing later. Next question. Kane eagerly said, prompted by the answers she obtained and the eagerness from Kane. Iris flipped the paper of the clipboard again and drew another series of symbols and numbers. She drew the letters DS then the symbol greater than or equal to and finally the number zero. Turning it over to Kane to examine. She froze awaiting her answer. The Nigerian stared at the equation for over a minute struggling to identify the symbols Iris wrote. Even Dr. Hana who was observing the makeshift interview was just as confused as him. For a moment all was silent. Did I give you a hard one? Iris asked breaking the monotony of the room's soundless void. No, but I think I can help. Okay, give me a second let me check my phone. Ken said. He reached into his left pocket by his pants and grabbed a small orange-colored rectangular device from it and held it firmly in his hands. His hands had seemed to spark the device to life as the screen lit up like the magic mirrors that Iris remembered seeing in her visions. That thing, it looks like something I saw in my visions of you. Only they are bigger and people and words that move were in it. Iris pointed out. Really? Bigger smartphones? Oh. You mean televisions. What did you remember seeing from the TVs? Ken asked. They were talking about a giant flying boat that was recruiting people to colonize a place called Benham 3. The Eodem flew past above me and it was large as a town. Your United Federation of Earth are godlike compared to us. Iris said. Whilst she spoke, Ken placed the pint-sized magic mirror above her drawing. A loud snapping sound occurred before Ken took his magic mirror back close to him and began to fiddle his fingers with the device. Aliza, can you identify the formula in this drawing I took? Ken asked his magic mirror. Identifying, searching database, I found your answer. This is the formula for the second law of thermodynamics. A voice replied from within the miniature magic mirror or smartphone. Aliza, what can you tell us about the second law of thermodynamics? Ken asked again to his smartphone. The second law of thermodynamics states that the state of entropy of the entire universe, as an isolated system, will always increase over time. The second law also states that the changes in the entropy in the universe can never be negative, said Alizia. Entropy, universe, it's basically saying that energy goes away as time passes. Iris answered. Yes, that's it. Are you getting the answers you seek? Dr. Hanu asked. Yes, and I got so much more to ask from you. Iris smiled like an eager student. Yum, I am sorry am I afraid I can't just give you all the answers you want by me alone. You can read and understand our language, right? Ken inquired. Yes, almost perfectly I think. Iris answered. Well I can give you a book later about how our science and technology works so you can read. If, Hana said slowly stopping to catch herself from completing her second sentence. If what? Iris asked astonished by the request. She was doing so well getting the answers but now she has been hit with a wall that halt her progress. You are perhaps the first and presently the only native of Benham 3 that can understand and speak our language. My superiors have deemed you very useful for our colony's development plans as you being familiar with the land and the language. You can be the colony's guide and translator into Benham 3, or as you have told me, Glesia, Hana explained. And what do I get from this proposition? Iris asked. 
Well the books I promise you is one such compensation. You can even live here in our new town once it's built. We can even do some favors for you in exchange for your help. With consultation from Governor White of course, Hana negotiated. All right. Although I do want add that I am not interested in living with you due to personal space reasons but I can agree with the rest. Iris nodded. Phew. For the first time in five long days we have some good news after that damn bandit attack. Kane smiled. You. We were attacked by bandits some time ago? Iris asked. Yes. When we landed five days ago some men tried to burn us and kill us. We fought them off well but then one man in robes summoned some giant fire golem monster and tried to burn us alive. Thankfully Lieutenant Rose alongside me and the squad killed it with fire extinguishers. Fire extinguishers. Kane laughed. You fought the burning horse bandits and won? Iris exclaimed catching both Dr. Lee Hainanel and Kane by surprise. Why? Who are these burning horse bandits? Kane asked. They are the most dangerous family of brigands this side of the Principality and Valley. They have been known to raid villages and extort money off of the people from all walks of life. Everyone is scared of them as they have over 1,000 members. Iris said. That sounds troubling. What else did they do? Ken asked. I have heard that if someone refuses to pay up, their home gets trampled by their horsemen first as a warning. If they refuse again, they send their pyromaniacs or sometimes a fire mage to burn your house when you are away. If you still refuse then they kidnap you and your family and burn all of you alive as a warning to others to pay their protection. Iris said. My god that's horrible. They are definitely bad news. Would it be great with you if we can maybe take them down or something for you? Nobody should live like that. Ken declared proudly. Iris was shocked that those words came out of the Nigerian's mouth. Very few people had the guts to stand up to the burning horse bandits, not even the nobility of the Principality of Tyrian where she lives couldn't lay their fingers on them due to bribery and blackmail that their leader Divico would throw at them. Divico practically had free reins on what he could do in Tyrian and nobody could stop him. Yet these people from another world stood up to these oppressive outlaws so confidently that Iris assumed Ken is suffering from a case of suicidal overconfidence. But, I have seen them do horrible things to so many people, they once robbed me and stole my most prized possession, a purified mana crystal necklace, I use it to power some of my more potent spells and demanding experiments but I lost it when the bandits raided my home. Iris sadly muttered, a mana crystal? Hey Dr. Hainwell, you said that the science team is working on studying some necklace we found on a dead mage guy who my team killed after we took down that fire golem right? Ken asked Hana. Yes. Do you think it's hers? Hana wondered. Do you have it now? Let me see it. It is not only a valuable possession of mine but a family heirloom of the Kudahagans. Iris said. Well it does look pretty to hang in a jewelry store when I saw it. Maybe it is your necklace. Hana can you get it from Dr. Melona? Ken asked. Sure. Wait here. Ken keep an eye on our guest while I fetch the necklace. Hana stood up and exited the room leaving Ken and Iris alone together. It was all quiet staring with both of the two physically contrasting figures. Iris was excitedly by the edge of her seat hoping to be reunited with her necklace while Ken however was alerted off the edge of his chair when he was told that the necklace will be given back to its previous magically attuned donor. What if Iris uses the power of that necklace to escape? Then a knock on the door before it was opened and came in Dr. Lee Hainanel and another man. He was tall and authoritative in appearance and wore the green garments that youth soldiers were wearing. Iris Kadahagan. I am Colonel Polonsky, commander of the Benham Three Colonial Militia. The newcomer in the room sternly said, and what brings you to me colonel? Iris asked. The colonel silently grabbed an object from the breast of his jacket. It was the necklace they have retrieved from the mage who was controlling the fire golem. That's my necklace. Iris excitedly exclaimed. Her irises opened in joy as she tried to reach for her necklace but the restraints locked her in place. So, Samantha's wild guess was correct. You are indeed the owner of this necklace. I got to say madam. It's indeed beautiful, Polonsky complimented. Yes, it is as I said before a family heirloom now can I have it back? Iris asked. No, 
at least not yet, Polonsky slyly said as he slides back Iris' necklace to his jacket. What? How dare you? Give it back. Iris snapped. Her body struggled for freedom beneath the restraints but she was tied down by reinforced fibers designed to tie down a rampaging elephant. I will return it in time Iris so please calm down, Polonsky said. How soon? Iris growled her teeth showing and her eyes hungered for blood causing everyone in the room to shudder fearfully. Work for us and in time this necklace will be back into your hands. You can either play nice or be put down where you lay. I am giving you a chance right now Ms. Kudahagan. Now choose what happens next. Polonsky shrewdly responded. Iris gulped. Being under the servitude of someone is undesirable for a woman of her kind and status but she will get her necklace back. But what if they don't keep their word? Her next choice was to break free from her leather straps, grab her necklace and fight her way out of the place. She knows that she isn't too far away from her home but what kind of opposition will she face outside of the door? There could be more soldiers waiting for her to try and make a move that would gladly shoot her down. So far Dr. Lee Hainanel and Karen Mudwin were so far being nice to her right now and it was playing to her advantage. Until then, Iris reasoned herself for a moment until she come up with her choice. With a swallowed pride she says, All right, I will help you. The vampire witch said, You made the right choice Miss Kudahagan. Dr. Lee Hainanel, I assign you to be her liaison. I want you to study what she knows and relay it back to command, Polonsky ordered. Yes Colonel, Hana nodded. Dash the next day dash. Hey hold still. I need to get this screw back. And done. Ken ecstatically said. He backed off for laying down Vincent as he finished reinstalling Vincent's battle augmentations. The ex-thief had used several augmentations during his old criminal career such as a rapid movement booster. The RMB August allows an individual to dash and quickly move almost instantaneously in whatever direction he chose. Its initial purpose was to allow soldiers who are often in the role of appointment to reflexively react quickly in close quarters and emergency situations for superior combat performance compared to their naturalized adversaries. However, the RMB August has found its way into the hands of criminal elements which is used by them to get away from law enforcement or get an edge in combat in a pitch. Although, Vincent was given an older and inferior model of the August he was used to having before it was confiscated during his arrest. Okay, Kane, all right ready with the watch? Vincent asked Samantha. Let's see what you got. Ready, set, go. Samantha shouted as she pressed the button on her smartphone's stopwatch to go. Vincent activated his rapid movement booster and launched himself forward breezing past his squad mates as he approached the large empty cargo crates that Samantha has set up for training. He with the August aid quickly mounted the steel mountain and climbed to the top. There the next obstacle was a 10 meter gap to the other side of another mountain of stacked cargo crates. The record for the longest natural jump distance was around 8 meters but thanks to the RMB August it can easily go beyond that distance. Vincent tossed himself forward as his August pushed his legs like no ordinary man can even dream of achieving towards the landing in front of him. He sticks it. Woo. That's what I am talking about. Crocker cheered as he clapped his hands loudly. He was joined by a B. Dyer and Ken who also clapped. Samantha however was still doubting Diaz's abilities as she stared at her stopwatch. There is no way he can beat it in 30 seconds, she said to herself, after climbing down the grates. The next obstacles were a dozen logs that were constructed like hurdles that he must successively clear. Dashing forward, Vincent cleared them with the grace of a Kentucky Derby champion racehorse. Look at him go. Abidar commented, for the last obstacle in his way from victory was a barbed wire field that he must crawl under whilst subjected to mud. Diving down and slightly sliding a few feet, Vincent and his augmented body got to work crawling through. This is the hardest part of the course. No way. No way he can make it, Samantha said. Vincent's limbs plowed through the mud like a real plow as he effortlessly pushed himself through the mud. After he was out of the barbed wire, he stood up and began to run for the last meters of distance to back where he started. Come on home stretch you can make it. Ken cheered. Using the dash ability from his RMB orgs, 
Vincent covered the ground with his feet but to the naked eye. It was almost as if he was blinking rapidly towards the finish line. With a final mighty roar from him, Vincent dived forward to as his body flew past the finish line and his squad mate's body slamming onto the Gleesian floor. So. How did I do? Vincent exhaled as he breathed heavily and sweated profusely from his exertions. Just a few milliseconds to spare. I got to say Private Diaz. I am impressed. Samantha smiled although it was forced from her as she still sees the ex-thief with contempt. Ha. Huh. 29 point something seconds. If only I had my old dogs back I can give you half that time. Vincent boasted. You know that can't be right? Kane said. I know. But I could dream, Vincent said as he picked himself back up and brushed off the dirt from his shirt. Attention, yelled a voice that broke the light-hearted moment. Strider group scrambled to form a line, stand proudly and saluted to Colonel Polonsky walked towards them. Alongside him was Iris and Dr. Lee Hainwell. Your discipline is starting to show now. That is good for your next mission. Polonsky complimented the squad. Thank you sir. Samantha saluted. At ease Lieutenant, Polonsky said, the squad rested their postures and awaited their new orders. I have a relatively easy job for you that will not involve fighting anyone. As of the moment we have been gathering intel from our new informant Ms. Kadahagan for intel about this land and she has told me that she has several books from her home that she would like to show to our science team. I have assigned your squad to escort Ms. Kadahagan back to her home and retrieve these books. Polonsky briefed. Yes, sir, Samantha hesitantly said. She couldn't believe that she now has to treat the person who almost killed her and her squad was now to be treated a VIP. Is that some reluctance coming from you Lieutenant Rose? Polonsky grumbled at Samantha. No sir. Samantha picked her discipline up and saluted back to the colonel. Good. I want Ms. Kadahagan and those books of hers to be back here within the next hour. Dismiss. Dash on the road to Iris home dash. The road was quiet that day as Strider group returned to old dilapidated house with Iris in tow and the theme inside their cruiser was tense to say the least. Iris sat between Vincent and Kane in the back, Samantha driving, Abidia on shotgun and Crocker manning the MG turret. All of the squad members honestly didn't want to go back to that wretched place and having the owner who almost killed them inside their cruiser got everyone on edge. Why do you all feel scared? Am I not your friend now? Iris asked. Well for starters you tried to kill us more than a day ago, and we are not your friends. Samantha talked. It is rude for a lady to talk without facing the person they are talking to. Iris pouted. Well hello there vampire girl. I'm driving right now I can't just face you. Samantha talked back. How rude. Iris snapped. The vampire leaned forward towards Samantha but Cairn stopped her. Not a good idea right now miss. Sit back. Cairn sternly said. The vampire grudgingly agreed as she leaned back to her seat. I am just bored right now. All of I have been doing was just talking with Dr. Malona and Hana for hours and I could really use something to relax with. Iris sighed. If you want a bite, it's say no from me. Vincent said as he covered his neck from Iris. I am bored, not hungry you naughty little rascal. Iris come back. Oh, the vampire is sassy. Vincent teased. Hey. I'm actually quite bored too. Just like her, I think I can help with that for everyone. I got some nice beats from my phone that I listen to when I go on road trips. Maybe you can listen to my favorite southern gothic song if you want. This one is a goldie. A B Dyer suggested. Oh, sure if it's coming from you. Play it. Crocker said from the turret. What is southern gothic? Iris asked. It's best you listen to it. I hope you will like it. A B Dyer smiled. He placed his phone on a portable speaker he keeps and twiddled his fingers to select the song from his playlist. At first there was silence, then a beating drum and the sounds of strings coming from a guitar played, play priest, William Crichton, the lyrics from the abed speaker ringed like hush lulls to Iris. She has never heard of the kind of music before and not even the famous elven bards can even hope to match the rhythm that she has heard. She was in bliss as she indulged herself in the audio that besieged her ears smiling happily and eyes closed. I think she likes it. Abhi Dyer said. Quiet. Let me hear this. Iris said. Yeah definitely like it. 
Hey, is that smoke? Ken pointed. Samantha looked forward from her driver's seat and noticed that was the direction they are taking to go to Aris house. That's where we head in right? Floor it Lieutenant. Crocker shouted as he cocked the machine gun readying himself for a fight. Samantha stepped on the gas of their cruiser causing the engine to roar as it sped past the Verdon Valley forest's trees. Iris hanged on tight from her seatbelt as she braced herself on the tremendous or at least by her kind standard speed of the steel horse that the youth can commandeer. As the cruiser parked wildly at the entrance of Iris' home the place was a smoldering mess of ash and fire. The squad and Iris got out of the vehicle in utter dismay as they saw the house was now nothing but blackened wooden scorched stone. From those ruins the banner of a horse standing upright with an inflamed illustration in the background was posted in front of what was Iris' front door. Iris knelt down and gathered the ashes of her raised home and cried, wailing loudly to the sky, I curse you all burning horse bandits and may your disgusting leader Divico die a thousand deaths. Iris screamed. Iris, we are so sorry. Ken comforted her. He placed his hand on Iris' soldier and rubbed it which was a small remedy to her emotional state. I know. It's not your fault. It's the fucking burning horse's fault. She growled, as the vampire mourned the loss of the very home she has built with her own two magical hands. Samantha, in the back solemnly contacted her superiors by the radio. HQ, this is Strider lead. Iris' home was destroyed by hostile elements, she said. Dash flashback. About a week after the conclave explosion dash. My gods they are back. They are more. They kill kill kill. Owen screamed. He kicked and flailed his arms like a crying babe as several of his magi peers kept him still and from hurting himself or other people. What did he see in the visions? said one of the magi. I do not know. Apprentice, where are that elixir? said another. Right here master, said the magi's apprentice. She passed bottle to her master hurriedly whilst he was struggling to keep him in place. The elixir that was given is a special brew used to sedate restless people and help them feel calm. It was made from special herbs that were imported from the elven continent of Alphalnora, which the ingredients can only be found from. Despite the Sleechen Empire's envy of the access of unique resources that grows from that paradise-like land, they have got to say, those arrogant elves do know how to make some great Bruce. Popping the tap open, the magi placed the elixir onto Owen's lips and force-fed him the drink. As the Grand Master swallowed the concoction his flailing waned until he was resting comfortable at his bed. Ah, Queen Elisivan soil. It feels so, warm and loving. Owen dreamily muttered, Grand Master. Can you speak to us? The magi said calmly. What do you want from me? Owen said. The visions? What did you see? What are these demons you spoke of? The magi asked. Owen was silent as the question wandered through his ears. Oh, how will he explain the horrors he has seen from to his peers? He saw doom and destruction for all and he could get executed for such defamation and libel. Listen carefully and do not tell anyone what I will say. Demons hunger from the stars and see our world as a meal for which to satisfy their desires. In their eyes they will see us a bountiful cornucopia for which to devour greedily too. Owen spoke. That can't be true. You surely just grandmaster. The Magi exclaimed. He frantically tried to keep his calm but he knew that Jeltogar's comet's prophecy is a great change and the change was apocalyptic that the Empire and all Gleesia will not want to experience. Gods forgive me but I saw it with my own eyes. May they have mercy on us all, Owen said. Are we truly doomed to die? Another mage I asked. They will send their eyes to scour the land for souls to eat and when they see us they will gladly come and eat us. They will come and scour they will see all. Wait. If. They see souls. <laughs> Owen caught himself as he remembered the visions. He saw eyes fall down from the heavens to scour the land for souls. From the legends and myths of Gleesia, demons need souls as nourishment just as a person needs food to survive. And since no hungry entity would go to a place where there is no food to consume, I think I know how to stop the apocalypse. Owen happily jumped out of his bed, a spark of genius lighted his mind as he began to enact his heroic plan to save his empire and all Gleesia. But foolishly, 
His plan will undoubtedly doom everyone to the oof. A.N. and another one down. I assumed my fellow readers that you are getting a bit overwhelmed with the action that started our story to begin with so for this and the next chapter it will be a breather for you all as I go on cruise control wears sunglasses. I had tons of fun designing Iris Kadahagan, our vampire witch. She was inspired by three three people, Serena from S, Skyrim, Rory Mercury and Lely from Gate. They are basically what happens if I combined them together. So anyways I am off to watch an advanced screening of Marvel Infinity War. PLS like, subscribe and review PLS. Starhack 48, Chapter 5 the Principality of Tyrion. Iris snuggled herself by the blanket while holding a cup of a special brew that the youth call hot chocolate with marshmallows. Whenever she was in the verge of crying, Dr. Lee Hainanel told her to take a sip of the hot chocolate and if she needs to distress herself she can always chew on the pillow soft marshmallows to gnash her canines too. While the vampire witch was kept from wailing loudly with her provided comforts, Colonel Polonsky and Strider group were gathered next to a table across the room. Well this just got worse, and I thought Iris will be such a good help, Rose. So these burning horse bandits are not only the people who burned Tyrus home but were also the people we fought before with the flame Gillum? Polonsky asked. It was confirmed. Samantha answered. And judging from the accounts we got from Iris, they are bad news. Arson, murder and horrible street art. These people sound very much they need to be stop, Polonsky said while reviewing the notes he has obtained about Gleesia on the table. So, what happens now Colonel? Crocker asked. Well without the books to give us our needed knowledge of this place we'll have to do this the old fashioned way and just walk up and map up the land. Mudwin I want your drones to be ready to conduct a geological survey of the area near the city of Tyrian, Polonsky said. Tyrian? Samantha asked. It is a city that Iris has mentioned about during our interviews with Hana and I conducted. From what she said, it's a large walled city northwest from our settlement. Said to be home to the local ruler of this place, a Prince Klovich by the name. His family, the Rians have been ruling over about everything within a 35 mile radius from his city. According to Iris, he is received rather contently for a 30 year old leader. I want you to go scout out the city, upload me the survey date to and await further instructions, Polonsky ordered, you are going to the city, Iris interrupted, yes, how are you feeling Iris, Samantha asked, better, thank you for the blanket and this medicine called chocolate, I feel much better now, so, you are going to Tyrian? I can be your guide about the place. I have been to the city now and then to buy food and ingredients for my experiments. I do have some. You. Errands. To do in the city. Iris said. Well, I don't want to have Strider group go in completely blind and you asked nicely. Very well. Iris shall accompany you to Tyrion as auxiliary support. Now pack up as much gear as you can fit on your cruiser because this mission could take a few days to complete. Dismiss. Polonsky raised his voice. Strider group saluted to their CEO and moved out. Dash on the road to Tyrion Dash. So, guys, when the two began to have their romantic night under the sun, I snuck up behind them by a cliff against the wind. I can practically see from above the male on top of her ready to make some babies when I lined up by rifle and bam, got both of them in one shot. You should have seen the look on their faces. They looked like they were caught mid-orgasm, the taxidermist couldn't stop laughing at the trophy after he did his thing with it. Abhi Dyer said, storytelling his most memorable hunt to the squad while they sped through the road. You're so naughty abed, I thought you hillbillies were conservatives, but no. You snuck up on them mid-sex and shot them. Samantha laughed, is that even legal? Vincent asked. That's pretty rich coming from you. Samantha said. Oh. For real lieutenant, you said naughty and from my experience, the way you said it is the same on how a hooker would say you have been a naughty boy. Vincent mocked in his best seductive woman's accent. Cain, Iris and Crocker couldn't help but chuckle at the story of B. Dyer had shared. 
without the luxury of the internet and television yet they had to rely on storytelling to keep themselves entertained in the road. Some of the stories that group shared were ranging from funny to the bizarre. It started with Samantha's first attempt on trying to cook an omelette for her dad during Father's Day but ended up causing her to call the fire department because she almost burned down her family's house down. Crocker's story was during a time in his college years where he was hazed by his fraternity mates by streaking naked around the campus while his friends were pelting eggs at him. For Kane, he told the story where he had become a victim of a Japanese variety show prank. Then there was Vincent who told the story of the time he snuck inside a fancy charity raffle and stole a sports car in front of the city's elites whilst it the raffle was being drawn. Iris couldn't help but smile as she had heard those stories. Ken had helped her by explaining several of the unfamiliar terms she had heard from them. She was still trying to grasp the English language she was acquired from the youth and if she can linguistically compare her mother tongue to English. They share several grammar settings and rules with the English language. Having new words that her old tongue didn't have a word for due to cultural and technological differences. Hey, how about her? She hasn't told us something about herself? Vincent asked the group. He pointed his finger at Iris which caught the vampire in surprise. Me? But don't you hate me after I almost killed all of you? Iris asked trying to deflect Vincent's question. Well you are playing nice right now so we might as well play nice back. Do unto others what you want others to do unto you. So, let's forget that shit in your... You may not going there but you get the idea, Vincent said. Amen to that. Abida praised. Come on Iris, we shared stories and you might as well share yours since you're with us now. Ken encouraged. Yes Iris, go share one. I don't want to be the odd one out for my woman's story. Got anything funny or interesting to say? Maybe about Gleesia or yourself? Samantha asked. Okay. Not about myself but I can talk more about Tyrion. Iris answered. More intel the better vampy. Samantha added. Well, officially the name of the land we are in right now is the Principality of Tyrion. It's a dominion of the Stla Aegean Empire which rules from its capital Herring Point. In exchange for protection, the Principality provides the Empire military access to its lands and the power to levy men when the Empire goes to war. So. The prince answers to this Stla Aegean Empire. How big are we talking about? Samantha asked. From the northern mountains about a month's journey, to the southern Rivieras that takes a week. The easternmost point of the empire is the capital that takes a fortnight to get to and from and then Tyrion is by far the easternmost dominion of the empire. Iris explained. By far? Samantha asked. Its armies are expanding and conquering new territories. However, the northern mountains are a front for the Stla Aegean legions because of the Scandinite barbarians from their island continent up north. So far that's the only place of trouble in the empire right now since all that is left eastward is uninhabited forests and plains that nothing of interest is found so no one would willingly go there unless they are part of trade caravan bound for the eastern kingdoms far away from here. Iris added. So basically, they are pretty fucking huge. Any chance we can go to Herring Point and drop by to say hello? Crocker asked. I don't think so. The Stla Aegean Empire tends to be very defensive to foreigners even if they look human. Iris softly sighed. A sense of sadness and resentment from the vampire's face was painted on her head as she expressed her words. Okay then you. So we will be approaching Tyrion in a while. We should hide the cruiser by some trees and we can get to work. I will have to accompany you to the city to keep an eye on you for security reasons if you don't mind. Samantha asked. I don't I just need to withdraw some ducats from the bank. They are the empire's currency by the way. Iris said. Hey Sage, I suggest you will want to take Diaz with you just to be sure. Crocker suggested. The criminal? Why? Samantha snapped. Almost busting a nerve on her forehead. I am too conspicuous with my exosuit and LMG plus Kane needs a bee diet to assist him with the navigational equipment while he pilots the drone. Crocker argued. But what if he tries to run away? Samantha rebutted. I have nowhere to run to for crying out loud. Look I am practically just stuck here being bossed around by you lieutenant. I got no contacts. No stashes. 
no safe houses. All I got is the clothes on my back. My unique set of skill and this UMP. I mean people still make these? Vincent said. Hey, respect the classics man. It may not be a good at spitting bullets but there's reason why the SWATs still use that museum piece. Crocker said. Point taken from the Maori. Now stick your tongue out and scare me like the sergeant you are. Vincent teased. Crocker stuck his tongue out and wiggled it around his mouth causing the group to roar in laughter. Is this how you earth humans talk to each other? I wish I could have met you sooner. Iris chuckled. Yeah fine you can come with me and Iris if only just to make going to the bank a bit less tedious. Samantha spoke in defeat still resenting the ex-thief and silently cursing Colonel Polonsky. When she gets the chance, she will request that Vincent gets transferred to another squad so she doesn't have to suffer his manners of speech anymore. Dash inside Tyrion Dash. The city was like something straight out of a fairy tale book according to Samantha. She can see hundreds of people. Human people walk around the city going about their day-to-day -day business from merchants selling their wares to women fulfilling their chores whilst making small talk with their neighbors. Sneaking a few shots of her camera in a careful attempt to not attract attention to herself, she discreetly snapshots from the covers of her jacket that have concealed her foreign gear and weaponry. Wearing a similar disguise, Vincent deeply inhaled the primitive but metropolitan air of the city. Ah civilization or at least at its most based of states. I can hear the yelling of vendors, screaming, some town gossip, and, oh shit that dog over there just shit, Vincent said, don't get distracted Diaz, we have a job to do. Iris lead the way, Samantha scolded before turning to the vampire witch. Iris curled her finger backward urging the two to follow her as they continued on their walk through the city. As they strolled past people, Samantha could hear the voices of the Tyrian residents talk to each other, not in a weird alien tongue but crisp clear English. Have you heard about the explosion in Wizards College back at the Capitol? Gossiped a young man who was conversing with another one. Mister can you please spare me a coin? An old beggar pleaded while he leaned on a wall. How much for this fine carpet of yours merchant? A rich looking man said in an attempt to haggle. Fresh vegetables. Get your fresh vegetables, said a middle-aged woman who was vending her farm's produce to the public for ducats. These voices besieged her causing her to suffer a migraine. She stopped in the middle of the pavement rubbing her forehead for relief. Iris paused her walking and softly moved to the red-headed and placed her hand behind her back. Is something wrong? Iris asked concernedly. I can hear everyone. In English. It hurts a bit. I can barely think and see straight. Samantha spokes. Me too. It feels overwhelming for me, hearing people speaking normally. As in our normal. Vincent commented. It's because I took the liberty of enchanting every one of your squad before we departed with a spell that allows you to understand us. I call it the all tongue. You can hear us gleasons as if we were speaking in your language and when you speak to us it's the other way around. Iris explained. You cast a spell on us without telling us. Iris what the hell? You can't just do that. Samantha snapped. Why? I thought it would help you. I was told by Polonsky and Dr. Hanna to help you as your guide. Iris said shocked by the sudden tone coming from the lieutenant. Look Iris. We are still in a state of shock over this magic mumbo jumbo that this place has and many of us are pretty damn scared of it. Samantha said. Why? Magic was a blessing from the gods to help the people of Gleesia thrive. Iris argued. Okay, first off I don't care about your religion right now Iris. Just please for our sake don't cast any of these enchantments on us without our permission. Samantha said. Fine, I promise. Iris sighed. Make that a swear vampy, just to be damn sure. Swear us and the rest of the squad that you won't cast any enchantments on anyone without their permission. Vincent added whilst he raised his hand. Following his gesture, Iris raised her hand to begin her oath. I swear to not use my enchantments on any one of the Strider group soldiers. Make that anyone from the UFE please. Samantha interrupted. And to any of the UFE people that I. Iris could and the vampire witch. Vincent said. Iris could and the vampire witch have solemnly sworn to uphold. Iris finished her swearing. That's good to hear from you Iris. 
Now let's keep going. Samantha smiled. They continued to make their way through the city until they have reached metropolitan center of Tyrian which is the city square where many important buildings were found. Iris pointed at several significant buildings that Samantha noted, and took a sneaky photo of, such as the city hall where the principality discuss political theories and issues. The drunken bastard inn where they offer quality meals second only to the prince's own dinner table. The courthouse which houses the local branch of the Adventurers Guild where brave people ranging from mercenaries, heroic men and thrill seekers seek jobs to bring peace and order throughout the land from dealing with bandits, caravan protection and more. Finally, Iris then guided them to their destination, the Bank of Tyrian. It was a grand building with Roman-like inspirations for their outward aesthetics. It also was decorated by a few flowers that made the building inviting from those who wished to deposit their money inside. Well visit. Just come inside with me and keep quiet. This will only take a while. Iris spoke. She pushed open the door and the trio went inside the bank. They were greeted in a welcoming environment with marble floors, potted plants and a warm fireplace. As they were about to move forward a voice thundered in front of them. Iris, is that you again? said a small white bearded man in an elegant cloak. Greetings Luther. How is the city's greatest dwarven merchant doing? Iris smiled at Samantha saw as a sign that the vampire is in good terms with the dwarf. Oh, business as usual for me. I got to thank you for the exotic help in making that fire spewing axe for me. I made about 3,000 thousand ducats in that auction. A new record. Who are those people behind you? Luther responded. Oh. These are some mercenaries that I hired as protection while I do some which business if you know what I mean. Iris answered. Samantha could easily see through their lie whilst she stood still behind her. A secret job huh? Well I don't want you to interrupt your business here in the bank. I heard what happened to your home by the way. If you're looking for ways to earn more ducats, I got some jobs I can show you at my house later. I just need to finish some paperwork here and we can discuss business. Luther said. Let me withdraw from the bank and then we can talk. Iris smiled. Good to hear. Luther smiled as he waved off the vampire. Who is that midget? Friend of yours? Vincent asked. Luther Amirian, a dwarf merchant who lives here in Tyrian, the richest man in the city, even richer than the prince. Do dwarves exist from your world? Iris replied. Depends. Is dwarfism in Benham III a race of people or a deformity? Samantha inquired. A race of people they are. They normally live on top of the mountain regions but many dwarves live in the lower lands to interact with others. What do you mean by dwarfism being a deformity? Iris asked in confusion. Well, some earth humans in our world are born abnormally short, despite their parents being of average height. It happens now and then, Samantha answered. Are they discriminated for being small? Asked Iris. No. It's highly discouraged in our society to put down people of different height. Besides, most of the dwarves we know from Earth tend to be actors and really great ones to boot. Samantha smiled. I would like to see these dwarves of yours one day. Now please sit down by that bench and wait for me as I withdraw my money from the bank. Iris said. Samantha and Vincent turned round and sat down by the provided chairs of the establishment. As they see their guide enter the waiting line to interact with the bank clerk. For Samantha, so far, she has observed Iris for her time with her and by her judgment, she is going out of her way to winning over her people's trust. She was not acting the same during their hostile first encounter earlier in her burned up home back in the forest. The lieutenant also has to give some credit due to Vincent Diaz for helping her make Iris promise. Or swear to not use her magic to affect them without their permission. She can see that the penal soldier knows how to double down on persuading people shrewdly, probably an acquired talent from his old underground career. The lieutenant watched the vampire slowly inching her way through the waiting line of the bank. Iris' posture was ladylike in stature that Samantha deeply admired from the angle. The vampire, combined with her beautifully youthful exterior was like a masterpiece waiting to be drawn, painted, or taken a photo of. Yet Samantha was unsure if she can even take a photo of her since vampires, or at least according to various sources from fiction writers. 
don't have reflections and her photo camera is no different from a mirror. After processing the thought of capturing the image of Iris, Samantha kicked up her feet and began to wait patiently again. As for Vincent, however, he has decided to pull out a cigar from his pocket and light it up with his lighter. Huffing carbon monoxide in the air he casually lay leaned back his arms and silently waited. That could kill you, you know? Samantha whispered. May. Vincent sighed. Silence and the occasional thumping sound of a stamp were the only noises that the bank could entertain their ears which has caused the two to get bored of the monotony of their predicament. Samantha aimed her eyes back at Iris and is amused to see her now right in front of the desk clerk of the bank ready to withdraw her ducats. Then just as she was about to get a big sack of her money, the grand doors of the bank have opened. Out came seven men who carried a large chest, and judging the look on the men's grunting faces, they were carrying a heavy one. She also noticed that each of the men all wore an orange-colored neck scarf which is common attire for those who are associated with the burning horse bandits. Hey bank manager, got another big money of totally legit earnings from our boss Divico, said one of the bandits. A slender man in a business attire walked out of the desks and approached the bandits angrily. How many times do I have to tell you? I can't accept more of these large deposits of ducats anymore. The auditors are going to tear me apart when they ask me how your boss got this much money in such a short time. The bank manager pleaded. Look me in the eye. We got the entire principality in our fingertips and you think you can go against us? By any chance do you remember what you did in Temiran? Said the bandit connivingly. It was a sign that whatever this Temurin is, was enough leverage for the bank manager to comply in defeat as he stepped aside to the snake-like tongues of the burning horse bandits. Just as they were about to move their cargo to the bank's vault, one of the bandits, who Samantha assumes to be the leader of the group praised his hand to pause his troops. He turned his eyes towards the bank's desk and aimed them straight at Iris. Well, well, if it isn't the principality's resident witch Iris Kodahagan, I want to get some feedback from you. How did you like our little redecorating art that we did to your house? The bandit sergeant smiled in a mockingly coy attitude, more like vandalism. I say I give it a zero star rating. Iris answered back. You know you have been stubborn when paying our taxes so we had to give you some encouragement. Yet, you still say refuse, the bandit sergeant said. I have a life you know. I got more important things to do than to listen to the likes of you scum. Iris exclaimed. Ha, huh. she said she has a life. Well, there is no point hiding it. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare Iris Kadahagan as of a the bandit sergeant was about to reveal Iris secret to the bank customers and staff when Samantha interrupted him. Hands off my client, don't say a word, the lieutenant said as she pointed her rifle at the bandits. Oi, I recognize you. Those weirdos we tried to raid from the Verdon Valley. You killed my brother in that raid on that refugee camp with the weird boat. Boys get her, the bandit sergeant commanded. The six bandits all charged forward with their weapons drawn at Samantha's direction. With her carbine, she let out a burst from her gun and managed to down three of the men. Also firing alongside her was Vincent who with his SMG got the bandit sergeant and two more of the burning horse thugs. LT look out, Vincent warned. The last surviving adversary who screened himself with the bodies of his comrade managed to get close to melee range. Samantha reacted quickly by backstepping but it was too close to leave her unscathed. The bandit stabbed Samantha's left leg with his dagger. If it wasn't for Sam's quick reaction she would have been struck to the stomach. Still not immediately realizing the wound she shoved the barrel of her cabine at the head of the enemy and discharged a bullet instantly killing him. The lieutenant fell on the floor panting for breath as she processed what she has done in the scenario at hand. She turned her eyes to the sharp pain on her leg. Damn it. Ah. Samantha cursed. She clutched her left leg's wound with her hands and grind her teeth in a futile attempt to ease her pain. Miss Rose. Iris exclaimed. She ran towards the amber-haired lieutenant and knelt before her. Where's that fucking gel? Vincent asked. Lieutenant Rose. This is Crocker. I heard your mick give out gunshots. Respond. I what happened to you three? Are you all okay? Said Samantha's radio. 
It was the voice of Sergeant Crocker behind the device. Grabbing the portable radio from Samantha's chest rig, Vincent pressed the call button nervously and answered. This is Vincent. I mean Diaz. We got attacked by some of them burning horse bandits we all hate. Vincent answered still holding the call button. What the hell happened? Where's the LT? Asked Crocker concernedly. I am here. One of them stabbed me in the leg. Ah, where's that goddamn medical? Samantha yelled. Damn it. Patch her up. You got to get out of that place. Crocker barked. Vincent frantically probed the pockets of the lieutenant's chest rig for her medi gel. His hands clumsily glided over her body as he desperately tried to find the healing implements. Don't touch me like that. Samantha protested Vincent's handling of her body. Well where the fuck is the medi gel? Vincent shot back, right abdomen, middle pocket. Shit me. It stings. Samantha gnashed. Reaching for the designated area, Vince reached for the pocket and grabbed the medi gel. It was a refillable spray device created to block off bleeding quickly. It is a vital item of any 22nd century first aid kit and it nearly killed the bandage industry. First shaking the spray prudently before use, Vincent sprayed the medi gel at Samantha's wound as the lieutenant took deep but calm breaths. Can you get up LT? Crocker asked. Samantha, with the help of Iris picking her up limped her way to the door of the bank. Oi. I heard noises coming from the bank. This could be big lads. Said a voice behind the door. No, that's principality guards. Iris said. Shit the heat is coming down on us Sam. Vincent added. Samantha panicked over the thought of captured by hostile natives. She was feared that due to the fact she was a woman, she would be treated much worse if she was captured. Horror stories of rape, torture and humiliation circled her mind. We can't get caught here. Right here and right now. We need to buy us some time to get out here. We need a dot distraction. Samantha said. A distraction. I think I got it. Learned this in prison breakout movies. Vincent eagerly jumped. He turned to the abandoned burning horse bandit's chest and pulled the heavy chest to the door. He opened the chest and brought out the sacks of gold housed inside. Whilst opening the sacks, Vincent opened the door where a crowd of curious onlookers stared at the strange man carrying sacks of gold from the financial institution. The bank has declared a massive refund on all accounts and those who have yet to open one. Here is some free money. Vincent yelled. He threw a handful of gold coins to the bystanders. The crowd rioted over the money being freely given away by the mysterious stranger as people fought amongst themselves to catch as much currency that their hands and pockets can hold. He repeatedly threw more coins at the populace which has caused a group of principality guards to trip over and even try to loot some of the ducats themselves. Okay. We got time. Now what? Vincent asked, turning to Samantha, who was being attended by Iris. The vampire witch felt adrenaline once again flow inside her as she began to initiate her instincts. She turned her eyes to her dwarf and friend Luya. Luya, remember the times I have helped you acquire so many exotic goods when you overextended yourself in the deals you made with your clients? You told me back that I would return the favor to you one day. Iris asked the dwarf merchant. Luya emerged from his hiding spot from under a table that he his child-sized stature can easily make use of as a place of concealment. The dwarf's expression was in utter surprised by the honeyed words coming from his vampire friend. Yes, you want to pull that right now? Luya asked. I need you. To help me. And my friends find a place to hide from the guards. Iris said. Friends? I thought they are your body. Just do it. Iris yelled. Of course, follow me. I can take you three to my inn. The dwarf adamantly spoke as he stood up and gestured them to follow him. This is Vincent of Strider Group. Iris and a dwarf is leading us to a safe place. Vincent radioed. Say again, the dwarf. Crocker answered. This is Castle Lord. I got the sitrep from the second in command. How is Strider lead? Said Colonel Polonsky using his code name. Blocked the bleeding sir with some gel. Sam should be okay. Vincent answered. He picked up Samantha and placed the weight of her body over by his back and sheathed his SMG by its bandolier. Affirmative. 
and may I remind you private that you must refer to your fellow soldiers by addressing their rank then last name, said Polonsky. Yes, yes sorry. Vincent grudgingly apologized. He was not the type of person who does formalities. Good. Castle Lord out. Polonsky signed off. Dash one grueling saddleback carry later. Dash. Ah. Fuck my back. Vincent complained as he twisted and turned on the sofa that he rested on. He had to carry his CO through tight and dark corridors of the city whilst avoiding the eyes of the city's law enforcement. He had tripped several times due to the unmaneuverability of the alleys of Tyrian. For him, it was like carrying a block of concrete blind while angry German shepherds were chasing him whilst running around for days. However, in reality, he had only been carrying Samantha for about 200 meters as they all didn't have to go too far from the bank to their hiding place. The drunken bastard inn which was situated not too far away from the city square was owned by Iris Dwarf friend Lulia Amirian. Not only was the pint-sized businessman being his holdings in the mercantile aspects of the business world of Tyrian but he also has invested in real estate such as the inn that Lieutenant Rose. Private Vincent and Iris are currently hiding on. The rich dwarf was kind enough to give the biggest room in the inn for one night free of charge for Iris due to the bed being both the largest and softest provided in the establishment. Samantha indulged herself inside the luxurious bed drifting to a limbo state of sleep and situational awareness. She feels so vulnerable in this state. She prayed that the city guard won't try to search the inn for the perpetrators of the dead burning horse bandits in the bank earlier that day. She has hoped that the beacon that she quietly activated will guide Crocker and the rest of the squad to their location. Iris, as a friend and as someone who has provided you with a means of income. What in the gods name are these? People? They don't look like any human nations I know. They don't even have a slay Asian accent. Well they are definitely not some of those black knights of Herring Point I heard about, Lulia asked Iris. As your friend too, you have to listen to every word I am about to say. Everything I will say to you after I finish this sentence is true. Iris emphasized. The vampire began to discuss to Lulia what had happened to her from the past days. She started with about how her normal day back in her old home where she was just minding her own business when suddenly she was attacked by the strange looking soldiers. She managed to fight them off for a while but she was captured. She was taken to their ship where a kind young woman named Hana introduced her to the UFE. Humans. She. Alongside Ken showed her so many wonderful things about their world and in exchange for her stolen necklace that the UFE managed to obtain, she will become their guide to the world. She found out whilst during her absence her house was burnt down by the burning horse bandits due to not being there to protect it and she has vowed vengeance from that point on that their leader, Divika will die a slow and painful death. So, they have your necklace? And you agreed to be their guide? I am surprised. These. New humans are strange indeed, commented Lulia. Strange is an understatement. They got flying boats. Iris added, no way, like the steamships I had back in the mountain provinces? Lulia asked, yes, but bigger, and can house thousands of people inside it. Iris said, Lulia backed away from Iris with his mouth agape. His thoughts, just like what Iris experienced beforehand couldn't fully grasp the words and concepts that he has heard. He dreadfully stared at both Samantha and Vincent who lay with the penal soldier staring back at him. You look like you saw a ghost. Vincent commented. Are they indeed true? What Iris saw. Are there more of you by the Verdon Valley Forest? How long were you there? Lulia asked taking a moment to pause between each sentence. Yes and we were around about a week, probably the craziest week of my, Sam's, maybe the Cockney, Ken and Abed's life. First, there was the Burning Horse Bandits who we fought off. Wait, you fought the Burning Horse Bandits? Lulia interrupted. Yeah, killed a giant fire golem thingy that one of them summoned where we got Tyrus necklace from but we didn't know what it exactly. It was back then, Vincent explained. How many tried to attack your camp? Lulia asked. From the body counts, about 150 give or take. Plus that summon a guy and his pet, Vincent answered. I can't believe what I am about to say this, but you're a hero like the days of old. 
Leah happily exclaimed. He walked up to Vincent and merrily shook his hands in euphoric gratitude. Ah, thank you, rich small person. Is that a good thing? Vincent asked in confusion. As Iris has explained, the burning horse bandits are a plague upon our land. No one is brave enough to fight them. They got gold, goons, and guts to back themselves up. I heard they even blackmailed much of the Tyrian nobility to look the other way. But you, you fought back and shattered the illusion of their so-called untouchability, said Luya. Intrigued, Vincent leaned closer to the dwarf Samantha, who woke herself up to be able to hear what the dwarf merchant was telling. You could have a shot in hundred eons to take that bastard down. I am damn sure that if you do the entire principality a favor by taking down Divigo and the burning horses, your people can be on the good side of everyone," Luya said. How come? Samantha asked. Well Samantha did tell me your leaders are trying to understand what is happening and in my experience as a businessman, the first impression is the best impression which I am very sorry to say you didn't have because of them am I correct on this? Luya asked. Indeed. Samantha answered, Well, I am a very well-connected man with a huge grudge against them, and anybody who isn't one of the burning horse bandits will gladly want to see them gone. If you can get inside Davico's compound and destroy all the blackmail material he has on everyone, he will be powerless to defend himself. The principality will be thankful and you can have the peaceful first impressions your leaders had always wanted with an audience with Prince Clovich and to sweeten the deal. There's a 30,000 ducat bounty on Divico's arrest that no one was able to claim yet. Wait, I am getting ahead of myself. It's going to be heavily defended, Luder said. He tapped his chin in a second thought when he realized he didn't think this through with what his plan was. Well, I can call Polonsky to send some men over to take him down. We two have an axe to grind with them, Samantha rebutted. Well, in that case. I can easily bribe the gate guards to look away while your soldiers get in red-haired. The merchant smiled. He snapped his fingers in delight in excited anticipation from the freedom from the menacing bandits who ransacked the principality for decades. I am going to think that you and Governor White are going to be the best of friends. Samantha smiled. A knock on the door interrupted them as a familiar voice spoke. Lieutenant, are you in there? said the voice of Louis Crocker. Yes come in, Samantha replied. Iris walked towards the door and pulled it open letting Crocker, Abedaya, and Ken into the room. It's good to see you. How's is your magic bird thing working on? Iris said to Ken. Thanks, the survey was uneventful but I got all the data I need, Ken replied. Lewis walked up to Samantha's bed and knelt on her side whilst resting his weight on the butt of his LMG. You can still walk, right? How's the leg? Crocker asked. I can walk slowly by tomorrow at best. But I don't think I can go in a firefight for a few days. I'll just be stuck being the field leader for the time being. By the way, Sarge, Abed, Mudwin, meet Luther, Samantha said pointing at the pint-sized man next to the three new guests of the room. Where are you? A dwarf, Abedaya asked dumbfounded at what he is seeing. The name is Luther Amirian. Tyrion's most famous businessman and a proud member of the Dwarfen race. I and your friends were discussing a way to help you meet up with the prince who I believe your leaders would love to meet. And don't worry, Iris gave me all the details, Luther said. Well, how? Huh? Crocker asked. You will need to do something for him first to grab his attention. The prince rarely leaves his castle unless he has a good reason to. Taking out a mutual enemy could lure him out for talks. Luther cunningly explained his plan. Go on, I'm liking this. Crocker smiled. You know the burning horse bandits? I believe you have already met them. If you take them ooh, sign me up. In fact, sign everyone in the EO Dem up. We all want to give those buggers a taste of their own medicine. Crocker enthusiastically said. Count me in. Ken followed. For my family. Abidaya followed forth. I love your enthusiasm. Luther said as he ran to them and shaken the three happily. You can't fathom how everyone will be grateful when you do this, Luther said. Take my word for it. Especially you Cain. Iris winked. So, what happens now? What's the plan? Crocker asked Samantha. I am going to have to make some calls. We are going to need some big guns for this. Samantha smiled. 
Already her head had several brave men she has in mind that will gladly take up arms to avenge those that had fallen those days ago when they first arrived in Gleesia. Dash meanwhile back in the EODEM, Dash Governor Jeremy White and Colonel Polonsky stood in front of a court of their peers in the UFE government. They were just holograms but the virtual images excreted an aura of dismay and fury to the two as they had reported the news to their superiors about the attack on the ship earlier that week. So, not only were you were attacked in a supposedly empty planet with eight casualties, but you are also telling me that our initial probes on the planet were dead wrong? Asked UFE Colonial Bureau Chairwoman. Yes, Madam Chairwoman. Our new findings have come up with completely contradictory data from Mudwin's survey readings. Instead of empty planes, the drone found sprawling farmlands and hamlets that dotted the landing zone's land, all inhabited mind you. Reports from both the post-mortem of the dead hostiles who attacked us have us to believe that the natives who live here are and by every way, human. As for the attack. We were completely off guard because we all thought we are going to land in an uninhabited world but thanks to the efforts of Colonel Polonsky and his colonial militia they managed to fort them off. Credits to Lieutenant Rose for taking down a giant fire golem. If it wasn't for her, we would have all been dead. Governor White said. Human aliens? Am I hearing that correctly? The chairwoman asked. Yes. They are human, same physiology and shape and size. Their technology levels as observed by eyewitnesses are somewhere deemed in the late medieval to early renaissance technology judging by the clothes on their back and primitive weapons that they had wielded. Governor White answered, We have come to you chairwoman and members of the board to request additional resources from you. May I recommend extra firepower like new weapons and vehicles for my militia to work with? Suggested Colonel Polonsky. Due to several economic restrictions from our side Colonel I don't think we can deliver you new hardware but I can attach a marine division from a naval amphibious carrier to escort the second wave of colonists. The investors have been getting reluctant to invest in the Benham 3 expedition. News of the attack has spread like wildfire and debates back in New York are arguing about the ethics of interacting with primitive natives and the whole prime directive mumble the public hashtags in social media. The chairwoman said, Thank you, when we have additional data we will send it to you back in New York. This is Governor Jeremy White signing out. The governor said, The holograms disappeared leaving the two men in the holographic communications room alone. Governor White placed his hand on his forehead and sighed in relief. It was a scary predicament to go face to face with the judgmental bigwigs of the youth government and he barely got out of the holographic conference with them. Damn it, the second wave won't arrive until next month, Jeremy frustratingly said. Calm down Jerry. We are doing as best as we could and the past is past. We mourn the dead and now we must persevere. My squads are already roaming the planet for intel and I am just as confused on why the probe's data was off. Right now, as a governor we need these colonists to be doing something useful for everyone. We can't just sit here and wait a month doing nothing. Those greenhouse farms aren't going to build themselves. Polonsky said taking charge of the situation. You are right. I will start rolling out the glass panes and frames now. Jeremy said snapping back from his near nervous breakdown. Colonel, we got a call from Lieutenant Rose. She has got some good news about the city of Tyrian and about those burning horse bandits. Those people who attacked us, said a communications officer who barged inside the room. Finally, something good for a change. Give that radio to me, Polonsky said. He grabbed the radio, placed the stereo part of the device on his ear and listened to Samantha's call. After explaining to him their plans on meeting Prince Klovich and how they can strike back at the burning horse bandits, Polonsky had only one phrase to respond to the green red-headed lieutenant. I shall marshal the men. He responded before turning down the radio. Chapter 6, Operation Scorpion Sting Part 1 Bard music plays behind Strider Group as the squad, plus Iris dined into a meal. From what Luther can willingly give out for free was a fist-sized loaf of bread and a bowl of stew. From what Samantha can deduct with her tongue as she tasted her food was what tastes like a mediocre mix of mushrooms, onions, 
carrots and turnips if her mother has taught her anything. She has tasted better, much better. Even cheap diners back in the home worlds of the youth had better food than this. Well, it's medieval food for normal people. What did you expect? Gordon Ramsay, she said to herself. The squad were waiting for the requested reinforcements from Colonel Polonsky. He has promised men and equipment for Sam's proposed revenge operation against the Burning Horse Bandits. With promises of establishing a proper diplomatic opening with the newfound natives of Gleesia and some form of legitimacy at the fact that by technicality, the EO Dem is trespassing in Tyrian and the last that the governor, the colonel and the powers above them. Another bloodbath that the news feeds back home will tear apart. So in essence, the opportunity, if Ludera's reassurance backed by Iris commendations are to go by was something that can't be missed. So, you think our boys will go through? I heard they are packing some big guns like mounted M.G's and grenade launchers, asked Kayan. Luya is going to use some of his crazy rich dwarf influences to let them through, judging by his character. He is going out of his way to help us, Samantha said. Well, I don't blame him. The sooner these burning horsemen are gone the better for everyone. Iris said, Tyrion will sleep soundly knowing they will be no more. Samantha nodded as she grabbed her bowl with both of her hands and drank up the last vestiges of food from it. The drunken bastard inn was thriving with life as Samantha observed her surroundings. Most of the folks were merrily drinking their troubles away with mugs of beer and rows of dishes. Many of the establishment's patrons were men but she noticed a few women too. The attire of the Tyrian people was what looked like work attire suited to medieval technology such as bakers, huntsmen, some guards who have finished their patrols, milkmaids, and the occasional rich merchant. This is in contrast to the modern military uniforms and equipment that Strider Group wore hidden behind their cloaks not to attract attention among themselves. The patrons would take rowdily and may even challenge themselves to drinking games like sugar-rushed children. Her conclusion of her observations, the drunken bastard definitely earned its title. As Samantha continued to peer her surroundings she spotted at the entrance of the building, Ludera who was holding the inn's wooden door to cloaked men who were carrying large military-grade caches with them. Standing up, she can still feel the old scar of her recent injury from earlier the day when she was stabbed. Moving at a slow pace and careful not to trip over the bar patrons she made her way up to Ludera. Lieutenant Rose, I heard what happened to you. You're going to be okay? asked Sergeant Mendoza. Yes, it's just going to ache for a few days but I am still healthy. I am just going to have to be in the back for this op. So, what did you bring? asked Samantha. More ammo for you, a couple of MGL grenade launchers with E-rounds, an anti-material rifle, C4 explosives, two of our cruisers MGs plus yours that you asked for us to drive it here to you so that makes it three big brownies for the manpower. Other than me and my squad of seven I also got another militia squad of five and sixteen volunteers, answered Mendoza. Volunteers? Samantha asked. Most of them are family of the six people who were killed during the attack. Then there's further Rudy Bishop who is probably taking the whole eye for an eye and smite the heathens a bit too seriously. But who am I to judge a fellow Catholic? I can't even be chooser right now, Mendoza replied. You let civilians join you? Why? barked Samantha. Look lieutenant, these men had family that died during the attack and they can shoot straight. Governor White has stretched everyone else back in the colony to the near limit. We are all that can be spared at the moment. What is happening back there to begin with? Well I can say that Governor White is now constructing homes, farms and other town buildings for the colony just as planned. You have got to see the new greenhouse farming complexes, they are a wonder to look at when we are done with this shit. So what's the sitch on this Devico guy? Mendoza replied. Dash a moment later in the drunken bastard in cellar, Dash, Luna placed a large schematic map on the crate for all of the youth people to see. Now this is Devico's mansion which also is the headquarters of the burning horse bandits, said the dwarf. Several jeers echoed from the youth soldiers who gathered inside the cellar. It was a cramped up place filled with vintage wine caskets and beer barrels that the youth soldiers and volunteers were barely able to fit inside. Samantha, Mendoza, 
Iris and Lilia Air were standing closest to the map to plan out their attack. So here is the thing about this place. The mansion is surrounded by a market where the rich people of the city go to buy exotic goods. Divigo and I have been competing for the nobles for years, Lilia informed. How is that important? Samantha asked. He only bothers to relax his security during the day to allow the freedom of goods and customers in and out of his mansion. When it's night time he has got a whole army of thugs and bribed guards surrounding the mansion. Lulia said, but during the day there will be civilians involved. I don't want to get them caught in the crossfire. Mendozu is it not too late to get some night vision goggles from Polonsky? Asked Samantha. No. It's all being used for the security groups back at base for the construction. A night op isn't an option, it has to be day, Mendoza reluctantly said. Damn it, what about the volunteers? They aren't even soldiers to begin with. How can I be sure they won't get to trigger happy and accidentally shoot a Sif? Samantha complained. I'm actually an ex-SWAT officer so I know my trigger discipline, said one of the volunteers. He was an old and grizzled man whose body was rotund from years of disuse of physical exertion. I know a thing or two about restraint LT, said another volunteer who was young and wielded only with a pistol that looks like it was bought from a discount gun store. The Lord guides my shots and I will pray that only those deemed unworthy of his forgiveness will be smited by our guns, said further Rudy Bishop who raised his 12-gauge shotgun in the air. Don't worry about casualties. I have my fair share of battlefield trauma. No one of us or any Sif will die on my watch, said the confident youth combat lifesaver. Oera Paroterra cheered another youth soldier. Paroterra. Everyone in the room cheered. That's promising to hear from you. I hope that can be translated in the field tomorrow. Lulia please proceed, said Samantha. What a great battle cry. Oh yeah. You. So the mansion is three floors tall and the office where Devico is in the top floor, but it's guarded from top to bottom with all of his cronies as the second floor and a few parts of the first floor are also barracks for his men. He built his home like a makeshift fort to withstand any determined siege. I am talking about battlements on the roof, murder holes by the walls for ballist to and archer fire and an iron studded gate which is the only way inside the mansion, said Lulia. Wow. We really aren't welcome in there, commented Vincent. Of course, we aren't welcome in there, sneered Samantha. Any chances of a small insertion? I can easily slip inside and maybe make the siege a bit easier. Like I don't know open the big ass gate. Kill some of the archers to lay the heat off of you on the ground or something like that? Asked Vincent. None I am an afraid. Divico only opens his gates to monthly supply wagons to his own men or during business deals, Lulia said regrettably. I can cause a distraction, said Iris. The entire room turned their gaze at the pale woman who stood next to Cain. What do you mean? asked Mendoza. Well, I owe a lot of money to the burning horses. They burnt down my home and I want my revenge just as much as everyone in this room. I say, I will go to the front of the mansion and tell those whore essence that I will now pay up. They are bound to let me in when I showed them the large sack of ducats. I withdrew. Iris said. Her voice was menacing showing a steel determination that could send shivers down the spines of those who wrong her. But Iris, that's your entire life's savings. Lulia objected. I can always get more from you Lulia. What's 10,000 ducats compared to seeing the burning horseman go down? Iris argued. But you know Divico knows you are a vampire, right? He probably has a few hunter weapons and traps meant just for you. Lulia continued to object, as the dwarf said those words a stunned silence from all of the youth men in the room passed through as the soldiers' eyes stared at Iris in utter disbelief. Details of what happened to the Stider group were kept classified to avoid controversy from the colonists who will most likely protest that their new guidance translator is a malevolent creature of the night. The governor couldn't afford more problems so he was kept there. Wait. You are a vampire? Asked Trudy Bishop. He closed his fist and his body tensed up as he walked towards Iris and punched her knocking her to the ground. Begone spawn of Satan, roared Bishop. He landed two punches at Iris' face before his hands were bounded by the timely intervention of Samantha and Cain who stopped the pommeling. 
Calm down father, ordered Samantha. Did this demon hypnotize due to fall for to her whims? Roared Bishop. I'm not. Iris denied. The vampire slowly stood back and swiped away the dust she collected when she was grounded. Vile demon. I will never trust you. Bishop continued to roar. Then tell me how you can trust me? The vampire asked. Submit to the Lord Jesus and beg. He does not smite your evil body with his holy power. Bishop said. All right. If it means you will trust tell me more of this Lord Jesus. Iris calmly replied. She disciplined herself which was not normal when she is threatened by vampire hunters, burning horse bandits or anyone who would foolishly dare to cross her. A vampire wanting to learn more of Jesus. That's funny you know Iris. It's like. You the way how your fantasy world apparently works I assume. An orc going full Buddhist. Vincent said. What's a Buddhist? Iris asked. Pacifist. Vincent replied in only one word. The response was immediately understood by Iris. She sees that listening about Lord Jesus is something that no others of her kind have ever done. This Lord must be some sort of powerful king that the youth people follow if the Reverend Trudy Bishop whom he represents is true. Further Bishop, Iris, we can discuss this in our room upstairs later. I want this operation to go smoothly tomorrow and if I can't get either of you to cooperate then I will kick both of you out of the fight and make you stay here in the inn. Samantha mediated. Very well. Continue the plan. Bishop acknowledged. He turned round and stood back into the middle of the huddle mass of soldiers as Samantha returned to the map. With that aside, here is the plan. Vincent and Iris will get close and infiltrate the Divico mansion under the guise of her paying her overdue protection, Samantha said. That's where another problem comes in, since Divico knows Iris is a vampire. He will come in prepared. I am talking about crossbowmen equipped with blessed tip bolts. If they hit Iris she is could be hurt really bad or worse killed outright. And that's before the fact that everyone in the base will have their eyes on her if she makes a move. Ludera said. But they will all look at her. They won't be expecting any kind of serious backup, right? While Iris is distracted that can leave Vincent the opportunity to infiltrate the base. Samantha said. Just need to sneak through the gates and I can have the whole place to play in, right? I can do that. I have my ways. Vincent confidently boasted. Good. Now I have just plot something up for those blessed tipped crossbow men. Okay if those guys are sniping from a vantage point you will have to take them all down quietly. Samantha said. How many are we talking about? Vincent asked. They are very rare to be given to the hands of non-hunters. Their weapons and gear take time to craft. I guess maybe about four of them at most but how will you find them if they are hiding? Iris said. A deep sonar scan from my UAV drone can easily find them. Answered Kayan. Good we will need that. If they decided to aim their bows and shoot you down point blank as you step inside the place, Vincent throw a flashbang at them and you and Iris will take them down as they get caught in the flash. Samantha said. You have flash bombs? I am quite surprised you do commented Luna, but that will mean this operation will go loud real fast right? Crocker added as he raised his hand in questioning the plan. When that happens, we go to plan B. We storm the castle, bring out the HMGs and C4s and punch our way in. Be careful though of civilians. So, check your fire out there, Samantha said. You will have to grab Tavico fast. He will make a run if he sees any attempt on his life. You will also have to burn down his library filled with blackmail materials on every significant person in the principality. It will be in his office where he works. But you have to succeed in this, Ludera said before suddenly pausing. Yes, we do have to succeed, said Samantha. No, like really have to succeed, Ludera raised his voice. Is there something you're not telling us? Samantha questioned. I was going to tell you this now. Your plan. The way I see it will most likely get messy really fast. My influence can go so far. If Divico isn't in jail by the time the fires have cleared, everyone in this room including me will go to jail. The prince won't tolerate fruitless violence and I bet that Weasel Divico will wiggle his way to the prince one way or the other. He can be slimy rat. Ludera said. Oh great. 
This is ops gone critical. Crocker responded with sarcasm. Samantha absorbed the words of the dwarf to her heart and looked down on the floor absent-mindedly as she went deep into her mind. She is going to risk the lives of 35 people for a shot at peaceful living in this world. The weight of her decisions rest upon her now as the physical pain from her leg injury faded into obscurity being replaced by the ailment of the responsibilities of a leader must undertake for the sake of his commanded. She looked back up to her men who looked at her with weary and anxious eyes. If any one of you wish not to partake in this operation anymore, please raise your hand. Samantha asked in the vain attempt to lessen the burden of the souls she will carry into battle. We all lost someone when they attacked Ms. Rose. I ain't standing here and live the rest of my life that I won't avenge my daughter's death, said one of the volunteers. This is too good of an opportunity to strike back. I won't turn this down. A youth soldier said. Me too. I lost my home to them. Iris added. And I lost many business ventures to those bastards. Luther added too. Sam swallowed herself. It looks like nobody is going to chicken out of this revenge job that she will conduct. She will have to go into battle with all of her eggs in the basket and go all out or nothing. Very well, I will leave all of you to prepare. We will. We must. Win tomorrow, not only for ourselves but for the people of Tyrian so they will no longer suffer under the tyranny of the burning horses. Poroterra. Samantha saluted. Poroterra. Every one of the youth people cheered. As they steeled their determination, Samantha was still left in her own mind. She is about to conduct her first military operation for real with no safeties, no second chances, no grading with scolding remarks from her drill instructors. This was for real with real soldiers, real weapons and the real chance of death. She was now about to take the first big leap into the real world of military field command. And Samantha felt like she has been thrown into the deep end of the pool. Dash later that night in the room, Dash. Vincent spied at his target through the binoculars of Samantha. His eyes observed every nook and cranny of the mansion fortress that their room provided a convenient location to observe from. It was surrounded by market stalls that tomorrow will be filled with innocent civilians who will freely walk around causing a hazard. He may be a criminal but he would never go out of his way and hurt civilians unless absolutely necessary. He is a pragmatic criminal, not some dumb renter hood thug who shoots gangster style. He scanned the building and thought of ways of entry into the manor. He can easily climb the scale of a wall quickly with his RMB augmentations before anyone could notice or he can slip inside through by hacking down one of the thugs and steal their clothes as a disguise but that option is revolting if medieval hygiene has anything to say. How confident are you on getting in? Samantha asked walking towards the ex-criminal. Three out of five I can say. He answered. Better make that a five over five by tomorrow. If you don't get in we lose Iris. Samantha reminded. Your compelling charisma inspires me to great heights. Vincent slyly mocked. He carelessly passed the Sam's binoculars back to her as he grabbed another cigar from his pocket to smoke his stress away under the moonlight. Gleesia was surprisingly similar to Earth with a single moon and a single sun to light the two halves of day and night. The lieutenant turned around to the next person she will check and it was a B-Dyer who was reading a piece of paper while at his foot was the case where the Super Barrett anti-material rifle was kept. So. How's your new rifle going along soldier? Asked Samantha, as she smiled at the old man. Like crap. I never fired something this big before in my life. Those recoil dampeners Mendoza told me better do what he told me to. My Leo barely kicks. Or maybe it's because it was the only rifle I use and I am used to handling her. Abidia confessed. It's your rifle. Don't worry. I fired one before during basic training. You can count on my word. Samantha reassured the squad sniper. All right, but I just hope I got enough rounds for the fight. I got only 15 rounds and 3 cartridges, so those bullets better punch through those walls. Abidia said. Samantha walked back to the bed so she can sit down and relieve herself albeit temporarily from her stress. She shares the bed with Iris and Crocker which is large enough to accommodate the three of them barely. She only trusts Crocker. 
her second command to be sleeping near her and the vampire insisted that she sleeps on the bed because she doesn't want to sleep on the floor like a peasant, for a Abidaya and Cain. They were happy to sleep on the wooden floor with their sleeping bags while Vincent was content of sleeping on the room's provided sofa. She panned the view of her men in the room. It was all quiet with Vincent outside in the balcony smoking, Abidaya assembling the anti-material rifle. Crocker eating a snack bar, and Cain quietly sitting down on the floor reading a book to Iris so she can learn more about youth culture. Then a knock on the door disturbed the room. Clutching her pistol from its holster, Samantha carefully approached the door prepared for a fight. It's the father. Open up. The voice of further Rudy Bishop spoke from the other side of the door. Relieved, Samantha let go of her pistol grip and opened the door letting the bald four-eyed man of God into their room. I am here to give prayers before battle to you in anticipation of tomorrow. I have done the same to the rest of the soldiers already and you're the last. Also, I promised to talk to Iris, the father said, peacefully talk with Iris. She reminded him. Yes. For Jesus is a man of peace and love and who am I to say no to someone who would like to know about him? He said with a slight change in his accent to express his contempt to the vampire. Everyone in the group stopped what they were doing and gathered around in a circle. Samantha led Aris to sit by her side while further Bishop stood across from their side of the circle. Before I give you my prayers I believe we have new member in our congregation who would like to be introduced to our Lord Jesus Christ. Bishop said. He is here? Jesus is here? Iris asked. He is everywhere. In everything and everyone. Or at least from earth as the sayings goes but I believe his reach is beyond earth and he follows all of his chosen people to the stars. Bishop explained. So, he is not here? Iris asked again. He is in me and everyone. But the question for you. Is he inside you? Bishop asked Iris. You, no. Iris answered. Perhaps I said that wrong. Vampire. I mean child, who do you think Jesus Christ is based on what given information you have right now, asked Bishop, you, he is your king and your like, I don't know, someone who represent him, Iris answered poorly as he was nervous if she even responded the correctly, yes you are indeed correct, but I believe such a materialistic being as yourself do not understand what I really mean by king and I representing him, so, in a way, you are correct and at the same time wrong, Bishop replied. Iris was dumbfounded by the father's response. Being correct and wrong at the same time? She needs to know how that is even possible. You say I am both correct and not at once. This Jesus person, you call him in one of your cell phone gizmos and talk to him, right? Iris rephrased her answer. The father couldn't help but laugh softly at the response of the vampire. Even Abidaya and Vincent discreetly grinned a smile. Oh, no I do not call him via a cell phone or through Skype, I call him through prayer, Bishop said. Wait, Jesus is your God, God King? Iris asked as she pieced the puzzle of the Jesus equation together. Not God King, he is God and the King. You ask like you still believe in polytheism. Worship of many and most likely more specialized deities, we have a God King who is the God of the sun and day. His wife goddess of the moon and night, a farming god, water god, god of the dead, goddess of love, god of wine and more. Iris explained, I am not interested in your gods right now Miss Iris the vampire. What I am here for is are you interested in Jesus Christ? You are quite a curious one am I right? Bishop asked. Yes, if it means you will trust me. Introduce me to this Lord Jesus Christ. She asked. Very well. I will give you a brief summary, I shall state you the basis of our people's faith to you. If you know what I am going to say everyone, please join me in reciting. Or in this case for our new member hear the creed. Further Bishop said. Yes father, said everyone in the room in unison. All together now. The father called out. He took a deep breath and began to speak the gospel to Iris. Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible, begotten from the further before all ages. God from God. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of the same essence as the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. 
he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made human, he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again with glory, to judge the living and the dead, his kingdom will never end, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, he proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, he spoke through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead, and to life in the world to come, Amen. Bishop inhaled greatly for air as he finished professing the creed to Iris, for the vampire she was struck with great mystery as she heard every word in detail, a god in three forms, both father, son and spirit, came down and became a man, this god was unlike her world's pantheon, first in contrast to the gods she knows by name and hand, god is the god of everything, the next peculiarity was god becoming man, normally the Gleesian god pantheons, or the human ones she was familiar with normally just choose a person and bless them with power and might to fight whatever force that stands opposed to them, from the northern raiders, even cults trying to resurrect a fallen rebel god, the nomadic horseish horse riders from the south and even her own vampire kin. Your God Lord Jesus Christ is different something I have heard before, Iris said. She became perplexed by the proclamations from Bishop. Her face became limp as she stared at the Bishop with jaded eyes. Amen I say to you Iris. That means so be it. You now know who I believe, but tell me Iris. Arcado, Hag. You Myris, who or what do you believe in, asked Bishop. His words pierced Iris' heart which forced her to reflect onto herself. I, I don't know. I was never someone who seeks something higher than myself. I was always focused on survival. Being hunted and ostracized by nearly everyone you meet, the gods of this world hate me for being a vampire. Iris said. Bishop smiled after hearing what Iris has to say. His vocations and training has taught him that Christ will always see the best in people and will destroy those who would do harm to his flock. Iris looked harmless despite her fangs, snow white skin and penchant for blood. If Jesus truly thinks this creature was unworthy of salvation and is in fact demon as the bishop thought, she would have been dead already. It's quite ironic, I feel for you Iris. Many people I have met, seen and talked to are just like you hated, unloved and all. I am also quite surprised that even after I was dousing myself in my supply of holy water, wearing three different crucifixes and having a wooden stake on my back and you're not immediately vaporized speaks volumes. And is that your reflection? Bishop pointed. His finger was at the direction where a dressing mirror was placed. Yes. I can see my reflection. Is there something wrong? Iris asked. Vampire are not supposed to have one. Are you even a vampire? asked Bishop. Yes, these vampires, they are just myths right in your world. Something to keep children from being naughty or people from going out at night. What exactly do you define a vampire? asked Tyrus. Well, no reflections aside, you hate garlic, evil, likes to suck other people's blood and hates Jesus worst of all. Bishop said. I don't hate Jesus and I planted garlic on my old garden. You only got the blood part correct holy man. Iris said. So, what's the purpose of drinking blood? Well I have to drink blood to sustain myself. Food is an inferior substitute. Additionally, I use blood to fuel my spells. Iris answered. Curious you are very curious. Bishop clutched his chin with his thumbs observing Iris as she lay there for him to judge. Very well. I will trust you for now Iris, do not disappoint me, now everyone blessing before tomorrow, Bishop said, he raised his arms as everyone in the room nodded their heads down to receive the father's prayers, wanting to learn more of this Jesus, Iris too joined in the receiving of blessings, at first due to being the anathema of her world's gods she might receive the same fate as with the earthling's single god but as she laid bare for the earthling god to see, Iris could feel something she had never felt in all of her cold and dead life, 
she felt like she was being loved. Dash meanwhile in the other side of the planet in a magical land Dash elven dominated continent of Alphelnora is situated in the greatest concentration of mana crystals in the world of Gleesia. The elves were the first to utilize the crystals powers for their use in turning their lands into what most people could only describe as paradise. From their emerald plains, golden farms, technicolor flora and fauna, sprawling towers and the elegant artistry of their cities and towns. Alphelnora was the ideal homeland for the all-powerful elves. It is said in the holy texts that the elves associate with their pantheon of gods that they are blessed with a special connection with the world's mana crystals which provides them with greater arcane potentials and long lives of the life expectancy of around 1000 years. The legends also say that the elves are given the responsibility of the caretaking and advancement of the world so they were given this magical power to use as tools of leadership and guidance for not only them, but the rest of the planet of Gleesia. However, with such power in their hands, many grew ambitious with all of the magic in their fingertips. The first signs of political dissidents were kept inside the secure halls of the elven parliament. A large and influential group of elves consisting of princes, mages and several young, talented but hot-blooded generals believed that they must use the mana crystals to dominate the entire world and enthrall the lesser races to their whims. They call themselves the Black Tree Pact or popularly known by everyone else as the Dark Elves due to their uniforms and heraldry favoring dark colors like purple and black with complementary yellow highlighting depicting their Black Tree logos that they proudly bear. Their ideals were of the assimilation of all races to the elven way of life and to hoard all the crystals for themselves to be used for their own. By their own reasonings, the younger races are too immature, childish and ultimately too inept to wield the magical energies the mana crystals so they must be brought to heal by strict and authoritarian guidance from the elves. The other side of the coin however is the Ethylon Entont named after the capital of the elven continent Ethylon consisting of the elven royal family with their loyalists, merchants, philosophers, religious leaders and the old guard of the elven military. They believe in more soft-handed approaches for their responsibilities to the world such as mutual respect, formalities and diplomacy with the younger races. Their core beliefs are that although the younger races are still relatively new in terms of elven standards of life expectancy they must be treated with care from caring and benevolent parents which the elves will take the responsibility of doing. The disagreements between the two factions were verbal at first, then segregated discrimination between those who follow the ideologies of either group happened descended into an all-out elven civil war happened in Alphelnora. The battleground was split between the two factions where the pact was situated at the northwestern areas of the elven continent while the Entente was based by the southeastern side of the land. The war was fought for over five grueling years with massive loss of life, families being torn apart and material damage to the continent before a truce was signed. The pact and the Entente agreed that they will cease their active hostilities towards each other via a non-aggression and the establishment of a border that cuts diagonally separating the two. During the aftermath, the Entente focused on inwards economic restoration via establishing trade routes and diplomacy missions to the world outside their continent making the continent rich in ducats and imported goods. For the pact, however, they set sail to conquer the lands west of their homelands and subjugated several kingdoms and peoples from the west, exploiting the natural resources of the land and fielding levied soldiers from their subjugated. The Black Tree Pact became has fielded some of the largest tracts of exploitable land for themselves and fielded an impressive army of legions of beast folks, orcs and desert human puppet states with an economy to support its weight. Tensions have been quiet between the Entente and the Pact until the coming of Jeltigar's Comet. When the Comet last made a past, it was followed by the great political splitting of the Elven Continent and the subsequent civil war. The present passing has caused the elves to go in a frenzy over the comet's meaning. Both factions, from the jumble mess of interpretations and speculation, many of the elves believe that it is a good omen for the reunification of the continent. Each side ordered a massive militarization of the border garrisons, 
Yet both sides are too scared to make the first move of war as both the two factions fear mutually assured destruction between themselves and a repeat of the devastation that has ravaged their lands before during the Civil War. At the royal palace in the city of Eth Island, the seat of the current ruler, the financial genius King Aslanid or the Rainmaker, his beautiful Queen Elisvn, and their three children reside. The children consisting of Lunafria the eldest and the heir to the kingdom's throne who is a brilliant statesman, or elf woman, and was absolutely adored by the Entente elves for her beauty and grace. The middle child and only son is Valorian who is an upcoming soldier and general of the Entente's military, and the youngest is Aliathra who is a gifted mage in the arts of restoration and illusions, an excellent archer who won several tournaments and a beauty to match her elder sister and mother. Tensions were heightened due to the major military activity at the border as many important officials in the city rushed to enact plans, orders and early mobilization protocols. Aliathra, one of the royal children was called to her mother that day. Her blonde hair was combed downwards to flow like the waves of the oceans as she walked into her parents' bedchambers where her mother was sitting on her lofty chair overlooking a balcony. Mother, you call for me? Aliathra said kneeling before her maternal figure. My youngest daughter, you have heard about the comets passing and the border garrisons being mobilized? Queen Elisvn asked. Indeed mother, I am scared of what could come. I do not want to see our home being torn apart by war. Aliathra said. I know my child, but such is the way of the world of ours. Division and strife between different people is a reality and we elves are no different. For all of your life, your father shielded you from the dangers of the world. He gave you private tutors in the magical arts and in archery that you have excelled in. You were given everything you wanted in a silver platter, but I feel like we and the rest of Earth Island have spoiled you too much. That is why I have you sent to military school with your brother to learn many useful skills in case the worst happens such as you being attacked or even war with the Dark Elves. Elusivan spoke. She shed tears from her eyes as in all of her long living life she has seen her youngest child grow up to be a beautiful and talented woman with her whole life ahead of her. Aliathra. My youngest daughter. Now at the age of 210, I have a task for you, a real one of the utmost importance. I believe the ranger training that you acquired in military school will be useful for this task, Elusivan said. What do you require of me? Aliathra asked. I need you to go to the eastern continent of Sainagrad where the Stlaeagen Empire is. There was news that when the wizard conclave of Herring Point tried to see to the future of the world but they have gone dark. I want you to investigate what has happened and report to me. If necessary you must lend your support to the Empire's Adventurers Guild in case the worst happens, the Queen said. But doesn't the humans don't look well on ourselves? Aliathra questioned. These are uncertain times and we must reverse this uncertainty with knowledge. Despite our differences, the Empire is without any doubt our closest partner and ally even if it's more for their own conveniences. Expect to be journeying alone in Sainagrad however, but your survivalist training with the rangers should be pivotal. Her mother said, alone? No bodyguards or any kind of support? Aliathra asked. Her eyes were flustered with shock over the difficulty of her task. She was used to having help from the Royal Guard's protection or a few of the Entente's noble houses for support but to be sent alone with nothing but her wedding gear on her back is a surprise. Yes my daughter and it pays me to say that but our nation's resources are currently pulled to the defense of the border. Do not worry my daughter, the most of the common folks of the human nations are ignorant of our affairs so they are unlikely to notice you. This is a discreet task after all since you're unofficially there. Her mother answered. Aliathra stayed kneeling still as she heard those words from her mother. She has never left the city of Eth Island before and never knew anything about the human kingdoms and nations other than the occasional diplomats and merchants who speak stories about their lands filled with forests, brave knights and cities as large as the bases of mountains. Thanks to her ranger training, she can still easily navigate her way around a map and a compass when in a pinch but she has yet to put her ranger skills to practice. Her restoration magics and archery can be useful for when she has to blend in with the adventurer's guild whose headquarters is in Herring Point. 
the guild has been known not to discriminate their agents race and backgrounds despite the slay Asian empires foreign policy being leaned to a light shade of xenophobia and nationalistic rhetoric. As you say mother, I will gather my things and embark for the human lands. Aliathra affirmed, she stood up and bowed to her mother and left the room to prepare for her mission. For the youngest of the elven royal family, the elven pantheon of gods deemed her fate is to collide with the youth soldiers and stride a group which will cause a great change for her people, the youth humans and the entire elven race in Gleesia. Dash back in Tyrian on top of the luxury suite of the drunken bastard in the very next day, Dash snipers in position, said Samantha's radio. It was from one of the youth squads who set up a sniper's nest at the opposite side of the square overlooking Devico's mansion. Roger, engage all targets on my signal. Ground strike group. How is the situation down on the ground? Asked Samantha. She stood there the suite's balcony overlooking Devico's mansion building with her binoculars. Below her in a prone position was a B-Dyer who wields the mighty Super Barrett anti-material rifle. A click on the radio was heard as the voice of Sergeant Crocker spoke through it. All ready to go for us but it's gonna be a bit of a shit show for us. Lots of civvies at the market. And dear lord, those burning horse bastards are selling stolen grain at a premium, he said. Can't wait to bring these fuckers down. For those who have died, suffer by their hands. Us, Luya, Iris and the people of Tyrian, said Captain Mendoza. We will today, I assure everyone. Iris are you ready? Samantha checked on the vampire who was given a small earpiece radio that she can communicate with Samantha and Captain Mendoza. I, Yes I can hear you and I am ready, she said while breathing in and out from her lungs. Are you nervous Iris? Samantha asked. No. Yes. No. Yes. I am nervous. I am nervous. I mean this radio you gave me is creepy with all those voices in my head and everyone talking to me from far far away. Iris said. Oh, the horror movie staple is scared of a radio. I am so shocked that Clark's third law is in effect, said Vincent. Shut it thief. I need you take this seriously. Iris. Think about not just you but the whole principality. You are going to do everyone a whole favor by getting rid of these bandits and it will feel good when we succeed. Samantha reassured. If we succeed, Iris said reluctantly. We will. Divico will have no idea what's going to happen next. Diaz, can you find a way inside the place? Samantha asked. Yeah. I think I see an opening but I need Iris to distract them long enough for me going. You got the good Snow White? Vincent said. Iris looked at her coin purse. It was the last of her material wealth from her savings account from the back yesterday. She is risking poverty and even the possibility of being outdid as a vampire to the entire city. She will die alone and forgotten with their family's bloodline ending with her in a tragic note and a cautionary tale to all the hidden vampire bloodlines of how the once mighty Kadahagan house had fallen in a depressing tale of misfortune and death. Yet the rewards of this gamble with youth soldiers could mean the freedom that she has longed to have for herself. She has seen what the youth are capable of with their lightning-fast soldiers striking down all opposition the superior accommodations they provide for her in exchange for her service and even the comforting companionship of the pale-skinned Korean doctor and the Nigerian combat engineer with skin as black as midnight. Mustering her bravery, she placed her purse on her pocket and radioed Samantha. Let's do this, she said stoically. That's what I like to hear. All teams, commence Operation Scorpion Sting. Samantha ordered. Chapter 7 Operation Scorpion Sting Part 2 All teams, commence Operation Scorpion Sting Samantha ordered, move in Iris and stay calm Diaz got your back, Kane said He was overseeing Iris and Vincent through his flying drone that was looking down on the vicinity of Divico's mansion You got this Snow White, Vincent added The vampire, with the pocket of all of her remaining wallet of ducats Her entire life's savings nervously walked towards the HQ of the burning horse bandits. Using the hood to conceal her body from the crowds and the sun, she breezed unnoticeably from the crowds of people who were out that day for their daily business. Merchants sold luxury goods to buyers dressed who were in nobles apparel consisting of circuits, decorated belts, long socks, 
and hats in flamboyant shapes and colors. There were also artisans and the common folks who wore more down-to-earth clothes like dirty shirts, trousers, and less colorful dresses. As Cairn watched Iris and Vincent separately move closer to the target, the Nigerian couldn't help but feel concerned over the conditions he has to work with. So many innocent civilians are not going to expect such a loud and full frontal attack at this common place of gathering and he fears the tragic loss of human death for the Gleasons who live in Tyrian. I hope you will practice restraint with that M70 of yours, Cairn said to Crocker, pointing to his mounted light machine gun hanging upward from its underbarrel bipod. Oi! Don't worry! This spits lead truly, just shoot a few shots off and the sifs will be scrambling. Lewis replied in his thick cockney accent. You better, is that exosuit of yours even necessary? Asked Cairn again, my Mark IV Hercules armor, I saved lives and punched people with this, it's like already as how the Japanese would say an extension of your body. Crocker said, the grizzled Brit flexed his muscle at the Nigerian in a proud demonstration of his masculinity. Crocker was a well-built man who works out in an intense regimen of weights and ab workouts causing him to be a muscular 200-pound man at his height of 6 feet 2 inches. Compared to Kane he has a normal body neither too light nor too heavy a 5 feet 10 inches and 160 pounds. I am not talking about your suit Sarge as great and powerful as it is. I just feel sorry for the burning horse bandits, we good ballistics and futuristic equipment while our quarry barely has an understanding of projectile warfare, we are, by their standards could be comparable to godlike mages being sent to kill five year olds, Ken commented, the auto rifleman couldn't help but agree with Ken's logical reasonings, after all, these people have medieval era levels of technology, however, he and the other people of the colony are concerned of the magic that the people of Benham III possess and can wield. He has seen from the records and Cairn's own accounts about the capabilities of magic in the form of Iris who can conjure fireballs, electricity bolts, ice spikes and even look into other people's minds with just biting really passionately. Strike team move closer by 20 meters. Samantha radioed. Roger, remember boys and girls. Watch your fire and don't let these fuckers get any close to you, he replied. Wilco, said one of the accompanying soldiers. As the youth soldiers walked discreetly towards the mansion at the center of the market with their weapons and gear cloaked by their jackets to not attract attention from the primitive natives, Iris Kudahagan has made it to the from iron barded gates of Devico's mansion. She hailed the guard on top of the gate's tower drawing his attention. Who calls? asked the gate guard. Iris Kudahagan, the vampire replied. On what kind of business? The gate guard asked in a stumped tone. He was surprised to see that the vampire was, out of characteristically, appearing right at the front door of his boss home and headquarters. I am here to pay off my protection money. Iris hesitantly spoke with each word from her sentence being lowered in volume to a near faint whisper. She never imagined herself saying those words of defeat to the burning horse bandits less alone right in front of her most hated annoyance Divico. What is that again? The gate guard asked again. He leaned his ears from his elevated position down to the ground below. I am paying dot for dot protection. She said again brokenly with a mildly raised voice. Speak up you bitch. Cussed the guard. I am paying protection money. Iris angrily roared. Her superhuman lungs pierced through the heightened abode where the burning horse thug was. The gate guard recoiled in shock by the sudden shouting of the vampire that he nearly lost his footing and his armored hat. Okay lass, by the astral gods okay, I will let you in. Oigabut. Open the gate, the gate guard said. The barded gate slowly opened to Iris, its creaking noises unpleasantly scratched her sensitive ears as the portcullis that is seals the entrance slides slowly upwards to allow the vampire witch entry. With no turning back now and the hope of both help from the youth and the prospect of the dismantling of the burning horse organization, she walked inside the mansion's property.
The inner courtyard of the building is a blandly stoned floored clearing with dozens of crates and barrels littering the grounds. One of Divica's modus operandis is the obtaining of commodity goods or simply something people will pay hundreds of ducats to pay for like medicine and weapons. He would often sell these items at exorbitant rates way above the accepted market value. But the people of Tyrian couldn't do anything about it as the Burning Horse Bandit's legit front monopolizes most of the trade of Tyrian except for a few competitors like Luna Amirian who all are barely afloat from their own entrepreneurial wit alone. Normally this would invite an investigation team of the Principality's tax collectors, who would check on his hastily accumulated wealth and seek any accounting anomalies from his number books that all businesses keep to track their purchases and sales. Divico would counter the investigators through bribery, blackmails to key officials and occasionally if things get desperate, a disappearance for the leader of the Burning Horse Bandit's leader. He was on top of the world as he stood up from his office building and headed to the balcony that oversees his mansions in a courtyard. Well, well, if it isn't the pale witch of the woods herself Iris Kudahagan, Divico smugly declared. Enough of your tripe Divico. Iris raised her head and frowned at the bandit leader. Oh, still not getting over that accident your house? I am terribly sorry for the tragedy. Divico sarcastically apologized. Iris held back her anger as she gnashed her teeth and aimed daggers from her eyes to the haughty bandit leader above her. I worked hard at that house. I built it with my own two hands, she said fighting back her tears. Oh, calm down my lady. You wouldn't want to spook my guards with your witch powers, and don't make me laugh on your hard work. I know you are a bloody cheater on the whole magic business of yours with Luya a witch. Divico said mentioning Iris kept secret from the people of Tyrian. The vampire gripped her hands at the hearing of her dark secret that Divico toyed with her and wrapped his grimy hands around her like a string to a puppet. If word had gone out of her vampiric nature, hordes of inquisitors and hunters would hunt her down and kill her. She feels so vulnerable being in the mercy of the bandit lord. All she could do was stand idly at the middle of that courtyard while Divico watched below menacingly. Guards. It has seemed our guest is rather silent right now and I was having so much fun conversing with her. Please, motivate her. Divico ordered. Four men appeared out of the main door of Divico's mansion carrying crossbows. They ran towards Iris, surrounded her from all sides and aimed their weapons at point-blank range. The vampire noticed that the crossbows were equipped with the special blessed bolts that can critically injure and even kill a vampire in one shot. My sentry told me you have my long overdue protection money. Hand it over, Divico called. But it is my life's savings. Iris objected. Do I look like I care? Divico snapped back. The vampire witch sorrowfully reached to her pockets and grabbed her coin purse. She opened the bag and looked sadly at her money. She will be reduced to a lowly beggar when she hands over the last of her ducats to Divico. She was about to lose hope and hand over the purse when a voice spoke through her ear. Hey Snow White. I made it in. Spoke Vincent. Shit. You're in a pickle aren't ya? Okay listen to me carefully. I am going to count to three. A three I will throw a flash bang grenade at your position blinding them. Close your eyes so you won't get blinded. Then once they are down take the down the two tangos at your right. I will deal with your left. Ready? Vincent quietly explained. With renewed hope, Iris steeled herself clutching her hands and her money purse. The crossbowmen armed with the blessed bolts, placed their hands on the triggers as Divico continued to call out to the vampire. My money. Now. Divico exclaimed impatiently, if he doesn't get his protection money that instant he would have most likely pry that money from Iris' real dead hands. One, two. Vincent began to count down. Kill her. Divico shouted. Three. Vincent yelled as he threw the flashbang grenade at Iris' position. The vampire closed her eyes quickly just as the grenade exploded in a blinding light stunning and disorienting the crossbow bandits, with adrenaline fueling her rage. Iris unleashed her vampire claws from her hands and slashed the two bandits on her right with two quick left and right hooks killing them instantly on each hit. Vincent emerged from his hiding place of barrels and opened fire on Iris's left-sided holduppers with a burst of his UMP-45 taking them down before they could get a shot off. 
Iris, get to cover, he yelled as he grabbed the vampire and dragged her back. The two were under a hail of bolt and arrow fire as they dove into a barrel of crates. Vincent, you saved me. How did you get in? Iris happily thanked the ex-thief but was surprised by Vincent's ability of penetrating the mansion's security constructed features. A good thief never reveals his secrets. Vincent dodged the question. He never liked revealing his tricks of his trade due to his omitter. He peeked slowly from the corner of the crate to see where the missile fire was coming from. Catching a glimpse of their attackers he saw one man armed with a longbow aiming right at his position and his eyes met with his. Damn it. Vincent yelled as he recoiled back to the safety of his cover clutching his right eye in pain. Vincent. Iris yelled concernedly at the ex-thief. Letting go of his right eye. Vincent opened them and with what seemed like a stroke of sheer luck that the arrow missed him by an inch as he looked over the top and noticed that the arrow narrowly implanted itself a mere inch from where the end of the crate was. Fucking shit, Samantha we are going loud. Go loud. I need suppression fire over here. Vinknet yelled at the radio. Copy that. Strike team. Move in and take down the package. Samantha ordered. The youth soldiers and the brave volunteers uncloaked themselves and exposed their gear and weapons in broad daylight. The fantasy world people turned their heads at the strange warriors who revealed themselves in their alien armor. Some were stunned in astonished admiration while others frozen in fear over their intentions. Captain Mendoza stepped over a table and shot a burst from his assault rifle and waved wildly. Everyone get down. He screamed, with the group's intentions made clear by the civilians. The people of Tyrian ducked in cover and began to flee away from them. The resulting commotion caused chaos among the ranks of the market goers as they scrambled to get away. There was screaming, tripping, accidental bumping, and people praying for safety to their patron gods as the ground team made their way through the markets, striding past the screaming civilians. They were followed by the land cruisers armed with the intimidating and the old reliable Browning .50 caliber heavy machine gun. Contact, yelled Mendoza. He quickly gunned down a burning horse bandit who had pulled out his sword and tried to charge at him while he took point. Lay covering fire for Vincent and Iris. Roof, take them out, Samantha said intensely at her radio. I see him. I got a shooter on the roof of the two-story building front. Kane exclaimed as he fired his grenade launcher at the roof of Devico's mansion. The 40 by 46 millimeters he grenade exploded on impact as the ceramic tiles of the roof erupted causing the archers and ballistas to be launched flying from the great and awesome force of the explosion. Come on. Vincent yelled to Iris. He firmly gripped her shoulder and dragged her out of their cover and dashed to the gate tower's door a few feet away from them. He kicked open the door and swayed his UMP side to side to check for hostiles. Clear. He yelled as he sheathed his SMG and looked upwards to the spiral stairs leading to the opening mechanisms. Fuck. I hate stairs. All right Tyrus, stay behind me, he said. The vampire witch nodded and prepared her claws as the two made their way upwards. Meanwhile at the city streets below an intense magic, arrow and gun fight was taking place. After quickly dispatching the guards patrolling the ground, the ground strike team are now besieging the mansion itself. Volleys of missiles both magical and the physical flew across each other as the firefight was slowly but surely tipping over the youth's favor due to their superior weapons and explosive ordinances from Cairn's grenade launcher. Come at me, I will strike your heathen souls, yelled further Bishop as he let out a barrage of shotgun slugs at the building. Grenade, Cairn shouted. He turned around and fired his MGL at a window where several crossbowmen and mages were defending in. The great explosion that followed caused a huge hole of splintered wood and charred stone where the section of the mansion used to be. As soon as the ashes cleared from the explosion, the defenders from the house seemed to stop firing back as all became quiet from the city street level. Everything's clear outside. You got 30 seconds to open that gate. Horlass. Samantha radioed. After listening into Samantha's update, the two infiltrators continued to make their way up the stairs panting heavily from the exercise of their legs and lungs. As they were about to reach the end of the flight, the same gate guard who talked with Iris earlier ambushed them from the top of the stairs. Using his superior height advantage, 
he thrusted his spear towards Vincent. Thanks to his rapid movement booster augmentations he was able to weave sideways to dodge to spear's tip. Vince bended his legs while thrusting his hands to grapple the guard's thigh and arm and carried him over his shoulders before slamming him on the ground with a mighty throw. Dazed by the attack, the sentry barely had any time to recover his bearings before his chest was slashed open by Iris claws killing him. Nice job. Vincent complimented. You too. Iris gave her gratitude back. The two soon made it to the top of the stairs and opened the door to the gate mechanism room. It was filled with an amalgamation of machinery and steel chains that work in tandem together to make the heavy-duty gate of the mansion slide up to open and slide down to close. Seeing a winch that has large chains wrapped around it, the two jogged over to it and began to pull the winch up. The portcullis moved upwards as the youth soldiers looked on in pleased smiles. As Crocker looked on he noticed that from the hole that Cairn had earlier launched a grenade to, a large figure arose from the shadows. The figure barely was seeable with the naked eye before it dashed across the room towards the direction of the gate mechanism room. Lewis unleashed a burst of his LMG at the figure but he missed as the shape moved out of the way and disappeared. Guys you got to big fast move ahead into your direction. I can't get a shot off. Crocker radioed in. He turned around to see that the gate was now a quarter and a half open allowing people to freely walk inside. He rested his LMG by his abdomen as he walked towards the gate and taking a deep sigh of relief that the mission is so far going smoothly as expected by Samantha. Oh wah, Vincent radioed back before static followed. Vince. Iris yelled. She saw the ex-thief being thrown away from the winch as a giant ogre grabbed him and threw him across the room. Following him was Iris, who the ogre grabbed and did the exact same thing to the vampire launching her at the opposite end of the room near the same spot where Vincent landed. Igbert hates man filth who touch gay twilly. Igbert hates intruders like boss man Divico. The ogre said as he grabbed the winch mechanism and worked his strong hands to close the gate as quickly as the machinery can command. The portcullis began to rapidly slide downwards on top of Crocker. Sarge watch out above, yelled Samantha who could only watch and hold her breath, as Crocker turned his head upwards. Oh shit! Crocker exclaimed as he dropped his LMG to the floor and raised his hands upwards and grabbed the gate's frame. Channeling the power of his exosuit from his legs, he shoulder pressed the gate causing a great dust cloud to explode from the point of impact shocking the youth soldiers who were still behind him. Get in, get in, he ordered. Seeing that the exosuit cladded soldier has opened albeit moment to relieve the gate, the youth soldiers flooded through the gate whilst Crocker strongly held firm. Why dot wheelie, no go dot hallway? The ogre questioned to himself. The winch should have went all the way down but unseen force was stopping from fully being pushed down, angered, the brute pushed harder with all of his strength, the portcullis slowly began to lower down. Crocker had to bend his elbows downwards as the gate's stake tips slowly got closer to his face. Rag, Crocker roared as he struggled to keep the gate open. The brute fell on his knees as the gate's weight slowly began to overwhelm him. He can even feel the force of several arrows pierce his armor in vain but was stopped instantly before the arrow tips could touch the more delicate parts of his body. Meanwhile the onlookers from the citizenry of Tyrian looked curiously at the man who was holding the portcullis open, they were amazed to see both the man hold the gate open with his bare hands despite it but the ogre gatekeeper pushing it back down still persevering even after being shot several times by the burning horse thugs, and the sheer fact that he and the group of mysterious soldiers are standing up to the hated Divigo and his bandits. The crowd began to cheer for him behind his back. Go, you can do it, said one peasant. Don't let those bastards win, added a rich nobleman. Come on love, show me what you got, cheered a street crumpet lusciously. Hearing all the cheers behind him echoed deep inside Crocker. Listening to people telling him to persevere gave him the will to redouble his efforts and pushed back up the heavy gate with a mighty roar from his lungs. He lifted himself from his knees and mightily pushed the gate back upwards. The bystanders erupted in cheers as the brave strangely armored man stood back up. While stick but the ogre continued to push the winch down. Vincent managed to recover from his fall and get back up to his feet. Damn it, 
Some big guy is trying to close the gate. Vincent radioed. Crocker is barely keeping it open. Take him down. Samantha replied. Vince aimed his ump at the ogre and fired a barrage of full auto fire at the beast. All 25 bullets from his clip pierced the ogre's body but the giant humanoid was still breathing, albeit heavily from his wounds still trying to push the wind down. Shit he shrugged off a full clip. Vince anxiously radioed. Where is he? I think I can get a shot off. A bee dial radioed in from his vantage point. Lays it. Samantha urged, grabbing his laser designator from his pockets, turned the device on causing the small handheld electronic to burst to life with a brightly lit green laser came out from it. Hey ugly. Eat 50 cal bitch. Vincent delivered a pre-mortem one-liner at the ogre as he aimed the laser designator at Igbert's head, before the ogre could even react. His face exploded in a bloody pulp of brain matter and bone. The giant fell down dead as his limp arms let go of the winch. Big guy is dead. Nice shot a bed. Vincent radioed. Thanks for the spot. Abidaya answered back. Vincent turned round to Aris and helped her back up to her feet. After thanking him for the gentlemanly gesture, the two made their way back to the winch. Iris nonchalantly slid her fingers at the bloodied hole where the ogre's head used to be to catch some fresh blood off of the ogre. Waste not what not. Iris said as she licked off the blood from her fingers. Not bad. For an ogre. She added, yuck. If you're gonna do that more often, not in front of me okay? Vincent cringed. He promptly grabbed the winch and pulled it back up until the mechanism was now all the way open. Fully relieved from the heavy ton weight of the gate, Crocker turned around to the cheering crowd of Gleasons and curled his biceps. He to a whore. He yelled triumphantly in his married tongue. For that old soldier, he had achieved something he had always wanted to hear but never knew he would live to actually obtain. Praise and appreciation from people he could remember all the heartache of the political scene back in the youth worlds over various controversies from condemnations from vicious journalists to hateful insurgents. In that moment, those horrible war memories melted away as he lived the moment. People were throwing their cheers, loose currency and even a couple of women's undergarments at him. Meanwhile back above the gate tower. Iris and Vincent rested for a moment with a canteen of water. Iris merrily sipped the metal container as Vince watched her. You look pretty drinking water. Sweat falling from the brow. I got to say, damn girl. Vincent flirted. You know how to please a woman. But, I have someone in mind already. Iris replied. Oh, you going dating with someone? Hope the bastard doesn't freak out over your teeth. Vincent warned. Oh. It's someone from the colony and I have yet to tell him about it. Iris quietly said. Her voice faltered as she finished her previous sentence. Really? Who? Vincent was about to ask until he was interrupted by the beeping alert of his radio. Yume, Vincent, Iris. We got a magical problem here. Kane radioed in. What is it? Vincent asked. Take a look outside. Have Iris look into this. It's Yume. How do I? Kane said. His tone was of confused rambling as he stuttered to communicate his thoughts over to Vince. Ex-thief followed by the vampire witch, moved towards the window that overlooked the inner courtyard to investigate. When they edged themselves over to the window, they saw that all of the youth soldiers were gathered in front of the mansion's front door and were trying to break through it but a wall of rocks impeded their progress. Several of the soldiers were trying to use their small arms to chunk off the wall. Nothing is working. It's bulletproof, said one of the Land Cruiser's machine gun operators after he let out a mighty burst from his .50 caliber gun. Stand back. Explosive charge, yelled another youth soldier. He tossed a C4 at the wall and triggered detonation. After the resulting explosion, the soldiers noticed that their obstacle has begun to show several signs of damage by cracks in the rock's surface. That rock wall spell is just going to be regenerated. Iris commented. You know this magic? Vincent tasked. Yes. It's normally used for engineering purposes but clever mages can use it to block off pathways. Trust me. I have done it myself. Iris replied. Well that rock wall is going to let Devico get away. Samantha radioed into their conversation. Can you find a way to take it down Iris? 
You're the magic expert here? Samantha asked Iris. I know that rock wall is an earth spell so it should be weak to water and ice destruction magic. Iris answered. Well, go down there and see what you can do. I see if I can cut off Divico from his left flank. Try and buy you geese some time, Vincent said. Sounds like a plan. Make sure he doesn't get away, Samantha said. Turning down his communications, Vincent turned round and kicked open a door to proceed deep into the depths of the belly of the beast not before gesturing a thumbs up. A sign of good luck to Iris for the oof. The vampire smiled in amusement that she has gained the likings of the ex-thief due to their coordinated teamwork together. Flying down the stairs from earlier, Iris made herself back into the inner courtyards where the rest of the youth army are standing idly by over the rock wall. You can't even break through this door even if the blind and the lame are left to defend it. The voice of Divico spoke taunting the youth soldiers from his office room on the top floor. Nya, Nya, you're a bunch of losers, teased one of his henchmen. May God send you to the deepest pit of hell. Bishop fired back. He waved his shotgun at them and cursing them to high heavens over the despicable sorceries that impeded his and the youth's crusade against the burning horse. As the exchange of profanities continued, Iris touched her chin with her finger in deep thought. As she observed the rock wall, she noticed that the mages conjuring it have made it unusually strong in structural integrity. It would take a great amount of magical energy expenditures from her to make a dent in that. If only she had a magic wand or staff to amplify her power. She can't do much with her bare hands and will alone without dangerously pushing herself to exhaustion that not even her vampiric physiology can hope to survive off without adequate care. Stand clear, shooting a he, Ken declared. He wielded his MGL and aimed at the obstructed door and fired his grenade launcher. At first, Iris could hear the device give out a moderately audible duck sound from Ken's weapon before a loud thunderous roar from the 40mm grenade round impacted and exploded center mass on the rock wall's surface. The dust clouds cleared that the infractions at the rock wall has now become more visibly larger to the naked eye and showed signs of collapse. But before the soldiers can celebrate and fire another explosive ordinance at the rock wall a loud voice echoed from within the mansion. Fire. The voice spoke. The rock wall quickly broke formation and was now a loose collection of flying rocks that were the size of a man's head. The floating pieces of earth began to fly forward at the direction of the youth soldiers. Men ducked in cover as the courtyard became an obstacle course of debris and broken crates as everyone tried to protect themselves from the enlarged projectiles. Iris dived a pile of barrels as she hid from the oncoming fire. She slightly peeked sideways to see the ongoing chaos. She saw that most of the youth soldiers had crawled to safety behind similar cover or at the back of the land cruisers. As her eyes scanned the horizon she noticed that there was a familiar black-faced soldier who lay on the ground shaking his head with a stunned face. Cain. Iris shouted. She dashed out of her cover using her vampiric reflexes and agility to dodge the flying rocks. She made her way to the private first class and cradled him to her arms. He was still gripping his grenade launcher in his hands. She instinctively looked around for imminent signs of danger and saw a dozen rocks flying towards her. With magic conjuring from her hands, Iris created a rock wall of her own that shielded Ken and her from the debris. She clutched the head of the Nigerian with arms as she hears the thudding sounds of the rocks impact her rock wall. Dust clouds of dust percussions from behind her fell down to taint her raven hair. When the noise stopped, Iris peeked over again from her cover to see that the rocks that were previously thrown around like dodgeballs at the youth were now returning back to their point of origin which was the mansion's entrance door. The rocks quickly reformed the wall's structure to its original unblemished state. God fucking damn you, Crocker explained as he saw the rock wall repair itself. After all that firepower expended, they were back to square one. Man down, yelled a youth combat lifesaver. He rushed towards Iris and Ken alongside Father Bishop. Ken my son, what did those heathens do to you? Bishop asked. Iris looked at the engineer's face and noticed his eyes were closed. His face sweating and his breathing was heavy. He is a concussion. I saw him get grazed by a rock before falling down. Thank God for Kevlar helmets. 
the combat lifesaver said. Will he be okay? Asked Iris concernedly. Yes, but he is effectively knocked out of the fight for a while. The medic said. Damn you wicked sorceries. I will smite thee. Bishop frowned. He raised his fist and directed it to the mansion. Keep quiet. You're going to make it worse for Mudwin. The medic protested. He pushed the father's head down to their cover and quieted his angered shouts. I have to say, I think I misjudged you a bit Iris. You did save him. But you need to do more to trust me. Bishop complimented. Thank you. I never I would say that to a holy man before. Iris said. Her eyes then darted to the grenade launcher that Ken was holding on his hand. It was laid aside of him on the ground whilst the medic was attending him. That's a pretty strangely shaped staff you have there. Not anything like your guns. She said curiously. It's an MGL grenade launcher. It fires high explosive grenade rounds. You saw it right? Pretty impressive right? Bishop said. Yes, so it's a weapon, right? Like your guns? Iris asked. Indeed. It just shoots what I said, grenades rather than smaller bullets. But why are you asking me right now? We are in a fight and we are losing. Bishop blasted. Does it still have those ammo things inside it? Iris asked. Bishop crawled towards Ken's MGL carefully retrieving it without disturbing the medic's work with the engineer. He flipped over the revolver-like ammo storage of the gun and counted the holes over the filled ones. It has three rounds left not including the rest from Kane. Bishop answered. Give it to me. Iris said. What? Bishop asked, dumbfounded of what he just heard. Did the vampire who is also a primitive native of the planet asked him? to give one of the youth's weapons to her. Give it to me. I have a plan, she said. What's your plan? Bishop asked again, still reluctant to relinquish the weapon. This plan, Iris exclaimed. Her hands conjured in blue energy that felt cold to the touch. She reached over the MGL and gripped the weapon with her bare hands. When the cold steel of the grenade launcher met with Iris' hands, the magical energies from her transferred to the gun encasing it in a blue ethereal aura enchanting it with her magics. Bishop could feel the weapon give out a cool breeze of ice from the device astonishing him. His utter amazement caused him to loosen his grip letting Iris get a hold of it as he tries to comprehend what he just saw happened right in front of his eyes. After retrieving the MGL and enchanting it with ice magic, she aimed the weapon at the rock wall and pulled the trigger. The 40mm grenade round shot forward which left a white trail of sparkling ice particles from its point of launch. It made contact with the rock wall causing it to explode in a great powerful blizzard. The ice fully encased the rocks in frozen ice. Smiled at her theoretical plan worked she turned to the youth soldiers. What are you waiting for? Shoot it now. It will chip away the ice. She cried. Open fire. Crocker ordered as he aimed his LMG and fired a hail of bullets at the now frozen rock wall. With the combined firepower from the small arms of the youth soldiers and the 3.50 caliber Brownings, they managed to chip away the ice in case truck wall away opening the path forward. Move in. Go, go, go. Mendoza yelled. The youth soldiers stormed inside the building locked, cocked and ready to rock. They began to shoot down all of the burning horse bandits who were trying to fight back after their defenses failed but to no avail. How did, how, huh? Iris? What the fuck did you do and why is that MGL colored blue and sparkly? Crocker inquired. Well. One of the things I can do is enchant weapons. I know for a fact that your guns are weapons so I theorized that, let's say if I enchant this big thunder wand with ice enchantments, it will shoot out and explode in a mighty ice storm of magic. I guess my theory is indeed correct. Iris said. She turned around to the door where it was reduced to a large and aesthetically ugly hole in the mansion's otherwise pristine exterior and that is when not accounting for the eroded earth ash marks and slowly melting ice from the previous explosion and bullet storm. I am not mad. That's actually pretty fucking amazing. Crocker smiled. He moved his arms forward in a fist which caught Iris by surprise. She recoiled and stepped back. Are you trying to punch me? Iris asked. Oh no, sorry, it's called a fist bump. It's a show of respect to people. Come on. Curl your hands and fist my fist now. Crocker explained. Iris followed the brute's instructions and returned the fist bump to him. 
A surge of happiness emerged from her mood as she felt euphoric over it. Like that? Respect? Iris asked. Yeah just like that. Hey where is Diaz? Asked Crocker. We split up. He is going to cut off Divico from running away. She answered. Alone? Fuck. We need to box that bastard now. Let's go. Bishop you're with us. Crocker said. And can I have more of those grenade ammo? Iris added. The father nodded and knelt over to the incapacitated Ken and retrieved his pouch of 40mm grenade rounds. Quickly picking up his shotgun he dashed back to Crocker. Lead the way my son. Smite the unbelievers. He declared. Our fucking men. Crocker affirmed as he reloaded his LMG with a fresh belt of ammo and cocking it. The three break their way through the enforced opening and began to storm the mansion with Crocker leading the way. Iris would constantly enchant and disenchant the grenade launcher to be able to fire a variety of magically enhanced grenades from poison clouds that cause the defenders to collapse in their own vomit. Electric shock which paralyzes any charging thugs dead in their tracks and an ice bomb which turns the burning horsemen into human popsicles. She did have to take care of not giving the bandits a taste of their own medicine however because she is indoors and when she suggested a firebomb to Crocker, Lewis replied, Fuck no, you wanna burn this lot to the ground. While we were inside it, the Brit protested after he delivered an exosuit enhanced straight punch to a hapless bandit who managed to get too close to him. The three continued up the multi-storied mansion. Iris became more familiar in the handling of the MGL. Unlike most medieval weapons from Gleesia such as the mundane swords and daggers to the magical staffs and wands, the MGL was heavier than she was normally used to when it comes to them. The scope that was railed on top of the launcher helped her aim and get used to how the weapon quirks and behavior. Her hands became used to the slight recoil that the launcher does after she triggers the firing mechanism. Additionally, at first when she had run out of ammo, she struggled find a way to reload the device. Thankfully Crocker was there to show her how to open the launcher's ammo storage and showed her how to place the 40mm grenades inside properly. After fighting their way up to Vico's mansion, the three made their way up the stairs into the top floor where Devico's office is, but before that, they need to breach the hallway first. Clear, Crocker said as he kicked open the door and swiftly moved inside. He strafed the room and swayed his LMG in all directions to search for hostiles but all he found were the corpses of burning horsemen who died of bullet wounds. Took you slow pokes long enough. Diaz's voice echoed. He emerged from the shadows casually drinking from a bottle of decanted wine. Are you drinking in the middle of a mission? Crocker growled. I got bored. Dealt with these fucks a few minutes ago. They got like an entire cellar at the door behind me. When this shit's over let's celebrate with some of this stuff. I can tell if my old boss taught me anything of Somalia no shit. He said placing the wine bottle at a nearby table. If we get a reason to celebrate, have you seen Divico? Crocker asked. Yes indeed, he is holed up by his office by the shiny gate at the end of the hallway. Haven't seen anyone come in or leave. Bet he is shitting himself right now. I mean, ice grenade? Iris that's genius. Vincent laughed. Iris blushed over that comment from the ex-thief over her plan with the MGL. She honestly didn't know if enchanting would work with the youth's guns to begin with. It was a wild gamble that paid off well. Good on you my son. Shall we end this crusade once and for all? Bishop asked. The regroup youth soldiers walked together in unison down the hallway ready for the final confrontation with the feared bandit Lord of Tyrian. LT, we are reaching the objective. Can you see what's our opposition? Asked Crocker. I hear you Sarge. I count seven tangos and the target himself. Be advised the target is ducking behind the cover of his desk. A bed is going to provide fire support over. Samantha radioed. Told you he is shitting himself. Vincent commented. The four now arrived by the vicinity of the large door. It was intricately designed with various mythical figures from pictures of what looked like unicorns, eagles, dragons and a several nude women. In the count of three we win. Ah, Crocker was about to tell his orders when he felt a great ejection of electricity zapped him as he touched the door handle. He fell down on the floor gripping his hand injured hand with Bishop catching him to ease his fall. 
What sorcery is this? Bishop asked in shock, the door, it must be under the effects of soul binding. Iris reasoned. What the hell is that supposed to be? Crocker asked, getting back up to his feet with the help of Bishop. Soul binding was originally used by nobles to protect family heirlooms and valuables. The enchantment works by linking the soul of the owner with the item so only he may be the only person to hold it. If someone other than the owner was touch the said item, it will deliver a shock that dissuades any thief from trying again. Iris explained. So, like some sort of biometric scanner? If you're the person by blood, DNA and fingerprints. Or in your case, so, you can touch it, but anyone else will get electrocuted? Asked Samantha. Indeed, most likely the door is linked with Devika himself. Iris replied but that door is the only way in. Vincent said, shit, we need to get Devico and his blackmail material or all our work here is for nothing. Crocker protested in frustration. Soon the three men who accompanied her began to argue. They yelled over what to do now and plan B's whilst Tyrus was left alone with the MGL at her hand. Looking at the ammo cartridge of the launcher, she can see she now has only one 40mm round left. She looked again at the large door that guarded Devico's office. It was made of reinforced steel from what looked like dwarven casting. She recalled her old notes about metal and came up with an idea, albeit a very crazy one. With her mind and mana energies working in tandem together, her hands conjured the red and heated energies of a raging volcano. She then transferred that knowledge of the magic into the launcher enchanting it with fire magic. Samantha. Tell a bee diet to get ready to fire. I am going in. Iris radioed. Really? Okay, you better know what you're doing. Samantha answered. Aiming her launcher at the door, she took a deep breath. As she put all her faith at the might of her new weapon the MGL, she squeezed the trigger and the grenade round that fired flew out with a fiery trail as hot as a dragon's breath. When the grenade impacted the reinforced door, a powerful explosion that melted the hinges of the door and sent it flying across Devico's office. The fire also incinerated two men who were standing beside the door. The last of the burning horsemen steeled themselves but the resultant smoke cloud impeded their vision. With an opening cleared, Iris set aside the grenade launcher and raised her claws. She dashed towards the door followed by Crocker, Bishop, and Vincent, the vampire. Using her superhuman eyes she spotted a blinded hostile and cut him down with her claws. Her male companions also took their share of the kills with Bishop, Vincent and the sharpshooting support of a bee dyer from across the street with his anti-material rifle whilst Crocker took the last two down with his LMG. Clear, Crocker declared. Vincent walked towards the desk and grabbed Avico by the neck. He was shorter than the thief by a few inches but weighed more than him. He raised the man as high as he could with his arm, slightly choking the now defenseless bandit lord. This him? Vincent asked. Yes, it is. Keep him there. I will get rid of, of the blackmail material. Iris said. She walked towards the shelves of books of Divico's office and began to search it for his files. Please, I can give you 5,000 ducats if you let me go. Divico pleaded. Shut up. Vincent yelled. He sadistically slammed down Divico's head onto the leg of his desk before following a swift front kick slightly fracturing his skull. You can't bribe another criminal friend, he talked back. Iris, see that dirt material? That's slang for blackmail mind you, he said. The vampire witch began to scour the library shelves moving past books as fast as she could. She was helped with Bishop who helped her pull out the books from the upper shelves which she couldn't reach. For each book she grabbed she would quickly flip through it in a brisk pace to see if the content was the gossip and damning evidence that Divico collected about the powerful elites of Tyrion that had kept him untouchable throughout the years. As she searched frantically for the book, Deviac turned his eyes towards the vampire. You will never find my book which, ha ha. The bandit lord scoffed. Vincent was about to give another sadistic punch to Divico. The bandit lord pulled out a knife and tried to swipe the blade to him. His captor managed to quickly dodge the knife's edge by merely a centimeter. The ex-thief grabbed the man's hand, twisted the arm to disarm him to get the knife for himself then pushed the arm inwards. He slammed the man's knife on the palm of his hand pinning it to the table. 
Divico let out a shrill scream that could be heard from outside his mansion. Damn, you scream like a little bitch. Vincent spats. Where is it? He asked again, in the safe. But you will never crack it by the time the city guards arrive and arrest you all. That the lock is made out of the thickest scander, whilst Devico boasted about the security of his safe. Sergeant Crocker walked to the safe that was behind his desk and in one great he from his exosuit, he ripped the safe's door. Danite Devica finished his sentence as he looked dumbfounded at the breach of his most secured asset. Crocker reached into the safe and in a few moments, he managed to grab an untitled grey and red coloured book. Hey Iris. Think this it? Crocker asked. He tossed the book to the vampire who began to quickly read through it. Yes, this it. Iris smiled. By the gods, he has blackmail on virtually everyone. The captain, the prince, the princess, the chief tax collector, the judges, Luna Arand. Here it is, me. Iris continued. She ripped several pages from the book which has contained all the compromising information about her. After she has grabbed the pages, she conjured her hands to catch on fire, burning the papers to ash. Divico's face dropped into despair as he was finally defeated. He nodded his head down in shame as the bandit lord and his entire organization was obliterated in just one morning. Yeah that's right sucks to be you. Vincent teased. We did it. Crocker raised his fist in celebration. Glory be to God. Bishop added. Yo Sammy girl, got the package and the blackmail. Mission success who we are. Vincent radioed in. At the other side of the street by the drunken bastard in. Samantha sighed in relief then smiled in great self-accomplishment as her first operation was a success. There were several unexpected deviations during the execution. But all of the men involved managed to break through regardless. Congratulations everyone. We did it. She radioed into everyone's communications. The youth soldiers and Iris began to cheer and congratulate themselves over the battle-scarred ruins of the mansion. Men chanted Poro Terra in high volumes and the civilian volunteers could be heard hugging each other in relief that they have all survived. There were a few injuries but according to the combat medics reports, the casualties should be able to make a full recovery in no time. We did it Lieutenant Rose. Abi Dyer smiled as he let go of the anti-material rifle he was holding. You're not a bad shot with that gun too. I was worried you might not handle the recoil. Samantha replied. Oh. Don't worry, I got very steady hands. The redneck laughed. Just then, a knock on the door interrupted the two. Ms. Rose? It's me Luda. I have someone who wants to talk to you. The voice of Luda spoke. Who? Samantha asked. She readied her pistol in hand, ready to fight back. She was feared that the dwarf might have sold her and her team out despite them taking down the burning horsemen. Ms. Rose, this is the Terriant city guards. Prince Clovich has summoned you, said another voice the LT doesn't recognize. And what happens if I don't? Samantha asked. She aimed her pistol at the door ready to fire if the city guards decide to barge through. We won't arrest you yet. If that is what you are asking, the prince wants an explanation. The voice of the city guardsman said, You can trust me in this. I explained everything to them. Luna avouch. Samantha absorbed the dwarf's words. She had always seen the dwarf as a character of an honest to goodness businessman. If the dwarf could keep Iris' secret of her vampirism safe throughout those years as she has explained, then it would not make any sense for Luna to sell her and her men out. Very well. Take me to him, Samantha said, lowering down her pistol. Dash, a few moments later, back at the mansion, Dash, the youth soldiers were in a tense standoff against the Terriant city guards. They aimed their guns at them whilst the Gleesian natives aimed their archer bows, crossbows, swords and halberds at them. Their cheering and celebration was cut short when the city guardsmen rolled into the scene and the men were forced to make their stand inside the battle-ruined mansion entrance. Crocker and Captain Mendoza managed to discipline everyone from firing a shot lest they ruin their chances of a diplomatic dialogue that they have fought hard that day to get. You are trespassing at my territory explain yourselves, yelled a regally dressed blonde haired man in ornate armor who rode past the city guards on his giant horse cladded in Tyrian heraldry. Who is he? whispered Crocker to Iris. That is Prince Clovich. 
the ruler of Tyrian. Iris answered, What do we do? Crocker asked. I don't know. Where is Lulia? She replied. Whilst the prince and the guards stood in ignorant stoicism from the face of the youth's guns, movement was spotted from behind the lines of guardsmen. Out popped none other than Lulia Amirian. He brandished a diplomat's smile as he walked right in the middle point of the divide between the youth and the guards' battle lines. Friends, friends, don't be so scared right now, we are all friends here, the dwarf said interceding the two parties. Lulia, are these the friends of yours? Prince Clovich asked. Indeed, although they are more of a friend of a friend my lord, Lulia answered. They are. You mercenaries as you can see from their weapons, Lulia appointed. Those are some rather strange weapons that they wield. I have never seen those and that armor of theirs where are they from? asked the prince. Yum. Yeah. They are from Dot Yum. Lulia tried to answer that question from his lead yet he has forgotten how to answer that question. Earth, prince. We are from Earth, Samantha said after pushing her way through the soldiers. She was followed by a Bidaya and an escort of two city guards. And who you might be? asked the prince. I am Lieutenant Samantha Rose. My, lord, and I am responsible for this. Samantha said. You know that there are two things you have just done. First off, you have been causing a loud commotion inside my city and from the reports I have gotten, there was magic involved of some unknown form. Normally freely throwing magic around in a populated city is a punishable offense, Clovich sternly said. I understand that completely. Samantha nodded. Then the second of course, is that you and your men are trespassing at a nobleman's property. That too is a crime but I know from this noble that he is very unpopular with everyone here for very unscrupulous reasons. I assume Lulia has sent you to do B. Here hasn't he? Yes, he did. Lulia explained the details to you I presume? Where is Divico? The prince asked, leaning downwards to stare at Samantha's as you rise. He is there with my men, she answered. She turned to her soldiers and gestured them. From the crowd of youth soldiers emerged Divico who was being held on gunpoint by Vincent. That is indeed him. Can you justify the accusations against him to warrant such a racket in my city? Raise Clovich. Hey! who has the book? Samantha shouted. She was answered by the emergence of Iris who raised the big book of blackmail on her hand who walked in front of the youth soldiers proudly. She then moved towards Iris and handed her the book. Taking the book from her hands, Samantha passed the book to the prince who took it from her as quickly as he can be able to reach it. The prince read through books studiously. Samantha wondered about the meanings behind the unknown characters of whatever alphabet the Gleesians used as she stood there. As she observed the prince's face, she noticed the tiny hints on him that he was reading the contents of the pages with utter shock by the look of his widened eyes. Before Samantha could analyze him further, the prince closed the book and handed it over to his back. Take Divico to jail and have this destroyed, he ordered. One of the more ornately armored guards walked to him by his side and grabbed the book while another similarly dressed guard took Divico to custody. Hopefully that will be the end of the blackmailing plague and reign of terror by the burning horse bandits that has stagnated the people of the Principality for decades as Samantha hoped it would be the case. So, Sir Rose, where do you come from? I am honestly curious about you and your people. The prince turned his eyes back to her. His voice was less stern than earlier as he began to open courteously to her. We come from a land far away my lord, Samantha said. Where is that land then? We come from a nation called the United Federation of Earth. Earth? Never heard of a place before by that name, he said baffled by the answered. Well Earth isn't here per se, we landed our colony at. What did you just say? Prince Clovich interrupted. Not here in Gleesia per se, Samantha answered. No after that, we landed our colony at Umiris Verdon Forest Valley, right? Samantha asked. Yes, my prince. They live in Verdon Forest Valley. Iris said. Samantha was left frozen in shock when Iris used the word lived. Live in the Forest Valley? How come I never got any permissions from you? The prince snapped. 
His teeth grinned in anger as if he has spotted an intruder in his realm. Look we had no idea that there are. Samantha tried to explain but was stopped when she heard the sharp note of a drawn blade from its scabbard. Trespassers. All of you. Clovic roared brandishing his sword. Samantha felt the strong masculine hands grip her shoulders behind her as she was seized by the guards. She saw a bee die getting seized with her and the youth soldiers aiming their weapons at them preparing to fire as the situation has gone completely south. Please. I have a family and kid. A bee die begged. Whoa stop everyone let's not be too hasty right now. Luya tried to defuse the situation but a sword aimed at him silenced him from speaking further. Do you have any last words before I send all of you to prison? He pressed. Iris fix this. Samantha focused on the vampire. Iris was now at fault for the negative scenario at hand. Swords aimed at her and the youth guns behind her. She is good as dead if she doesn't find a way to soothe out the now heated tension between the two parties. She quickly began to consider her next words for something, until she figured out something that could leverage the prince to let her new friends go in peace. My liege. Before you decide to take any more action from this point and onwards may I tell you something I know through a whisper? Iris said. You know something which? What is it? Clovich asked intriguingly. It's about my friends that you must hear between me and you only. I can just whisper it to you right now. Iris replied. Very well, I will entertain you. But after that I will throw you all to jail. Clovich nodded. Iris could hear from her enhanced hearing the cocking of guns from behind her as she knows that when their black powdered staffs make the clicking noise they are about to fire their metal projectiles and gun everyone down. Everyone, I got this. Iris turned around and held her hand and gestured an awkwardly conceived thumbs up. She turned back to see that Prince Clovich has now stepped down from his horse and was now waiting on here with his arms by hips, patience slowly growing thin. Iris leaned over and cupped her hands to Clovich's ear to prevent anyone from eavesdropping. She placed her mouth close to him and whispered, I read Devico's book and I know you spy on the Empire for the Elves. Iris said. The prince's face grew pale, in fear as his dark secret that Divico used to wrap him under his finger. Espionage for a foreign power was a punishable by death according to imperial laws. But, I understand why you do it. It's for your sister. You care for her. Want to see her happy. Iris continued. She is my only family left. What are you implying? The prince asked in a hushed voice. I have seen these people perform what are miraculous that not even the best mages from the conclave or from the elves can hope to achieve. Look at them with their alien weapons and armor. They can easily cut you and your men down in minutes. But, I have seen them with flying boats, clothes that can make a nobleman green with envy, and the food as far as the eyes can see. Iris described, surely you are just jesting me right now. Prince Clovich answered, his left was slowly inching to his sword. I am not my lord, for I know a woman who is one of the earth people who can heal people regardless of disease. Her name is Hana and you can take Princess Arya to her. So, let me ask you, no actually make that let me propose to you a compromise. You let my friends, me and Luya go for now and when at your most convenient time, I can take you to where the earth people live in your land. If you are not impressed by what they can offer to you as friends, you can jail or kill me, Luya and them as much as you want. Go ahead, call all your soldiers. Call the Emperor, the Inquisition. But I plead you, as a citizen and as an associate of the respected merchant Luya Mirian of Mirian Trading Company to please, give my friends the Earth people a chance to be your friends. Iris advised. The prince analyzed her words meticulously. For one long and harrowingly tense minute, the prince just stood there in front of Iris whilst the tension between his guards and the youth was frozen. Very well, I will let them go and give them a chance to impress me. Guards, let them go at least for now. The blue blood signaled his men to stand down. The guards followed their leader without question. They lowered their weapons and let go both Abedaya and Samantha. The prince then turned to Iris and Samantha with a hard-nosed aura that unsettled the LT. 
My earliest convenience is three days from now. I expect Julia and Iris to take me to where the Earth people live. I will bring several of my nobles along with my sister Princess Aria with about 1,000 guards as my security. I expect to be entertained by you, the Earth people as Iris described in a way fitting of a man of my status. Fail to impress me or make any hostile moves against me and I will send in the full might of Tyrion and the Empire down upon you. Do I make myself clear? The prince said. Yes my lord. Iris bent. Indeed. Samantha followed suit and bent down. Then it is settled then. Men. Return to the castle. Prince Clovich commanded. He climbed back up to his horse and turned around leaving the youth alone in the ruined mansion relieved that the situation was diffused from what could have been a very bullet trainy massacre. My God. Praise thee we are alive. Bishop declared. I don't know what you said to him but I love you now. Vincent cried in joy. Fucking great fucking job, you fucking cheeky little bugger. Crocker profanely congratulated the vampire patting Iris on her back. LT. You got to tell the news to command now. He added gesturing his hands to form the hand signal of the phone. Ouch guys. I just got cleared to walk by the medic. I should be a good to go for three days. Hey dot what there? Why the fucking is Aris holding my grenade launcher? Oh, you should have seen it. I'll explain it on the way home. Come on. Let's exfil the hell out of here. Crocker said to the recovered engineer. With their numbers gathered. The entire youth strike force boarded their vehicles and rolled out of the city quietly as the civilian bystanders watched them curiously at the strange heroes who took down the principality's most hated residents and freed them from their oppression. Whispers of who they are began to echo onto who exactly these earth people are who are strong enough to hold a closing gate, fast as the wind when they stormed the mansion and ultimately cunning enough to take down De Vigo and the burning horse bandits. Chapter 8, The Conference For the continent of Zanigrad, the shining beacon of civilization there would be undisputedly the Slaeijan Empire whose capital is the large port city of Herring Point, its territory outside the city extended to about 27 other regions of various sizes and topographies, each of the regions ranging from provinces and vassals called principalities are rich in resources whether it comes in bountiful farm fields, rich underground mines or being famous for the manufacturing of a certain good, yet it is their downfalls to the north. Raiders would descend from their desolated continent and attack the fishing villages and the mining towns of the empire's northernmost territories. To the east lay a vast desert where nomadic hawks would besiege fortress towns in order to access the fertile grounds beyond. To the west is the arrogant elves. Despite being split into two distinct factions, the Empire fears the worst possible fallout to happen if the Entente and the Pact go back to war one day. And right at the middle of their territory, bandits roam free and there are rumors of an underground sect of unknown intentions plotting a massive uprising of fantastical proportions. The Empire's armies could only do so much to deal such threats throughout their lands. In order to quell such lawlessness, the Empire created the Grey Order or more popularly known by the common folks as the Adventurers Guild. The system in place is rather simple. People from all walks of life can write up formal a request called quests and post it to any of the various branch offices of the adventurers guild scattered throughout the empire. They will need to pay a fee depending on the difficulty of the said quests which will be formally classified into categories by an official who will grade them via a five star system. One star being easy and five stars being dangerous. The quest givers are ultimately responsible of the reward when the quests has been successfully completed. These can range from material goods to services. All of the said rewards should be proportional to the rated difficulty of said quest. Quest types can vary from investigations, escorts, clearings, acquisitions etc. Although anyone can take up the requests such as independent mercenaries or adventurous bands, Members of the Adventurers Guild have special privileges that they enjoy such as discounts in shops, access to the Wizard Conclave's libraries and exclusive quests. Anyone, regardless of race and origin can become a member of the Adventurers Guild. However, it is known by the several members of the Imperial Government that they would use the Guild's human resources for several clandestine government assignments. 
the Grey Order's headquarters is stationed right inside the palatial district of Herring Point where it first opened their offices to the citizenry. The guild has existed for over a century. Initially most of the members of the guild were citizens of Slaeja ranging from ex-legionnaires of the empire to citizens who can afford or are brave enough to take up a weapon. Then it has progressed to a diverse roster of mages from the conclave, warriors from the dwarven mountain kingdoms, elves from Alphalnora, even several orcs and northmen and much more. Most of the prolific members of the guild work inside the HQ of the guild in the empire capital where the most lucrative, nationally pressing and dangerous missions are often written to. I am telling you. My visions say Tyrion. They will land there, see the people and unleash their might exclaimed Grandmaster Owen of the Conclave of Wizards. He is conducting a meeting of some of the most successfully adventurous guild members who he has hope can help him in such a cloudy time in the aftermath of Jeltigar's Comet. They were initially briefed over the facts beforehand such as the Conclave's attempt to see the future. The massive magical explosion afterwards and the traumatization of the Conclave's most powerful member Owen. The Grandmaster, after spending weeks recovering from the explosion a month ago could now be seen in the libraries of the Conclave studying demonology books and mystical creatures encyclopedias in his search for answers. Whenever he described the man demons of metal to such experts he was given replies of utter scoffing and confusion as they didn't know what kind of creature he was describing for no such creature has ever been recorded to have even existed. Based on his fruitless search for answers based on all the accumulated knowledge the Empire has acquired throughout its time, the Grand Master concluded that the creatures he saw in his premonitions were an entirely new species of unknown origin. Grand Master, surely you are still slightly off your head after that accident of yours? Asked Sir Petra the Faithful. Tyrion, one of the smaller regions in terms of size and wealth in the Empire, is where these demons you say will invade? Those poor souls they won't stand a chance when they arrive we should rally the legions and the guild and march. Sir Petra the Faithful Rukdorf is a valiant knight for hire who is in the guild for ten years and has racked up over four hundred completed quests, a quarter of which were classified as four-star difficulty in the quest grading systems. He was known far and wide for his bravery and ever-resolute composure against the odds when he fought orc warlords, necromancers, and monstrous beasts. These deeds were accomplished by a form of weapons conjuring magics he has pioneered where he can summon ghostly images of multiple weapons ranging from spears, swords and great battle axes out of thin air and control telepathically. He uses his powers to multiply the damage he can do within one moment to exponential multiplications. He is also popular with the common folk for his bravery and is quite the bachelor to many young women at his ripe age of 29 years. Yet despite the publicity he receives, whenever danger arrives at any given moment, he would be the first to take up arms, hence his nickname the Faithful. But I saw those visions. Is Tyrion the only place that brands the heraldry of a windmill on a green and red checkered kite shield? Owen took his point across with his question. He was damn sure he saw the heraldry of that backwater region in his visions. I have to disagree with you Petra my friend, said the prodigious sorceress Carlia Silverdane standing up proudly in her lion mane like braided hair to object the sanguinary night it doesn't make sense for them to invade such a remote town. There is barely anything but farmlands and the small time Mirian trading company. Would it make more sense for them to strike at a more? important city like the fortress city of Little Hill, the trading hub of New Gonia or Herring Point directly, she questioned. The sorceress is best described as a jack-of-all-trades magic user able to do a variety of basic and intermediate spells from the destruction, restoration, altercation, conjuration, and illusion. Perhaps they will use Tyrion as a staging point. It is military week after all. Take down Prince Clovich and his guards then flood in the rest of their armies unhindered before we can have a chance to react. And then once they got their entire party gathered, flood over the entire east of themselves and push all the way to Herring Point, reasoned the cold and calculating meat of the northern crow who was instead of sitting down on a chair, 
was leaning on the wall with her arms crossed listening to Owen's ramblings cladded in her skin-tight rogue armor. A rogue bite trade, she was responsible for numerous subversive security breaches of fortified buildings and a handful of assassinations of rogue elements. She is proficient in close quarters combat with her dual daggers and an excellent shot from her custom one-handed dwarven crossbow. She is mostly through and through a mercenary only interested in the money that the imperial government pay her handsomely with. Can you give us more details of the visions you see? Surely there is something you can remember that can help us. Just even a tiny bit of information? Inquired the grisly tattooed dwarf Findrum, a monster hunter who has claimed the heads and cadavers of minotaurs, dragons, lamias, trolls and much more. He is one of the oldest members of the guild. Despite his size of only a mere five feet, the dwarf can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the strongest of beasts. He is also one of the humblest and honorable of the guild as he pays great respects to those who've fallen as his quarry. He can often be seen when outside his monster hunt quests teaching the tricks of his job to the next generation. Well, I did remember that the day, Owen struggled to remember when the door to their meeting room knocked. Who could be knocking at an important meeting like this? Carly rattled. Owen walked towards the room's door and slightly opened the door peeking outside to see who is disturbing them in such a time like this. As he looked he spotted a lithe young elf woman standing in front of him in a leather ranger gamson of the Earth Island on taunt elves and topping golden blonde hair. The elf looked at him with buoyant eyes that could pierce the most stone cold of hearts. Greetings, I am Princess Aliathra. I am with the elves and I was told to find Grandmaster Owen. Aliathro explained herself. I was sent her by my family to investigate the omens about the comet's passing. She continued. Well you have come into the right place. I am just talking about it with some of the guild members. Take a seat and listen quietly. I was just about to tell something important. Owen smiled. He pushed the door further allowing the elven princess to walk in. The four senior guild members widened their eyes at the beautiful woman in utter roar. For someone who is an elven ranger of her apparel she is marvelously pleasing to the eyes. Most of the elves who have undergone training are masculine in build due to the harsh training that they have entail and the dangerous assignments they are given. Both Petra and Meta felt rosy in their minds over the ethereal beauty of the foreign warrior from Alphalnora. People, this is Princess Aliathra Letha, daughter of King Aslanador and Queen Illusion. Owen announced. A princess in here? You're quite well armed for a princess. Meta commented pointing to Aliathra's elven bow. My father the king didn't want to have his youngest daughter be a spoiled child locked in a gilded cage. That's why he sent me to train with the rangers, Aliathra said. I was told rangers have masculine bodies and strong muscles even the women. Your body is still quite feminine, said Petra. I only had ranger training for only half their training regiment under a private instructor being taught archery and survival only. But I can make up for it for because I am also an excellent restoration and alteration magic. The elf answered. So, what brings a princess, let alone an elf princess from Alphalnora here in Herring Point, asked Meta, the queen. My mother has sent me to the outside world to investigate the comet. She answered the rogue. You say that like it is your first time. Petra noted. This is my first time indeed being outside my country. I hope I and the rest of the Earth Island Entente can help you in your investigations. Aliathra graciously spoke. Don't worry, the Empire will keep you safe during your mission on behalf of our friendship. Owen heartened the elf. Please. Inform me the details. Aliathra abided Owen. Okay. Let me continue what I was about to say. Owen nodded. He paused for a moment to let Aliathra sit down. As I say, I remembered seeing eyes fall down from the heavens to scour the lands for the demons to feast upon. They will see our lands and greedily come over to feast on our souls and destroy all that we hold dear. Owen said remembering the apocalyptic images from that faithful day. Hold on for just one moment, clamored Findrum. They will send eyes? Explain. I saw it. The eyes that the demons sent to scout our lands is held in a pedestal where a giant eye is presented. It is carried over an admixture between broken clumps of metal and a small carriage. When the eyes will see our homes, our farms, 
our cities. We will all face the wraths of the fires of hell on our soil. Owen finished his ramblings. Dot. You said we'll see am I correct? Asked Findrum. Yes, they will see our homes and the demons will descend upon us. Owen acknowledged. Call me crazy but I think we can actually prevent the apocalypse from ever happening. Findrum proposed. Everyone in the room from the normally reserved meter, the intellectual Owen and the regal Eliathra all responded to Findrum's statement with a flat what? What are you saying? Eliathra asked shocked by the dwarf's words. Demons from the mouthful I have taken down from those crazy cultists are animalistic in nature. The feed on people and love to do nothing more but sow ruin to our civilization. Findrum began to explain to his peers. So, what are you proposing we do? Owen pressed. He leaned his body over to the dwarf eagerly to listen to what he has in mind. Well most demons must abide to their primal instincts just like any beasts. If they don't see anything to eat in this case souls of fully thinking individuals or thrash themselves around in any cities, they will lose interest very quickly. The monster hunter explained. Are you suggesting we make Tyrion disappear or something like that? Ridiculous. Petra howled. Hold on for a minute night. I think Findrim is on to something. Calmed Meter. So, we are going to make the city disappear? Petra questioned dumbfounded by Meter's contradictory opinion. Not really disappear. Make it look like it disappeared. Meter explained. Kalia how good are you in casting mirages? The crow turned to the sorceress. Well alone I can hide maybe a house or two for about a day. Kalia answered. How many of the illusion mages can the conclave spare? Meta asked Owen. If it means cancelling the apocalypse, we will gladly send all of them. Owen nodded. But we are going to need more than me and all the illusion mages to hide an entire principality. We will need several purified magic crystals to sustain our mirage. Kali added. That can be arranged. What is several tons of pure magic crystals to stopping the demons from destroying us all? Owen said. But what about Tyrion? The prince in charge of that place is named Clovich am I correct? You think he will approve such a large congregation of mages and several shipments of magic crystals? Petra questioned. Petra's questioning was reasonable. Within the real politic of Gleesia, when large shipments of magic crystals which are normally distributed evenly across the empire, when such a large amount of the crystals ends up in the same place, let alone a border province, it is normally tied with a massive military built up in preparation of war. The common folks will easily panic which will cause chaos not only in the local provinces but throughout the realm through the word of mouth of refugees and messengers. Owen knew that he must ensure that public order remains unaffected when they do their mirage trick on the principality lest the empire shows signs of weakness that invites the vultures from outside their borders. I can ask the Emperor to make up an excuse for us being there, hopefully Prince Clovich will believe it, that is, it for our meeting today everyone. Carlia, Eliathra and Findrim please make the arrangements with the School of Illusion. Petra, Meta come with me and let us gather the crystals we need, the meeting is adjourned. Owen concluded. Everyone nodded in acknowledgement to the Grand Master as everyone stood up from their chairs and head out their separate ways. For Princess Eliathra, she was ready and eager to prove her mettle in the outside world as the representative of the elven race. She hopes that one day she can crawl out of the shadow of her elder sister Lunafria who is the heir apparent of the Chrysanthemum throne of Ethylon. To go down in history as someone who prevented the apocalypse of the entire world of Gleesia would be a proud title that she can have in her name. Knowing she is the youngest of the three Larentha siblings, she must prove herself by earning a heroic title that can make her parents and those that came before her proud. She proceeded to a discreet room where to nobody can see nor eavesdrop her and reported her progress to her parents via a communication spell. Unknowingly, she will be informed that her mission in Tyrian will go smoothly for there is a double agent placed in the most unexpected of roles in the Principality's hierarchy. Dash back in the youth colony, Dash. You know, we can't just call our place the Eodem anymore. I mean it ain't really catchy for me. Crocus Malt talked. I agree with you. But I suggest you take that up with high command. 
Hopefully when the first colony meeting starts you can say what we will name this place. Samantha replied. The entire Stider group squad has gathered together to a B. Diarut's homestead for a housewarming party. However, there were still several parts of the home that needs to be constructed due to the delays brought forth by the now defunct Burning Horse Bandit trade more than a week ago. Ken can be seen hard at work finishing the last few parts of a bed's abode with the help of several construction drones. I have never been able to see a house built so fast, Iris said. The vampire marveled at the coordinated effort the drones that carried over the steel bars and concrete together with the drones, equipped with numerous gadgets to bring the building materials together into a hospitable shelter for a family. Well, that's technology for you Miss Gadahagan. This greenhouse will provide food for a bed's family and to sell off world. Ken replied. He was multitasking on the drone controls and chatting with Iris who stood next to him as he worked on the holographic screen that controls the droid's movements and actions. What is a greenhouse? Iris asked. It's like a farm, but that's not enough land to be productive. Iris noted the land size discrepancy to the greenhouse and a traditional farm. Well your farms are built wide. Ours is built tall. You see a greenhouse or at least the schematic that I am working on, is designed to plant crops upwards into the air. Ken explained, planting food in the air that's preposterous. There's no soil. Iris blasted. Oh no, we don't need to use soil. We just need to use less than normally needed water, some nutrients and it's good to go. By the way Iris, ever noticed that depending on the weather, crop yields change? Ken asked. Yes, they do change much to the frustration of everyone. I have seen my fair share of famines. Iris answered. Greenhouses are not affected by weather because it is temperature controlled and sheltered from the elements. Imagine an artificial sun that always stays up. That's the beauty of it. The engineer smiled. And you are building about a hundred of these? and another hundred in the plans. By my calculations with two hundred greenhouse farms equipped for vertical farming, I can estimate that we can have a healthy yield of about five times the amount compared to what the Principality can produce with their medieval methods in about a year, he estimated. That's marvelous. I can't believe what I am saying but I love what you are doing. Iris jumped in euphoria. The Nigerian blushed over the vampire's affectionate compliments. Being appreciated for his work boosted his own disposition. After making a full recovery from the concussion he had received during Operation Scorpion Sting he had wanted to have some R and R for himself after being cleared by Dr. Lee Hainwell. Yet he was immediately assigned to work on the construction of the colony's settlement buildings like the farms and houses that the people will live and work in. Governor White wanted to double time the construction of all the colony's settlements so when Prince Clovich arrives for the first inter youth and Gleesia conference he can impress them with the youth's advanced technology. Thanks Cyrus. You made my day. Ken smiled as he concluded the final touches of the greenhouse's construction with the placement of the special horticulture glass panels to top off the roof. The private first class have both the training and experience to build the greenhouses although he was more used to constructing military barracks and silos during his previous tours. The schematics he followed were prefabricated designs and programmed to the drone's building algorithms so he had no reason to worry of committing any kind of mistake. And it's done. Cheered a Dyer's wife. Miss Leah Root, it sure is madam. Now let's get this party started. Samantha walked behind her and smiled. A Dyer let loose a small rain of confetti out of a confetti thrower from his hands to kick off his housewarming party alongside his daughter April who also held another confetti thrower but of smaller size for her ten-year-old hands. He the hunter turned to his sides and opened a cooler that contained several dozen bottles of beer for the guests in attendance. There was Strider Group, Captain Medoza with his squad and a few of Abed's neighbors who live in the adjacent houses between him. Iris looked around her surroundings of the Earth human hosted party. Unlike the vampire balls she attended and the festivals she has snuck herself inside, the housewarming party was an alien concept to her. Parties as intimate as fully moving one's family into a new home is something only the rich can even think of conducting as parties are expensive affairs. You have to pay food, 
invitations and entertainment to even get a chance for even a single guest to arrive. Yet compared to this, the party's amenities were humble in quality. The entertainment is a single metal box that magically produces music that the Earth humans call a speaker box. The decorations were virtually non-existent with only a banner that was crudely painted Root Family's housewarming party, and for the food is a combination of game meat that the youth managed to procure from living off the land and fruits and vegetables that the colony brought out from their kitchen stores, some of the said crops were unrecognizable to her. If this was a normal party held by the standards of the Gleasons it would be an utter disaster of boredom and causing the host to become the pariah of all the noble elites for months to come. Yet what astonished her was that despite the lacklustre amenities, everyone was smiling and making themselves merry. Strange these earth humans are. With the simplest of things they are already happy, she thought. Keeping herself from the attention of the other humans, Iris pushed her way through the crowd unnoticeably to find to her more familiar companions just so she cannot stand by and look awkward as the rest of them enjoyed themselves. Her eyes soon caught Vincent and Crocker standing idly by a red-colored table. Both of their faces aired dissatisfaction as if being annoyed over something. Perhaps they weren't enjoying the party after all. Hello Vincent, hello Louis, she greeted. Hey. Both of them said in unison. Iris spotted that Crocker was trying to repeatedly tap his hand on a valve that is attached to the strangely shaped table. On the surface of the table it was hollow with great iron bars placed on top of the hole. She noticed that inside the hollow inside of the table was several lumps of coal and wood stacked together to form a base for a fire. That's a strange table you have there. It even has wheels. Iris commented. This? Oh, it's called a grill. It's like a portable stove, a bed's letting me use it to cook some steaks. Crocker said. You seem to be having trouble with the table I see. Iris said. Yes, can't get this damn thing to work. He replied. He continued to try snap his igniter to birth the flames necessary for cooking. With a snap of her fingers Iris let loose her magics and instantly ignited a small fire from within the grill setting the cooking device alight in a brilliant flame from below its hollow end. Finally, thought this shitty lighter won't work. Crocker smiled. Tossing the shoddy igniter away he then picked up a pair of thongs and began to place several cuts of meat onto the grill. I am hungry already. I can't wait to eat. Oh, kinda awkward right now. Vincent said as he looked at Iris. He was leaning on a dinner table with his impatient hands holding a spoon and fork along his plate. The crackling sound followed by the sizzling of the meat as it shared into course with flames created a symphony that made ex-thief's mouth water. Awkward? Iris questioned. Well it's because you're a vampy. You like drinking blood, right? Tell me because call me crazy, but I want to know. What's it like? The penal soldier asked. Well. To tell you the truth, at least I am encouraged to buy Hana to do that. I normally drink the blood of the animals that live near the forest where I used to live, like deer, rabbits, the occasional bear, even an occasional burning horseman. I do eat other food though like a normal person, it's just that blood is, how do I say, more nutritious. It also helps with my magic. Although please don't tell that to that further bishop friend of yours, she nudged. Don't tell me what, interrupted Bishop who was strolling behind Dyrus causing her to tip skittishly. The last thing she wants right now is antagonizing her fragile alliance with the religious figure. You my was. Saying. Ah. Iris tried to mutter some sort of explanation for herself when Vincent butted in in front of her. I was telling Iris about some of the food that we are eating as she got curious about them. He lied. I told her about these blood red chili peppers that I love to eat. He awkwardly smiled while nudging his elbow to Iris. Taking his cue, Iris nodded that what she said was really about these blood red chili peppers. Well those chilies are quite spicy if I may say so myself. It would be quite the show seeing you eat one child, Bishop said. Of course. I will eat these chilies. Where are they? Iris turned her worried eyes to Vincent. Yes, you Crocker can you pass one of the jalapenos over to our vampire friend? Vincent said. Crocker moved his hand over to a basket that contained assorted fruits and vegetables and grabbed a tiny green morsel from it and passed it to her palm. 
Good dot fucking dot luck the Brit whispered. Ira sculpt, what did she just got herself into? She looked at her hand and observed her tribute. It was a small looking fruit that had a slight curve, its surface colored in a very polished green that reflected the light of the light bulb above her. She examined at her companions who looked at her nervously as she hesitates to consume the fruit. How can such a tiny fruit could emit such fear and disdain by these earth humans? She asked herself. She had previously seen the youth fearlessly fight against her when she invoked her magic and resolutely challenged the powerful burning horsemen without any flinching. Yet they are afraid of a tiny vegetable. Iris overconfidently laughed as she raised her arm and devoured the jalapeno chili hole. Oh, how wrong was her brashness when the juices of the chili spilled on her vampire tongue. She could feel a creeping heat from within her orifices. At first the heat was as hot as a match's light but it slowly the invisible fire spread to the rest of her mouth until it felt like the burning pits of hell that her tongue is tasting. The vampire began to sweat profusely like she had never sweated before. She felt like she was in a sauna as she distanced herself away from her companions for space. She began to flail her hands aimlessly as the raging inferno in her estuary became hotter and hotter. If she doesn't quench this heat soon she might even die of by being cooked from the inside. Rag! She screamed as she summoned a great amount of her magic to release a burst of ice and snow that sparkled beautifully to relieve herself from the chili's infernal influences. Whoa! Crocker looked in awe. Iris turned herself around and soon found that every pair of eyes in the party stared at her when she demonstrated her magic powers right in front of them. The witch was about to collapse in utter embarrassment when she heard the voice of a small girl, Daddy. A snow angel like Elsa, said a bee dyer's daughter April. Her tiny body brushed past the adult party goers like she passed through a forest until she reached Tyra's feet. The girl launched herself into the sparkling snowflakes and ice particles that dotted around her. She looked down at the child and saw that instead of fear and disgust that would be the normal reaction from non-conclave associated mages. It was the cheer and innocence of a child seeing her first snowfall. For Iris, her cold heart warmed up as she knelt down onto the same height level as the girl. More. April cheered. Smiling at her, Iris conjured more softly made snowflakes from her hands and launched it up to the sky making a momentary snowfall in the middle of a summer afternoon. Hooray. I love my new home daddy. April cheered as she played around trying to catch the snowflakes. Well I'll be vampy. You made my little April happy. She's been awfully sad when I had to make her move out of New Montana from our old home world to here. Thank you. Abidai applauded. Maybe I am wrong about you vampire. Perhaps you can be changed, said Bishop. Talk about letting it go. Samantha laughed as she downed another bottle of alcohol. Dash. Back inside the EO Dem, Dash, plans were underway for the first ever first contact between the United Federation of Earth and the indigenous natives of Gleesia. Battlements that had once guarded the perimeter of the colony ship were replaced with the sites of beautifully planted trees and garden bushes that aesthetically made the now growing colony town into a beautiful mixture of nature and urbanization. Greenhouses whose shining crowns will reflect the day's sun in a splendorous display. The soon-to-be-constructed town hall that is inspired by the classical Greco-Roman architecture will be the center of the colonial government in this new world. The tents that have provided temporary housing for the colonists now were turned into fully flesh homes ranging from apartments, condominiums and single-family houses. With all of these constructions underway, Governor Jeremy White looked on from his office inside the EO Dem. His forceful streamlining of the construction of the town has paid off without any problems whatsoever. He had to enlist the manpower of the colonial militia to get the productivity boost he needed to make up for lost time. Inside his mind he has already completed the first phase of the colonization effort for Benham III although at the rate he has been informed by the soldiers and the science team, will have to call this planet Gleesia. He just couldn't help but wonder. How were the scans came out so dead wrong? They were supposed to plant fall in an uninhabited world with an Earth-like ecosystem, but instead he felt like the entire colony was thrown into the deep middle of Final Fantasy with all the mythical sights he has seen from Fire Golems, magic, 
and vampires. Governor White, are you troubled? Said the audiographic voice of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs Director Sienna Di Popo. Her holographic form gently drifted towards the side of the governor as he overlooked the window of his developing colony. No, I am more of relieved. I am happy that my work has come up to this moment. How is the initial probing reports fair against ours? Jeremy asked. I have to say, my men have just cross-referenced your data with the old probes data and I am just as afraid to say as, there aren't any discrepancies other than the update of several man-made structures that dotted Benham 3 from your reports. We are just as confused on how our probes were wrong the first time around as you do, Sienna said. Well, then it's most likely and I can't believe what I am saying. It is to be these magics that the militia has reported on seeing. I can't find any more explanation than that. Jeremy confessed. Maybe that's it governor. Perhaps all of those times we have watched movies, shows, and video games of extraterrestrials and fantasy rebounds per games have guided us into this very moment. I am glad that we are now holding our first conference with this principality of Tyrian that we have accidentally colonized. I am just as nervous as you are for the negotiations and the discussions that will happen tomorrow, Sienna said. You say that you're not ready as just as me, White commented. Well, none of us could have expected nor be truly ready for what will happen tomorrow, answered Sienna. I am just an astrophysicist in charge of studying the outer fringes of space. Yet according to my mandate, I am also supposed to represent the entire youth when we meet extraterrestrials for the first time, but to be fair, I never knew we would be the superior species in this side of the diplomatic table. Indeed, Jeremy agreed, I also want to confirm a detail of yours that you have sent me. According to reports from Dr. Malona and Dr. Lee Hainwell. You have met with a native of the planet who has become your guide and translator that goes by the code name Sakajiwa real name Aris Kudahagan. CN recited from a document she is reading about the Benham 3 colony. Of course, she has been a lot of help and thanks to her we are able to make a proper first contact with the native peoples of this planet. Well, unlike the first first contact, he answered. His mind can still remember the horrors of the burning horseman assault that attacked them when they first landed. He is glad that both the colony and the people of Tyrian are no longer under their tyranny thanks to the intrepid efforts of Lieutenant Rose and Strider Group. Well according to the descriptions sent to me, Iris is described to be both a mage and a vampire. Are you sure we can trust her to being the saccade you are of this colony for this world? The director asked. I have coerced her for her services as a guide and translator. During the assault we acquired a peculiar necklace with a glowing blue crystal in it. We have found out that Iris was the previous owner of that necklace. I gave her a deal. She can peacefully reclaim her family heirloom by working with us as our guide. So far she has been cooperative with us right now. And this necklace with the blue crystal. It's rather special to her and special to the natives by its nature. Am I reading this correctly? It's a source of power and also some sort of amplifier for their magic. Where is that necklace right now? You do have to give it back eventually. Sienna reminded. I will in time. As for the necklace Dr. Malona has been studying tirelessly and has sum up with one answer. It is a brand new, never before seen element other than in hypothetical drawings. It is the fabled element 120, or unbenilium. As he said to me, the doctor said that the possibilities for it could be endless when we find more of these to use for ourselves. The governor answered, just imagine the technological advances we can make with this new element. Sienna grin as she envisages the usages of unbenilium. Technology has indeed got us to where we all are today Madam Director. But this magics I fear the possibilities for we are dealing with something we have never have seen before. The soldiers have seen what this magic is capable of by one person just now. I fear, what if this magics doesn't want us here? He asked anxiously. He sunk his head down in an uneasy state of fear over the intimidating world he now calls his new home. Did the great scientists hesitated when they toyed with the natures and intricate systems of our God-given world? Did the great explorers faltered when they crossed the ocean in search of new land? Did the great generals at times of war balk to themselves before they charged through their enemies? 
The answer is no governor, we have all come too far in our history as a species. Now. As a race to real in now, don't you remember the motto of the colonial bearer? Our destiny is in the stars. If these magics try to fight us out, we will survive, adapt and win, just like our ancestors before us. Sienna lectured, perhaps you are indeed right director. Maybe this could open a new chapter into the human history. Jeremy nodded with his confidence and hope restored. Poro Terra Governor. I will see you and the prince tomorrow. She bid farewell. Her hologram disappeared darkening the governor's bedroom. Poro Terra, he whispered quietly before he went to his bed to sleep, for tomorrow will be his greatest test of diplomatic dexterity yet. Iris' plan she discussed to him earlier with him and Dr. Lee Hainan will better work tomorrow. Or it's going to be another fucking massacre. Dash, the very next day, Dash, Prince Klovich galloped proudly through the Tyrian countryside. Unlike the day he had first met the strange alien visitors in his battle armor, he is now wearing a velvet coat hardie of the color green with several red dots intricately patterned into the design. In match with Tyrion's heraldry, the prince was followed by a cohort of 1,000 of his best knights and guards alongside a horse-drawn carriage that transported Luya Amirian and his beloved sister Princess Arya. Their destination was the Eodem colony ship. At first when he heard that is the name of the place, he thought it was a joke, a boat in the middle of land, there was no major body of water that can hold a boat capable of carrying about 1000 people, he has doubts over if having a diplomatic dialogue was even a good idea to begin with. He would have just turned away right now if it wasn't for the insistence of the witch Iris who was accompanied by her escort of Lieutenant Rose and Sergeant Crocker who went ahead to make sure that the Gleesian delegation makes it to them safely and smoothly. Brother, are we there yet? Asked Arya from the back of the carriage. I hope so. Are we I grow tired of cantering. When will I see this flying boat of yours? The prince said. It's over this hill. Samantha pointed with her arm. The lieutenant and her second in command waited ahead of the colony to greet the delegation a about a few kilometer away from the colony with Iris acting as the initial intermediary between the pair of youth soldiers and the prince. As the march continued the prince's curiosity got the better of him. So... Tell me Lieutenant Rose about yourself and your men, he asked. Well, I grew up with a mother who is a baker and my father are a captain who became a war hero. Wanting to follow on my old man's footsteps I joined the military. After graduation from the academy I was sent here as a squad leader. You can already see my second in command Sergeant Crocker. She waved to the Brit. Hey, I may be older than her but she's my CO. I basically tell the other boys her orders. Other that I am a saw gunner, I use this what you would call a fire staff to shoot rapid fire metal shots called bullets, it can break lots of charges this baby, he proudly declared. Crocker is your name? My people are making you famous back in the city, the prince said. Really? What is it? Wait is it about that gate I held open? Lewis questioned. Indeed, the gate that sealed Davico's house is made by the same materials used to make the gates to Herring Point. The capital of the Slaagian Empire, my liege. It is said that it takes several people or one ogre to open and close the gate because the mechanism is very heavy. From what the people have told me, they're calling you the ogre breaker since you held that gate open as strong as several of them. Well thank you prince, and thank you lovely. Crocker smiled. You're lovely? Princess Arya asked from behind the carriage. My armor. He answered. It looks nothing like ours. There's even some uncovered spots on your arms, and they are circular, she commented at Crocker's arm units. What this armor does instead of protection is strength. It's how I carried that gate, he answered. You truly are quite a hero. Reminds me of the Adventurers Guild doing all sorts of stuff around here. They even passed by some time ago for some studying, the prince said. Adventurers Guild? Samantha asked. It's a group of people that pays bounties for quests and they have members who do them. Don't be intimidated, anyone can take up a bounty, but it takes skill to finish it. Sounds pretty interesting. What is the nature of these quests? Samantha asked again. Well there's caravan escorts, monster extermination, item acquisitions for ducats. Basically, mercenary work? Yes, 
it's pretty much mercenary work. There's some requests in the local office back in the city right now. Wow. Just like Dungeons and Dragons. Samantha beamed eagerly. Just like what? The prince asked. Oh, it's just an earth thing. The lieutenant dodged. Look over there, yelled one of Clovich's knights. The armored horseman pointed at a crystal canopy that reflected the sun's light. It was one of the colony's newly built greenhouse domes. After traversing over the hill, the Tyrian diplomatic mission were astonished to on what they saw. Homes, sheltered farms and other kinds of buildings littered the grounds with people tending their land diligently. He observed that all of the houses were instead of being made of wood and straw such as the way commoners would build their homes, were instead built on what looked like shining metal and concrete. Not even the emperor himself can afford to build with such means due to how expensive the materials and the people skilled enough to build with such implements. He looked at the people who stopped what they were doing and stared at him in a mixture of emotions ranging from fear hope and wonder. The people look as human as him every shape and form yet their clothes were of alien compositions and pattern. Were they like lost cousins of his pantheon's creation? How can there be others like him who aren't of their world? As he fought the questions within his head, the buildings became less spread out between themselves and more closely packed. Soon, the dirt road disappeared from his horse's hooves and is replaced with asphalt road that clicked on every step his steed takes. The buildings on the more urbanized surroundings were of similar to a town with signs and a few natural decorations like a tree and some bushes, yet the signs he and all of his men examined were of an alien alphabet. However they can recognize that above the strange letters were images of lifelike quality made out of holographic light which indicates what type of building they are. The central area of the colony had several restaurants, cafes, workshops and even a recreational center for the earthlings to call their own in. Several flying drones that the primitives registered as oddly shaped birds buzzed past them completing the incongruous look of the whole settlement. As the diplomatic party marveled at the sights, they didn't take heed that their convoy was being stopped by one of the youth soldiers. Prince Clovich, no more horses beyond this point. Governor Jeremy White will like to see you know. A man dressed in blue vest with the initials MP said. Very well, he acknowledged. The prince dislodged from his horse followed by his most trusted bodyguards and several high-ranking nobles. From behind him, Lulia Amirian hopped off the carriage. Is your sister coming with you? Samantha asked. Of course, knights. Arya's chair he ordered. Several knights of Tyrian rushed towards the carriage and dislodged a wooden, throne-like chair from the carriage's back and placed in front of the door. One of the more bulkier soldiers reached into the carriage and lifted Princess Arya bridal style before placing her on the chair. Samantha observed that the young woman wore a blue and bay colored dress while sporting a long and flowing brunette hair with several blonde streaks. Her as your eyes pictured excitement from her like a man who has seen the sun for the first day. Samantha thought that this girl was heavily sheltered in a gilded cage for most of her life. Yet why would Prince Clovich let his sister out of the safety of her home? So, I will see you later I hope, Prince Clovich said as he passed by her. Yes, you will. Good luck over there, Samantha lauded. The prince and his entourage walked past the lieutenant and the sergeant of Strider group then passed the onlookers until he made it to a table in the middle of an intersection. The prince observed that he was being watched in every angle by armed soldiers and civilian bystanders. If this was supposed to be a trap they would have ended him already. Yet the soldiers didn't move as if not interested in an attempt on his life. They were just standing there from the ground level to the elevated roofs silently watching him. He could feel so eerie just being there for all of them to see like being subjected to some sort of child's plaything walking around in a dollhouse. Prince Clovich welcome, please take a seat, broke the voice of a man. It was one of the people sitting in the table set up for their meeting. It was covered in elegantly with intricately designed engravings and cushion chairs that were enough for his entourage and him. He saw in front of him that there were four people at the table waiting for them. One of them was the familiar face of Aris Kadahagan who had suggested to him to talk with the UFE peacefully. The other three however were new to the prince's internal registry of faces. 
One of them was a man dressed in a sharply dressed suit who sported black loosened hair with signs of graying. The second man was dressed in a green colored dress that it would blend it perfectly with the forest scenery if it wasn't for the rainbow of colors from his left breast that he wore proudly like a medal. The last one in the table was the most peculiar of them all. An elderly woman whose skin showed signs of aging sat adjacent to the sharply dressed man. The older woman was covered head to toe in a ghostly blue color and her image and stature looked impalpable in integrity like if she was not there yet there at the same time. Clovich and his entourage including Lulia Amirian slowly sat down on a chair as they faced the UFE leaders. His sister was placed carefully next to him as she quietly settled herself down. Prince Clovich. A pleasure to finally meet you. I am Governor Jeremy White. The sharply dressed man greeted. The man on my right is Colonel Patrick Polonsky, leader of the colonial militia here who you met several of his men. The governor gestured to his right. On my left is the director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, Dr. Sienna Di Popo, who right now is in her hologram form. I hope you're not scared or anything. The governor gestured to his left before following with a concerned question to the prince. Is she a ghost? Can you summon the spirits of the dead? Clovich asked nervously. His entire entourage also felt the same to him. Their bodyguard escort readied their weapons still sheathed in their hands as they looked a ghostly figure in fear. Oh, no. I am very much alive your highness. Sienna diplomatically answered. I am just not physically here right now. Then what are you? The prince asked. I am the director in charge of meeting with alien life forms just as yourself. I am communicating with you from a very far away place because I can't be here, really here, with my own body in such a short notice so I have to settle with a projected hologram just so I can participate in this meeting. Sienna explained. When you get to know them longer, you will eventually start to understand some of their eccentricities my lord, trust me. Iris added. And this lovely woman next to Polonsky is Aris Kudahagen, our guide and translator. Thanks to her, we you, me, Polonsky and Director Di Popo can understand each other so do not worry about any language barriers. Governor White reassured, well I shall take your word for it. So, Governor Jeremy White, tell me about yourself in this place of yours that you have built on my land. He emphasized his authority. Peaceful settlers or not the UFE are still trespassing on his land. Any self-respecting prince would defend his realm from outside invaders. Yet unlike the nomadic orcs nor the ravaging Northlanders, these people were interested in dialogue. Are they trying to negotiate mere surrender? The prince feared. He sat in front of the governor quietly as he began to speak of his story. Governor White recounted the events leading up to their meeting from their first planned fall to the attack in Devico's mansion where the youth soldiers first met him. I have to say, your highness, personally confronting my men on your horseback is very courageous of you. I am honestly surprised you yourself handled the first talks with our soldiers instead of someone more qualified in the arts of diplomacy other than a battle-cladded prince such as the way you presented yourself three days ago, the governor commented, well when I heard those thunderous noises from your loud sticks of yours, I was inspecting the city garrison, it sounded like a large-scale mage fight to everyone. When magic wielders go to fight each other a lot of destruction comes up and about. I have seen fires, ice spikes and poisoned wells to know that I have stop it. So I rallied most of the guards and rushed to the source of all of those noises which is Devico's mansion. Then I met your soldiers I am a man who prefers to lead from the front. The Rian family men are honored for their bravery in the face of battle, he said. I can't blame you for harboring such fears, but in our world, that is considered reckless and downright stupid, but that's our culture and not mine so I will respect it despite that fact, the governor said. The prince leaned his head on his closed fist as he absorbed Jeremy's words, judging by his vocabulary, these UFE foreigners were nothing close to barbarians, yet these were still fully armed aliens intruding his land. Brother, are you okay? Princess Aria tugged his side. I am fine please sit down and don't move. So, 
Let's address the reason why I am here now. You are trespassing in my principality one way or the other. And as the Prince of Tyrian I would like you to leave the bounds of the Empire. Clovich rigidly said. I am afraid we cannot do that. Sienna denied. You know, I will have to send my army down on you. He threatened. And did you know what we did to Divico and his bandits? If you do that this entire home of yours will be a battleground and devastated beyond measure. We are ahead of you in the technological race in every possible way. You, your men, the Empire and most of all, your people will be dragged into a pointless war where nobody will win. Do you want that? The director reasoned, but as of the moment, me and my lieges are seeing you as a threat. How can I stand to them knowing I let armed intruders within the Empire's borders? He grunted at the UFE. The prince was ready to fight for his home if it comes down to it here and now. I'm losing him. Looks like I got to use Iris blackmail or any chances of peace will go down the drain. Jeremy clutched himself. Silenced engulfed the table as tensions ran high. Then a laugh disturbed it from none other than Iris. You amuse me with all of your empire talk. How about I can? We can talk about something that will change your mind? but it's for you and your sister's ears only. Dismiss your nobles for now. Only the two of you here. Iris said. Clovich remembered what the vampire told him in the last few days of knowing his most compromising secret. He swallowed himself in utter terror as he was being pulled around like a puppet as if the spirit of Divico's conniving advances breathed lively at Iris. With no other choice, the prince temporarily dismissed all of his entourage except for his sister Arya. When he was left alone, the vampire continued. You keep saying that about your loyalties and oaths are strong between you and the Empire, but I... We all know that isn't the case. Iris confidently began her blackmailing statement. What are you saying? That I am disloyal? That I would betray my liege lords? The prince resisted her advances. No, you're not completely disloyal per se. What you are doing for the sake of your only remaining family is quite noble of you. Isn't one of the principal words of the Tyrian's heraldry say family? Iris continued. Quite noble indeed. Sienna commented. Nice save Iris. Jeremy whispered. It's for my necklace. She discreetly replied sourly. Yes, I am loyal to my sister. I would do everything for her own well-being. The prince confessed. Princess Arya gave a discreet smile in response to her brother's words, which is why you spy for the Entente in exchange for remedies, albeit temporary ones to make her walk again. Iris accused finishing her compromising statement. The prince internally collapsed. His darkest secret revealed. He had hoped that when Divico's organization had fallen, that his secret would die with it. He covered his face in shame as he sunk down to the table unable to face anyone. Brother, is that true? How? How could you? Arya questioned. The unbelief in her shocked expression made Governor White sick to the stomach that he was resorting to such an underhanded and Machiavellian tactic to secure peace. I did it for you Arya. I hated seeing you in your room every day looking outside of your window seeing the other girls run, skip, dance and play. Mother and father and I thought you were just a late bloomer when it comes to taking your first steps. Then you became two years old, then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven. I had to see you every single day from the day you were born watching you sit by your chair staring at the window of the open land outside. I saw the despair and hopelessness in you every time you have to be carried by one of my knights from one place to another. I gave you those elven medicines because I wanted you to be happy. He explained himself. The youth leaders noticed that his voice was cracking up as tears fell from his eyes. You risked your life for our home. Our status. For me? She said with widened and teary eyes begging for his answers. Yes. He yelled as he grabbed his sister and hugged her tightly. The two blue bloods cried and wailed loudly as the youth delegation gave them the courtesy to let their emotions free. They savored their brother-sister moment for over five minutes until their sobbing was reduced to heavy breathing and sniffling of noses. So, what happens now? Will you rat me out to the Empire? Tie me hands up and be your puppet like Divico. He turned to the youth accepting his fate. Oh, your highness. Where we come from. Those options are the least beneficial for both you and us. 
The governor said, you care for your sister I respect that and honor a man with strong family bonds. So, what do you want? Why tell me my secret? What will you do to me? Just spare my sister and the people. The prince asked. There is always another option your highness and it's through us. Are you interested? Sieno asked. What is this another option you speak of? He inquired. Dr. Governor White yelled. Hana emerged herself outside and walked towards the table whilst brandishing a baton-like device on her hand. She quietly approached the princess tenderly softly introducing herself. From the visage he sees in the Korean doctor she has the face of an angel and the motherly love of an angel sent from heaven. Please let don't move. Hana said to Princess Arya. What is that thing you are holding? She asked. Something to help me see. Hana answered in the best possible way she can explain her portable medical diagnosis scanner. The doctor slowly probed every single inch of the princess from top to bottom. Arya didn't dare disturb the doctor as the bright green laser line scanned her frame. Before she knew it however, Dr. Lee Hainanel backed away. Summoning a hologram from her hands she analyzed the results of her data. Okay, muscles good but pretty weak. Digestive dot just fine dot circulatory. Healthy dot respiratory. Also healthy dot nervous dot nothing out of the ordinary dot excretory. Doing fine. Reproductive. Can bear a child. Lymphatic. Clean dot and skeletal. Oh my god. Hana froze. What is it? Governor White. Hana walked around the table to the other side to approach to the colonial leaders with her results. I know why she can't walk just as what the prince described. Look at these bones. She said passing the pictures of Arya's x-rays to him. They are curvy. He said in astonishment. That is definitely not normal. Iris said looking over the governor's shoulders. No wonder he keeps feeding the elves information for those remedies. They were made to help people as pain relievers and promote bone healing. It's just at its effect weighing on more permanent disorders. Iris said, I got to give it up to him. I hate to see my daughter grow up like this. Colonel Polonsky commented. So what now? Hanu asked. Tell the prince we can reach a mutual agreement and we can help each other and his sister. The governor ordered. Hana turned back to the prince and his sister as they looked at them anxiously. With a warm smile on her face Hana declared the good news. Your Highness, I am pleased to inform you that we have to means to make your sister walk and stand up straight indefinitely. You can? He stuttered to take in the doctor's good news. Yes, first off we know why your sister can't walk. Although we cannot immediately cure her right now. I can make the arrangements for her treatment as soon as possible. Hana promised. Thank you. You don't know what this means to me and my family. I will do anything you ask right now. What do you wish? He knelt down to the governor and looked at him in awe by the mysterious stranger's generosity. What we all wanted from the beginning. Peaceful coexistence with you and our people. That is what the name of our ship the Eoden means to live together in harmony. All I ask is you letting us stay here. And I can add to sweeten the deal, I can share with you and your people a portion of our farm's harvests and believe me you will want try out some of our food. You will love it, guaranteed. Oh, and Devico's mansion. That's our property now in the city that we will use to see fit to our needs. The governor detailed his demands. That I can agree with. It's a deal. He happily exclaimed. Good to hear. Go get your little entourage back in and let's sign our treaty. Director De Popper smiled. The prince summoned his people who were turned away earlier to attend him again. Hold on. What should we name our colony? We can't just call ourselves the Eodem anymore right? I got a name for the city now. Has been around in my head. It's named after the city where the ship was first built and then launched from. Polonsky suggested. Whilst they gathered. The youth colonial leaders prepared the document which details the agreements of the first Terran Tyrian Gleesian Treaty signed on the June 5, 2218. It is summarized as this. The Principality of Tyrian shall recognize the independent settlement of New Albany with its own leaders, laws and territory. Non-aggression pact between the people of Tyrian and New Albany trade agreement of goods and services from New Albany to be sold within Tyrian, hunting permission for specimens in the Verdon Valley Forest, 
access to the Terrian Library for study of their books, leasing of the property titled Devico's Mansion in the city of Terrian. At first, the Tyrian nobles were reluctant at first of signing a treaty without the permission of their slaves and masters' approval but after much persuasion of the great benefits that the youth can offer to them, they accepted. Prince Klovich swore to Governor White that he will send them the details and he hopes that the Emperor when he sees the benefits of these earth humans will gladly join them in the progression of their civilization's progression. But as the nobles signed their names alongside the youth leaders, toasted and cheered to themselves in friendship, a vigilant shadow looked onto them in dread by the sight of the leader's celebration. It was one of Princess Arya's ladies of waiting. The woman faded into the shadows of the newly named colony's metallic and concrete structures. The woman soon found herself in the middle of Quartali with no avenues of eavesdropping on her. She removed her headdress revealing her long and flowing golden hair and pointy tipped ears. The lady in waiting was actually none other than Aliathra in disguise. She had a hunch when Prince Klovich came back a few days about a meeting with a group of foreigners and he has requested that Arya come with her. Sporting the clothes of one of Arya's own ladies in waiting and covering her head off of its elven features she infiltrated the meeting and eavesdropped at the meeting with the help of a magic spell that allows her to hear from long distance, perfect for spying and reconnaissance for a ranger-trained individual such as herself. Aliathra summoned a discreet amount of her magic from her hands to form a magically created messenger bird nicknamed a tweeter. The conjured being can deliver voice messages between users and send them flying to where and whomever the magic wielders wish to be sent to. With panicked tears coming from her face, Aliathra prayed worriedly to the elven gods for protection. As she whispered her message to the tweeter, Petra. The plan has failed. The demons have arrived. The elf threw the bird up into the sky with all her feminine might. The creature soared higher and flew away from her and New Albany with her distressed mission. To a normal person, the distance between them and the altitude where most birds fly, the tweeter looked no different to a grey-coloured pigeon. After leaving her sight, Aliathra ditched her disguise and fled to the Verdon Valley Forest to hold out until further orders from the Adventurer's Guild returns to her. She will have to survive on her own through the game of the forests and the waters of the rivers instead of relying on one of her old servants back home. As she fled away from the settlement unnoticed thanks to her elven swiftness, the leaders back in the meeting toasted to each other and made themselves merry. To peace and friendship for all. Director Sienna toasted, to peace. Everyone responded as they downed their glasses of celebratory champagne. As the prince drank the alcohol, he deep down in his heart and soul that he has made the right choice that will carve the Terrian principality from obscurity to a greatness that not even his forbearer's wildest dreams could conceive, for good or ill, he and his people have just made it to the youth's history books as the first, formal. Contact with aliens was a resounding success. Chapter 9, A New Day, A New Purpose The sun rose that day in Tyrian or more specifically the youth colony New Albany as the Root family prepare for a new day. Abidara's wife, Leah had spent the early morning dark time of that day packing foodstuff into the truck. The Root family farmstead had several vegetables that were in stock before their trip across space that they keep as spare food to be eaten or sold for trade. They range from corn, tomatoes, bell peppers and red chilies. The family, once they got their greenhouse running will be planting and harvesting these foods around the clock. Ms. Root hoped that she can sell the produce in the weekly farmer's market in Tyrian that day. With the help of her husband they boarded over a dozen crates into the truck. Are we ready to go? Abidaya asked from behind the driver's seat. Yeah honey that's all of them. Leah smiled. Mommy, I am going to school now. April exclaimed as she barged outside, surprising her parents. You have fun and stay safe in elementary dear. Her mother waved goodbye. The only child of the Root family kissed both of her parents in the cheek before she ran off to her school, which at least temporarily will be held inside the EO Dem until construction will be complete. As Abidaya was about to start his truck for his trip, his radio called. Hey Abed, you ready for the day? Ken said as he pulled over the Strider Group's land cruiser behind the truck. Yeah. 
Hey this market shit got me beat. Say the plan again LT? Asked a bee dyer. We're going to check out this adventurer's guild building Iris talks about. Says that it contains quests that relays the problems and other things that happens around Tyrion. Command wants us to gain the trust of the natives and to acquire currency and materials from within the youth's new frontier and to be honest with you guys. We might have to redefine it with all these aliens we be seeing. Ken relays. The engineer restarted the engine of the land cruiser as he began to follow the root family truck towards the friendly medieval fantasy city. Do we have call the humans born here aliens? I mean they are basically us, right? Crocker questioned as he ducked below the machine gun port. Yeah but by definition they are not of our origins Lewis. I don't even know why and how this can be even possible. Ken questioned himself. He lowered his head down to the driver's wheel in confusion before focusing again on the road. Well, after the guild we can pass by the library. I think they keep some old textbooks about Gleesia you would love to hear. Iris proposed. That sounds great Iris. You know guys, what does this seems to be like the beginning of a Final Fantasy game? Samantha said. What makes you say that LT? Asked Ken asked. Well, we are in a fantasy world first of all. We need to understand the lore and creatures that inhabit this planet. Then we go do quests and gain experience and that shit. I am still quite the geek even after officer school. Samantha said. Ha. Huh. Throw in a dragon keeping treasure and a pretty princess or a demon lord trying to start the apocalypse and it's definitely a final fantasy game. Crocker commented. Wait if that's the case. That means you're the party leader? Vincent questioned. Yes. No do what I say thief. She spitefully hissed, making the penal soldier cringe as he recoiled backwards. What is this final fantasy you are talking about? Iris interrupted. Buckle up that seatbelt Iris. I am gonna tell you a story from my childhood. Samantha smiled nostalgically. Dash sometime later in Devico's mansion now owned by the youth. Dash. After much cleaning and rearrangement by the youth the other day to make way for their new property. Devico's mansion now called Little Earth Emporium as nicknamed by some of the soldiers, was now good as new as if the intense battle several days ago never happened. Several farmers, craftsmen and even a few prospective restaurateurs have begun to set up shop. The youth government has told them that the best way to make a name for ourselves amongst the natives was via cultural exchange and what better way than showing the unique products that Earth has to offer? Divigo's old mansion will have two new purposes. First it will become a shop that sells earth products like food, clothes, tools and other useful items that within reason by the Gleesian population will both need and want to get their hands on. The second function the property has is to house what will essentially be the youth's embassy to the planet, for now the acting ambassador will be Governor Jeremy White. The Bearcats back in Earth are still deciding whether to export an anthropologist from the Core Worlds or choose among the colonists to be appointed that position. Many curious onlookers gathered around the mansion where the infamous bandit lord lived initially at first due to their amazement of how quickly the youth cleaned up their mess, which they insist on doing themselves, in over a day in what in the Gleesians based on their current technology would take a week without the expensive services of a mage. At the gate where days ago a heroic and mighty stranger held it open which the locals call that hero Ogre Breaker. The said gate that kept Bandit from the oppressed people separate was now completely removed. All that separated the locals was a blue ribbon that sealed between the gate's archway. The Emporium's hastily formed security team urged the folks to back off. There will be a grand opening of the Little Earth Emporium that Prince Clovich will attend. The youth security guards are now working in tandem with the Tyrian city guards to keep the crowd under control as the prince cuts the ribbon commencing the opening of the once forbidden property in the middle of the city. In an orderly or as best as security can allow by the best of their ability, the people from commoners and nobility alike flooded the mansion's halls to be greeted in a grand bazaar that filled all five of their senses. There was a farmer's section which is normal for the Tyrians to see that day due to it being farmer's market day which, unlike their farmers were selling foodstuff that nobody has ever seen before like tomatoes, 
corn, peppers and even mangoes. Another section was dedicated to more material goods such as clothes and tools. Then the best part of the Emporium was a makeshift restaurant with tables and a menu displaying several of Earth's favorite food like burgers, pizza and even some sushi. Can I grow this in my farm? inquired a farmer when he held an ear of corn on his hand to one of the shopkeepers. These pants a stretchy, a man said as he pulled the pair of jogging pants to test its endurance. Wow! This hamburger is delicious. I must have the recipe. A nobleman commented positively as he digged his mouth in the sandwich. Samantha aimed her camera at the gathered crowd looking to get some shots of the grand opening for herself. She snapped pictures from a respectable distance in order to not scare the gleesons with her picture taking. Initially she only had her personal photo camera for taking small snippets of her tour of duty to post in her social media but now she has, unofficially been the photographer of all of Gleesia's sights and wonders. Samantha felt amused undertaking the role of documenting her travels around the planet. Hey, Rose. I finished helping my wife set up shop. Let's go to that guild building. A bee dyer interrupted her. That's great to hear. Everyone let's move out, she called. Strider group gathered themselves together and move out with Iris leading the way. They slowly made their out of the mansion grounds to the city streets outside, unlike before where they would hide their gear and clothing from the native populations, the youth soldiers wore them out in the open with pride as they strolled down Tyrian streets. People would turn their heads at the foreign warriors in astonished curiosity as they reached the guild building which was down the street from the Emporium. The Adventurer's Guild building was about the size of a normal suburban home of two floors with windows and a wooden front door. It held out a sign at the entrance showing the insignia of the Grey Order slash Adventurer's Guild being a cross section between a piece of paper with written gibberish and sword signifying that this building provides quests. The squad entered the building together to be greeted in a quiet reception room. The first floor contained a desk where a lone man slept soundly on his chair. A giant notice board filled with papers of news, bounties and other important information and a statue black colored statuette of a veiled figure with several lighted candles surrounding it. Upon the second floor was more lackluster being just a few bunk beds and some tables and chairs reserved for full-time guild members. Ear are oh people, oh my, the man on the desk awoke to their presence. He scrambled to stand up and put up a fake smile as he leaned over his desk. Welcome. Welcome to the Adventurer's Guild Tyrian branch. I am the guild manager of this proud establishment. The name is Flynn. He smiled. Tell me stranger, are you looking for quests or are posting some of your own? He asked. Just looking around for some quests sir. Samantha answered. Hey, you are those foreign warriors that took down Devico. Flynn asked. Indeed. I was the one who commanded the whole thing too. Samantha replied, you got the makings of a leader miss. So, you are interested in the quests quite a number around these parts. Take a look and see what interests you and if you ask, I can also give you some of the talk of the town although right now, it's mostly about you folks right now. I mean holding a gate open, only ogres can match up like that. Flynn said, thanks for the compliment. Crocker smiled. No problem ogre breaker. He grinned. Samantha turned to the right of the notice board and began to examine it. However, the words were in the Gleesian alphabet so she couldn't comprehend what she is looking at. Iris, can you read these? She turned to Iris, the vampire witch raised her feet up as she looked at the notice board written in her native language in every possible inch. She scanned over a dozen pin papers as she absorbed the information into her brain. As the girls looked on at the board, Diaz leaned himself close to the candle-lit statue nonchalantly. Hey don't come in close to that unless you're placing a candle. Flynn shouted. The ex-thief recoiled as the guild manager walked towards him and tended the statue. Oh Lord Thames, God of the Death forgive me. Flynn prayed as he fixed the statue and took away the burnt out candles. This is a shrine? I'm sorry. I thought it was just for show. Diaz apologized. 
It's okay but please don't go near my Lord Tam's statuette unless you're going to light a candle. Flynn replied. Diaz looked down at the black veiled figurine for a moment before turning his head back to the guild manager again. So those candles, are they representing people? Diaz asked. Yes, sad to say this but yes. Some of the quests on the board have taken several lives and the people are getting desperate for some help. Flynn replied. Desperate how? Samantha asked from across the room. Flynn walked back towards Samantha and placed his fingers on one of the pinned papers on the notice board to present it to her. Take a look at this one. He pointed. This bounty is asking for some extermination by the swamp near the Verdon Valley Forest. It's bask of sea devils. The folks there will pay some good money for their teeth and meat. I sent this pretty blonde lass with a shiny looking bow the other day on this quest too. Flynn explained. As illustrated in the poster. The sea devil is an alligator-like creature with fish-like fins propping its sides and back. The front body of the creature rose upright creating a neck and giving the creature a height advantage compared to their down-to-earth comparison. I live. I mean I used to go to the swamp nearby to harvest the mushrooms there. Those things can grow to around 8 feet. Iris said. 8 feet? Samantha exclaimed. Yes, and I heard that they have a poisonous bite thanks to their saliva. Can't kill you in an hour. Iris added. That's scary to hear. Samantha lowered her voice and the paper. Before she was about to reject the quest, a bee dire interrupted her. I think I can take it, he said. Really a bed? You can hunt some of these down? They look actually pretty life-threatening, Samantha said. I can take care of myself. Besides, the Hunters Association probably will appreciate some of the exotic monsters I will be hunting down here. Although, I could use some help. Iris, you said you know the swamp, there right? Can you take me there? Abidaya asked. I don't think I can go with you because I have to be with Samantha all the time when I am outside New Albany. But I can mark it on that. Yum GPS gizmo you use as a map. Iris acknowledged. It is a map Iris. Abed corrected her and Diaz. Can you be my partner? I could use some extra firepower. He then turned to the ex-thief. Me? On one of your hunts? Really? He asked. Yeah. It will be fun. You could use some outdoors. Besides you do get them Augusts right, so you can easily run away if they get to close. Tomorrow is a Saturday and it's our day off so we can split the cash between ourselves. Abida proposed. Well, other than pissing myself on the bar on that day, all right let's kill some crocodiles. He smiled. Well good luck to both of you. And Diaz, don't try to run away now since you can understand there locals now she pointed out and lose my supply of bio cells won't even dream he denied her with a hint of snark okay that's one down to you guys flynn by any chance you have a quest that doesn't involve monstrous creatures preferably within the city samantha asked yes i do it's relatively easy and safe the drunken bastard inn is going to hold a show in their place tomorrow night and they need some bouncers We'll pay good money and free food to any applicants, Flynn said. The drunken bastard? We are actually friends with the owner. Maybe he can let us be the bouncers, Samantha said. Luya Amirian? You're friends with him? That's pretty neat of you. Just go up to the guy and ask if it's okay with him that he throws the responsibility of the drunken bastard security to him. Flynn smiled. Well looks like while you guys are going out hunting we will be bouncing back in the bastard. Crocker said. Well have fun and don't drink the beer. Diaz waved. Happy hunting then to you. And good luck. Kane said. All right that settles it everyone for our first quests. Let's head back to the Emporium, Samantha said. A.I. My wife's corn on the cobs are on me for the day. Abidaya smiled. Dash meanwhile back in Herring Point. Dash. Petcher. The plan has failed. The demons have arrived, said the projected virtual image of Aliath Revire her tweet a spell bird. The magic knight became shaken with denial and horror as he heard the elven princess's grim news. With him at the Grey Order's HQ in Herring Point was his colleagues Carlia, Mitu and Findrim alongside with them Grandmaster Owen. Their faces too were of utter dismay. We have. Failed? Carlia softly lamented. Tears of her first failure trickled down her cheeks. So. The end times are here? Mita commented. 
I knew we should have killed that metal demon as soon as we saw it. Findrim grumbled. The plan should have worked. The illusion. What did we do wrong? Owen despaired. Dash flashback about a week before planned fall dash. A gathering of over 1,000 of the Conclave's best illusion mages plus an escort of the Empire's best paladins have gathered in Tyrion's Verdon Valley that day. After getting permission from Prince Clovich for a study group field trip in his lands, the Grey Order members and their Conclave friends readied themselves for the so prophesied eye that Owen obsessively foretold its coming. They have camped out at the field for about three nights waiting for a sign of the demon's arrival. Grandmaster are you sure the first demons will be here? Asked Pecha. I saw it come down from the heavens like a falling star. As it makes land, it will follow a great explosion creating a crater from where it arrived. Then it will see the world for souls to feast upon. Remember the plan is to prevent it from seeing the world as filled with souls. Owen said reminding the plan to Owen. Is everyone ready? It could arrive at any minute, the wizard asked. Carlia and Aliathra are preparing the crystals as we speak. Findrum has his blades ready and Mita has been scouting the forests for anything out of the ordinary. Petra reported, that is very good to hear Sir Eric Dorf. pray to the gods that. Just as Owen was to bless Petra with his wishes and prayers, the entire camp felt a great convulsion that knocked many unsuspecting Imperial off their feet. Falling down to ground in shock from the great seismic disturbance, Owen could only freeze in hysteria. They dot a dot here, he cried. Get a hold of yourself. Pedger knocked back Owen's senses together with two light slaps to return him to reality. The demons? Pecha exclaimed. Yes, where did that earthquake come from? Owen asked. The two ran out of their tent with their feet barely upright to only be embraced by a panicked campsite. With men screaming and running away, from up above, the two spotted smoke rising from their west followed by a red-yellowish glow. Just as they were about to follow the source of the fire, Petra noticed that his colleague Carlia, their elven ally Elie threw and standing frozen at the sight of the unnatural fire. Carlia, get the mages and the crystals now. Petra ordered. Why yes. Let's go. Carlia led it. She waved her hands to her fellow mages as they followed her lead. The heroes hurried themselves towards the source of the red glowing smoke until they ran beyond the edges of the camp to the open field. There was a sense of anxiety between everyone since nobody but Findrim the monster hunting dwarf had experience fighting demons. It is said that demons possess immeasurable strength, speed and endurance that only the strongest of people can even hope to keep up with. Legends spoke of names of several demons that can challenge the gods of their world in combat. Some are known to cause volcanoes to erupt in terrible anger. Another can cause widespread diseases, and some of the worst can pierce your soul and make you turn against everything you had held dear with immense hatred until their humanity is lost forever. Guild mission dashed themselves across the empty field until the red-yellow glow grew brighter and brighter until they spotted a large crater from where the smoke arose from. The Grey Order halted their advance as they readied themselves. Findrum unsheathed his custom-made axes made from special monster bane metal or otherwise known as silver ready to fight what could be his greatest prey yet. On from the front and back lines, the mages summoned up their magic from their hands wands and staffs ready to conjure the pivotal spell needed for the plan, if of course this eye demon doesn't come with an escort of its own. Yet even then, all of the Gleasons in that field that day were all equally nervous. The only noise they could hear was their quiet breathing and the crackling of the fire coming from the crater, until they heard the sounds of chinking and chipping from the craters as if something was trying to climb out of it. Hit the illusions now. No traces of anything. Owen ordered. Carlia, Aliathra, and all the mages that followed tapped their powers from the hastily grabbed crystals back from camp to form the virtual image of an empty world with no signs of sentient life or civilization. The mages hoped that they can fool the demon with their spell. They surrounded the crater in a circle to form the illusionary mirror image, which their magic's outlining traces formed the dome that surrounded the crater in a 360 degree view of its surrounding. From out of the crater, the shape of a shadow emerged, 
At first the Umbra figure gave the designs of an alien-like beast with a long neck but as the image got closer to getting out of the crater, the shadow reduced in size to the childlike height of no more than five feet. It is the eyes of the demons from my visions Owen oh, dreaded fearfully, after a few more moments of hearing the chinking and chipping of dirt, the shadow of the demon finally emerged and everyone held their breath for their first encounter with the demonic kind. By the gods. What are you? Were the words Petra could only mutter softly as the creature emerged. The interloper's skin was made of metal painted in gleaming silver that reflects like the gleaming towers of the elves of Alphalnora's towers. The rest of its body was even more alien than the metallic skin, it had a single eye at the center of its round vase-like body which looks almost lifelike yet at the same time is uncannily deceased. At the bottom of its round body is several tiny arms in differing shapes that not even their world's greatest engineers can decipher its purposes. From the bottom of its is it raised itself from the ashes, to the shock of the Gleasons. It can fly without any visible wings attached despite hearing the obvious fluttering sound of wings, which beats abnormally fast. That's the eye? Findrum questioned. It's rather tiny for a demon. He added, well it's more of a scout than a fighter. Petra said, the pint-sized metal demon began to float forwards to the Imperial's position alarming them. Did it see through it? Carly anxiously asked the Grand Master. I don't think so. It's not acting erratically and trying to charge like what most demons do. Have the mages move backwards while they maintain the dome? Owen ordered. Carly acknowledged and slowly she, Aliathra and the rest of the mages slowly moved backwards. Whenever the demon moved, the mages would move in a synchronized fashion. Nervousness run abound by the Imperials as every time the alien being paused in its tracks, its oddly shaped arms would probe the ground or plant life it comes near off, was it? Trying to smell for mortal souls, it's rather calm. For a demon, it doesn't even look like it needs to breathe, Aliathra said. You got that right princess. Findrum nodded, after much probing of the ground and plants. The metal demon started to float towards the Imperial's camp. Alarmed, Owen ordered the soldiers to dismantle the camp. Every rope, nail, cloth, campfires and every man-made object were hastily hidden away as the illusional demon made its way through what was their camp. Dash meanwhile in youth space somewhere outside Benham 3 slash Gleasia Dash. It was another routine mission for the youth planetary surveyor corps. The operators in the control room leisurely sipped their coffee and blankly stared at the screens. They have sent out one of their probing drones to the planet Benham 3. Their assignment, scout out a given coordinates for the future landing of the EODEM colony ship. It was a boring job of just inputting commands to the probe to collect samples and observe the surroundings. As the operators looked at their viewing screens, all they could see was just the verdant hills of grass and a forest full of trees that look familiar to the ones grown back at Earth. Everywhere the drone goes and does its sample collection, it only further pointed that the planet was just another Earth-like planet with nothing special or cautionary from what the probe reported via its data uplink to their computers. Looks empty, nothing but trees and grass everywhere. Man. I can't wait to get off this damn station and get some fresh air, the control operator said placing his hand behind his head as he lazily leaned back from his reclining chair. Should we get the probe back to the ship? His colleague next to him asked. May, it's going to be decommissioned anyway for better droids. Have the colony salvage it up when they drop. He shot down. The operator grabbed a telephone that was near his workstation and dialed a phone number. Hello. This is Matter Station. Tell Colonial Affairs that the EODEM has its drop site. The drop site is clear for plant fall. The operator said. After dropping the phone, he turned back to his workstation and pressed the command for the probing drone to shut down. Dash back in Gleasia, Tyrian Principality Dash. The metal demon, after much floating and digging around the now cleared camping grounds that is devoid of any signs of civilization suddenly fell down dead much to the surprise of the Grey Order. They approached its carcass carefully until they are all pointing their weapons and magic at point-blank melee range. Is it... dead? Kalaya asked. 
Findrum emerged from the crowd of soldiers and with a might downward thrust of his silver axe he split the demon in two, exposing mild electric currents that discharged from the corpse and strangely colored blood vessels from within. The blood vessels were colored blue, red and yellow yet instead of bleeding liquid it bled electricity. Mages contained that thing. Owen ordered it to be sealed with holy magics and to be transported to a demonologist for study. What happened? It just died just like that? Petra questioned. Well demons need souls to feed upon to survive. Since we casted an illusion in order to fool it to think that this place is devoid of souls. Aliathra began to reason. It couldn't find anything to feed on so it fell dead from hunger. Carlyle concluded. And since if it can't find any souls. Findrim continued their deduction. The demons will have no reason to invade because they think there is no souls to consume. We did it. We prevented the apocalypse. Owen cheered. Everyone began to join along in the Grand Master's delight as they hugged and tossed around their helmets and hats to the air in celebration. Thanks to the Grey Order's brilliant plan of deceiving an eldritch demon but cancelled the fall of their beloved empire. Petra hugged Carlyle and Findrum in a mighty grasp and thanked them for their help. Yet he noticed that the elven princess Aliathra was slowly walking away from them during the middle of their revelry. Letting go of his colleagues, Petra managed to tap the princess back before she got too far. Hey, stay with us. We can drink and eat together like friends between two partners. My empire and your entente, their faithful diplomatically said, reminding her of the positive relationship between their two nations. Petra marveled at her ethereal beauty. No other woman he knows or heard of could match the beauty of the female elves from the continent of Alphalnora. Even a humble elf commoner could not compare to the noble women of the Stla Aegean Empire in terms of vanity and elegance. From the moment he first lay his eyes on Aliathra, he could only stare in awe at her. I have finished what I was sent to do. I helped your order prevent the apocalypse so I'm done here. I'll stock up on some supplies and say hello to an old family friend before I depart for Alphalnora. Aliathra politely declined. She gracefully turned her back and walked away from the magic knight leaving him behind. Petra lay his head down in shame that his attempts of possibly pursue courtship with the elven princess was turned down. Yet, for some reason, judging from the tone of her voice, there was something suspicious about her. There goes that elf of on their mysterious ways. Owen said walking up beside him. Grandmaster, when Mita comes back, tell her that I want her spies to keep an eye out on Aliathra. Petra said. Why? Owen asked. I don't know but my instincts say she is up to something. I can't tell what. Petra said. Dash back in the present time, Dash. The plan was supposed to work. Owen flipped the tables and scattered dozens of papers and ink that spilled on the marble floors. Mita. I told you to keep an eye on the elf. What else happened to her? Petra accused the crow. I told you again. My spies in the city tracked her until she reached the Clovich's castle then we lost track of her. That's all I could say. Maybe she was on to us. Mita defended herself. That's besides the point. But does the elf princess know something that we don't? Petra questioned. That I do not know. But judging from her tweet a bird, maybe she does. Not from when we last saw her. But now maybe she does know something. She is still in Tyrion as of this message's dispatching Carlyle deducted. So, the apocalypse is indeed happening now. Findrim depressingly lowered his head fearing the inevitable. Hold on. Maybe it was just a mistake. Or some sort of poor communication. Aliathra does look rather distressed from the way she spoke so quickly on her message. Perhaps we just need to confirm with her on the details. Then we can decide on a course of action. Carla mediated the group from descending into despair. You, you, are right. We can't afford to be emotional now. Owen calmed himself. Indeed Grandmaster. Meter, I want you try and track down Aliathra again in Tyrian. Check for inns, pubs, the guild building there for any signs of her. Owen. I need you to relay to the Imperial Legions of the News, have them mobilize near the borders of Tyrian and wait for further orders from us. Make sure they prepare for a demon invasion. Holy water, blessed bolts, relics, demon bane, anything they can get their hands on. If these demons are indeed pouring from Tyrian, 
we must contain them there. No demons shall invade the empire while we still breathe. Pecha exclaimed. Everyone in the room raised their hands in salute at the heroic magic knight in defiance to fate. They may have failed to prevent the apocalypse of their world, but they will, no matter the costs push the demons back from all that they love and hold dear. Chapter 10, Open Season Two olive-garbed individuals slogged themselves across the marshy grounds of the Verdon Valley Forest. They were both armed with hunting gear ranging from a rifle, high-caliber pistols, a shotgun and their camouflage garments, and they were on the prowl for the creatures dubbed Sea Devils. Having to relinquish his normal cabine to the armory that day, Diaz was left slightly annoyed not being able to wield his preferred firearm and resort to using a B. Diaz spare KSG shotgun with slug ammunition that he lends to him for the day. The swamp the two youth soldiers who happened to be taking one of the adventurers guild's quests today on their day off for some money that the two agreed to split their whatever earnings they can obtain today. Shit a bed. The stench. Diaz complained. He covered his nose by pinching it with hit fingers as he continued moving forward. You're such a city boy kid. Take some of the outdoor smell. A bee dyer replied. Their surroundings were of large fungus infested trees whose roots looked like they were tiptoeing away from as much swamp water from their feet. Swamp reeds and lily pads painted the water in a murky green that with a naked eye, nobody could see anything beyond an inch. It was a dreary locale that would naturally be home to such a vile creature named the Sea Devil. The only comforting sight in this godforsaken place were the glowing flora and fauna found beneath the trees ranging from mushrooms, flowers and what looked like fireflies that glow a bright blue rather than the earth native orange color that the youth are familiar with. Keep your eye on the scanner boy. I don't want any surprises you hear me. A bee dial instructed. Yeah got it Diaz nodded. He looked onto his attached scanning equipment next to his shotgun and observed the device. It worked as both a sonar device and a parabolic heartbeat sensor that can detect the faintest of heartbeats from the bradycardic, slow heartbeat, sea devils, if their similarity to alligators and crocodile is correct. Hang on, hundred meters, east. Something big is happening, Diaz said spotting a disturbance from his scanner. Alarmed by the detection. The two slowly moved east with their fingers on their triggers. Every second they are inside the swamp and every step they took could risk the possibility of one of the vile beasts ambushing them. Any form of help will likely be factored as irrelevant due to the hostile nature of the swamp when it comes to navigation. The survival of the two hunters rests upon their equipment and their own wits. After a grueling stretch across the soft and watery ground, a bee dyer raised his hand signaling his partner to halt. The two knelt down and hid behind a tree that concealed their positions as they looked forward. The hunter silently gestured his fingers to his two eyes and then pointed forward signaling his inexperienced partner to observe what is ahead of them. Diaz peeked over the tree and spotted what the pair came to this secluded hellhole. It was a singular sea devil standing alone in some wet land. Its back was turned against them as it was eating the corpse of an unfortunate stag. Take the shot, Diaz whispered. A bee dyer strafed to his right under the cover of the swamp's trees to get a better shot at the beast. He repositioned himself until he got a full view of the creature's right side without getting detected. Peering through Leah's scope, a bee dyer held his breath to aim, his crosshairs aimed Santa Mass hoping to land a devastating lung shot to the creature on his first shot. He carefully squeezed the trigger and whoosh, bang. The sudden sound of sharp flight erupted from across the left side of the monster at the same time a bee dyer pulled the trigger. In one instant. The sea devil collapsed face first dead on the ground, what the hell? Abidaya questioned himself as he stood up from his hiding spot and approached the sea devil corpse. Vincente also emerged from his position to observe the kill with him. Hey you heard that? Diaz asked. Yeah, I don't know what that was though. Abidaya commented. He looked at the corpse to get his first real look on his quarry. The entry point from where a bed shot him was a about an inch in diameter and the hunting ammo that he used should have made quick work of the monster's vital organs the instant the kinetic energies of that point three zero eight lapua bullet made contact. Look over here, what the Diaz stuttered, crossing over the corpse, 
Abidaya soon found what was the penal soldier was looking at. It was an arrow that punctured around the same mirror imaged area where he shot the sea devil. However, the arrow was of a strange design. It wasn't made of a primitive wooden body nor the aluminum kind. No it was made from some sort of sort of glass-like body with its translucency. The arrow emitted the same kind of magical energy patterns that Abidaya and Diaz observed seeing from Iris and other mages that inhabit the planet. As the two continued to curiously examine the affixed projectile, the mushy sounds of footsteps walking on swamplands hearkened behind them. I believe that is my sea devil. Move along Firen, said an elegantly feminine voice. The two turned around to see a young lithe woman standing behind them. She was proudly parading herself in her blue-colored garments that almost seductively, in an impractical sense by earth standard, v-neck that exposed the woman's cleavage and breastbone. There were several sections in her garbs that sported leather for protection, not that it the flimsy clothes can protect her from anything. Perhaps the clothes were meant for speed and maneuverability over safeguards to one's vital organs. The woman also wore a hood that hid her face adding to her mysteriousness ever since she unexpectedly made her presence known to the two questing hunters. For someone like them to be seeing a person dress like this, the only time they could ever recall someone else wearing clothes like that was in a cosplaying convention. Diaz couldn't help but keep his eyes on the woman in alluring clothes as she walked towards them. Your kill? No, I killed this thing first. The tongue is mine, argued a bee dire. Excuse me? But have you heard the most magnificent sound of my star firebow? That creature would easily fall down in one hit by the grace of my arrows. The woman answered back. Well so those my rifle. Point three hundred and eight lapua rounds. Will pretty much kill anything short of an elephant. A bee dire abutted. As the two continued to argue over who rightfully earned the recently slain beast as a trophy, Diaz looked down on his scanner to search for more sea devils to hunt down. So far, no disturbances at the moment. I do not know of this rifle you speak of but judging by that hideous thunder it produces it is just another crude magic staff. The woman dismisses. Magic staff? This is no staff or of magic. This sniper rifle had a development period of over 10 years in the making and made from the finest gunsmiths in and from the earth. Your bow is a weapon we have long abandoned millennia ago. He roared over the woman's offending statement. That thing looks like even a child can wield drunk and blind. My bow takes skill to take. And what is this earth you speak of? Another nation of fire in hind that I never heard of? Step aside for this beast contains my rightful reward. She snootily replied. The woman tried to move towards the deceased sea devil but Abidaya stepped into her way. No way you bitch. The United Federation of Earth has been active for over 150 plus years, and we have been expanding across the stars and aren't going to be stopped now by some kill-stealing bitch like you. Abidaya asserted. United Feder. Earth. You. You. The woman began to stutter. You heard of us miss? Diaz asked peering through his scanner's screen. You. The people that the prince met. She said. Indeed. We are lady. But we still have a problem with. Abidaya acknowledged the woman's questions but he and Diaz were greeted by a great flash of light conjured from the stranger's hands. Air Gallard. She yelled in a strange tongue unfamiliar to them. Iris language spell that she had provided to the youth so that they can easily communicate with the natives and be able to listen to what they say, only covered the Stlae Aegean Empire's dominant dialect called Vigori. To hear someone mixing Vigori and another alien language was a shocker to the two, but not as the shock of the woman who blinded them in a flashbang-like explosion. Clearing his eyes. Diaz recovered from the blast thanks to being used to encountering such measures in his experience of being a thief and getting flash banged by the local law enforcement. He even remembered being greeted to one the day he got arrested. As he restored the vision from his eyes, he can blurrily see that the mysterious woman drew her bow and loaded one of her starfire arrows into the arrow rest aiming at the still befuddled B. Dyer. With a quick reactivation of his rapid movement booster augmentation, Vincent dashed towards the woman in lightning fast speed. Aliath Respoff. At first, the elven princess thought that today was going to be another monotonous day of hunting down wild animals for food and money. 
She has been camping in the woods for a few days alone and is currently waiting for a reply from her colleagues back in the Empire to respond to her distress message. She has seen these people who came from the sky as told by the native Tyrian locals with her own two eyes. The way their leader White charmed the Prince of Tyrian with his honeyed words and their exorbitant promises of curing many of their world's various problems. Not even the greatest of mages from Eth Island to Herring Point can figure out such mysteries and yet these aliens simply dismounted from wherever in Gleesia or the void that they all come from and start telling everyone they meet that they can solve all of their problems. It sure sounds like a demon's work in conducting their temptations of the faithful masses. She will need to attempt an infiltration or the very least a scouting reconnaissance of this new Albany location that the outsiders have made their nerve center in Tyrian. But for now, she will need to provide for herself. So, she has taken up this quest from the local adventurer's guild building in hunting down several sea devils a native monster of Zanagrad the human continent's wetlands. She was told by the details of the quest that they only want the creature's deaths and they will pay some good money for every tongue presented to them. She can freely keep some of the meat for herself for her own nourishment. It wasn't as glamorous as the specially prepared food that she used to eat in the palace but it would keep her going with the great calorie content it provides. She still groaned at her predicament. The elf still longs for the piquant dishes her family's chefs would whip up to satisfy their cravings. Venison, fruit pies and grilled fish with sauce, she missed them all. Despite being a princess of the elven royal family, she was taught by the investment of her father to take care of herself. The elves of Alfilnora have been split into two distinct factions for centuries and all the children had to go through some sort of mandatory military service whether being a common foot soldier cavalry or even the more elite units such as the Eth Island Rangers that Aelia Throw had received training from thanks to the influence of her father. She has learned, outside of her natural abilities to heal, altercation of her body and surroundings, illusions and creating alchemical potions on the move. She has been trained in survival in hostile environments, archery proficiency and scout training. So there she was the youngest child of the Eth Island royal family all alone in a gloomy swamp hunting down sea devils to make ends meet. She had claimed two tongues of sea devils who funnily enough she caught both mating in a secluded tree. She easily dispatched them with one shot each from her star fire arrows. It would seem to her that today will just be another boring night of monster hunting. She just hopes that soon a tweet a bird from her slay age and colleagues can contact her before she metaphorically dies of boredom. Thanks to her enhanced senses, Aliathra detected a lone sea devil about a few hundred meters southwest from where she stalked. With her race's signature elven agility, she stealthily strides her way through the marshes to be at the monster's position in a mere half a minute. Placing an arrow on her bow she drew her weapon and let loose the brilliant light blue projectile at the unsuspecting beast. However as soon as she heard the graceful whoosh sound of her boat string, she could hear a large unearthly thunder sound from across her position. At first, she thought that it was isolation that she has been living on for several days has started to perform tricks at her. She boldly emerged from her position and walked towards her kill. However, that loud thunder she thought was a hallucination was actually more concrete as she thought as she spotted two mysterious figures emerged from the other side. The strangers were of humanoid shape yet they wore green garments that almost reminded her of the dryads and sylvanite tree people native to her homeland. Were these sent by her family? If they have to travel across an ocean and miles of land these dryads must have some very urgent news for her. Yet as she zoomed her turquoise eyes to the dryads she noticed that they were wearing shoes and wielded strange black colored staffs. Something a dryad would never need to be equipped with. They must be the native humans or Firen in her native elven tongue. Off to hunt sea devils for money too. She can understand a majority of the words used in the very language of the Slay Aegean Empire and based on what she is hearing. One of the men who sported facial hair on his chin claimed that he slew the sea devil and he rightfully earns its tongue. His partner a man in who was similarly dressed as him in olive-colored clothing is clean-shaven and idded tan a color similar to the light brown oak wood of her elven homeland. 
he was simply standing next to him checking a mysterious light that emitted from one of his staffs. The elf princess observed closely, is that fire in charging his magic? The bearded man began to argue over the rightful claim of the sea devil tongue yet the elf princess fought back. The argument soon descended into a rite of superior armaments, as they fought over whose weapon was more superior than the other. Then the bearded man said a word that shook shivers down her spine. United Federation of Earth the bearded man said. She had remembered hearing that from Prince Clovich in Castle Tyrian a few days ago when she disappeared to be undercover as one of Princess Arya's many maids. She knew from her nation's spy network that the Prince of Tyrian provides intelligence on Slaeach and Empire border movements and fortification details to the Eth Island on Tontels in exchange for elven medicine to make his sister temporarily albeit very weakly walk again. Yet after she attended a conference with these foreign United Federation of Earth she saw giant cities that were hastily built made of cold hard metal and stone as if it magically erupted from the earth. Not even the best magically attuned architect can even hope to build something in a span of a week, the best could be under a year. Then she met the leader of the Federation by the name of White. He whispered something at the prince's ears that made him and his sister cry as if they were mentally broken then he promised from what she could be able to eavesdrop from the meeting to take care of them. Were these demons corrupting the mortals to do their bidding? And were these two men part of this Federation? Is it just another demonic ruse to infiltrate their world and turn it into their cornucopia of despairing souls? Were these demons disguised as, no, not on my watch, not that we can still fight? She conjured white holy magic from her hands in gathering of her elven powers ere Galad. She exclaimed. A brilliant white flash erupted from her hand blinding the two demons. Normally the holy light spell she has learned from the elven paladins can dispel instantly lesser demons and for the stronger ones they would at least erupt in a silvery white flame. Yet as the bright flash subsided, Aliathra saw to her surprise that the two demons were physically unharmed and were merely stunned by the sudden lightning flash that addled their vision. They are stronger than I thought. Take this, she said to herself. She drew her bow and placed an arrow to shoot down one of the demons while they were defenseless. She took aim and at the older bearded demon in the human disguise and drew her bowstring. It seemed like everything became slow motion in time as just as she drew her bow, the younger fair looking demon quickly recovered his vision and focused his face at Aliathra. He charged in inhuman speed at the elf before she could react and deflected the bow away from the direction of the bearded man as she let go, the arrow narrowly missing him. The fair-looking demon soon wrestled away Eliathra's bow from her grasp successfully prying it from her finger with his brutish strength before pushing her down to the dirty waters of the swamp before he tossed the bow away. The elf recoiled in shock as she roughly crashed her body to the murky waters. It was disgusting that her frame was polluted with such filthy that it drew her anger at the demons to push herself harder to triumph against them. She may be outnumbered two to one but the astrals were at her side thanks to her blessed bloodline from her family. She gnashed her teeth as she stood back up and drew her short sword from her back and began to slash the blade towards the demon. Die demon! She proudly yelled. Her adversary dodged every swipe of her blade in a fiendish speed demonstrating his demonic physical attributes which are superior to any mortal creature can even hope to obtain let alone surpass. Distressed, the elven princess began to push her body to dangerous levels of exertion. As she redoubled her efforts yet the demon effortlessly continued to dodge her attacks. Then suddenly the demon grabbed her arm after she tried to thrust the blade into the demon's chest. Her enemy held her arm hand in place with his right hand before he kicked her in the abdomen with a strong 45 degree kick. Weakened by the sudden shock on her core, her grip on her weapon weakened making it easy for the demon to pry it away from her. Now completely defenseless, weakened and exhausted, the princess was now at the full mercy of the demon as the brute dragged her across the water and cornered her body forcefully against the fresh corpse of the sea devil that they have fought over earlier. Is this it? Am I going to die? She began to cry, shedding tears tears from her face that fell down her fair cheeks, pinned to the dead monster she could only pray that the demons grant her a quick death. She closed her eyes to embrace her fate and ancestors. 
yet from the incoherent speaking coming from the two demons she could feel. In decision from her empathic senses, her elven heritage could from close range detect one's mood and feelings. This was how her ancestors tamed the wild animals to their will and how they, before the splitting of their nation ruled like masters before the time of men rising into prominence. Could these demons have feelings? Shit. What the fuck? Happened? The bearded one said after recovering his vision from Aliathra's previous spell. I don't know a bed, but this girl tried to kill us. Who the hell are you? Said the younger one. The man gently removed her hood that concealed her head exposing her golden blonde hair, as your eyes and leaf-shaped elven ears. Whoa. The fair one commented admiring Aliathra's features. The princess doesn't know whether to feel flattered that a man is admiring her scared being the mad has her pinned and at his mercy. Please. Don't kill me. Aliathra begged. I. Will be your slave. I can please you. Pleasure you. Would you want to have an elf as your pleasure slave? Just spare me and my family please. She pleaded in a last ditch effort to survive her loss. The princess felt so helpless. She had messed up and failed her mission and all she could do was await what her defeater has in store for her. Whether chains of slavery or the cold kiss of death, Aliathra lay down defeated. Whoa, whoa. What? Slave? You and me? No, I am not that kind of person. The fed once said loosening his grip and letting Aliathra go. She caught her breath but yet she was still surrounded by two physically imposing figures. Who has caught her drained of her energy both stamina and magics? First off we are only arguing about who killed this crocodile right here and you thought you could get away with this by shooting at us. The bearded man called a beat I said to her. I, thought. I, you, Aliathra stuttered her mouth dry and thirsty from the exertion of her previous fight. She wanted to accuse the two figures for the demons that they were yet her parched mouth couldn't let her speak. Don't stutter on me woman, you tried to kill both of us. First you blinded us with some flashbang mumbo jumbo magic at our faces and tried to finish us with your fucking star something whatever bow. Do you have any idea? What we will? A bee die roared. You. A bed. The fair-faced one exclaimed who stared into the light of his staff, his face plastered in dread. What the hell is it now Vince? A Dyer said. We dot a dot surrounded. The fair-faced figure who is addressed as Vince punctuated. What? A Dyer asked. Clicks, spooks everywhere. We are surrounded. He informed. Aliathra observed her peripheral surroundings. It was true, she has sensed six seed evils surrounding them from all sides. She could feel the primal hunger that surged within monsters' minds as they spotted their next meal. And that meal was their flesh. Shit. What do we do? And the girl too. Vincent asked. For now. We fucking survive. A bee die yelled. The bearded man reached out into his pocket and grabbed a strange looking wand from the breasts of his shirt. It was a small handheld gizmo that at first glance. Aliathra could think it was some sort of harmless piece of art made from gleaming silvery metal. It had a curved black leather handle that Abedai held firmly on his palm and a long snout engraved with the words elephant killer at its surface. The bearded man's index finger twitched inward to his hands to let out a deafening blast that recoiled the strange metal wand and letting loose a fiery chromatic flash. The princess covered her ears as a bee dire fired his wand at one of the sea devils. A large detonation of blood spurted out from the monster's neck, then followed by another thunderous bang from a bee dire and then a third one. After his first three shots, his target fell down dead on the swamp floor choking on its own blood. The elven princess couldn't believe such a meager weapon compared to her starfire bow can fell such a beast in such a brutally efficient manner. Most ones in terms of magic amplification power couldn't compete against staffs and were normally relegated to more up close and personal assignments whilst staffs were more for much larger tasks that requires heavy amounts of mana to be expended. She looked on to the fair-faced one named Vincent who in stark contrast to a Dyer's weapon of choice was holding a significantly larger armament. 
It was a long staff life with a distinctly shaped snout compared to a Bedaya's hand-held weapon. With a twitch of his fingers below his dark-colored staff he let out a mighty thunderous roar that in one single discharge blew open the body of a sea devil who managed to get close to melee range in a gory shower of blood and guts. What kind of awesome magical powers does these demons possess that even the mightiest monsters can easily fall before them? A fuck it scuts all fucking over me, Vincent exclaimed. The fair-faced one reached into his waist and began to pick up red-colored shells from his belt and began to load it inside his magical staff from the hole below it. Is this how they charge their magic, through these shells? Is mana contained within them? As she spectated the two fighting against the batch of sea devils, Aliathra observed that one of the beasts was distancing itself away from the three. Its throat began to bulge and the beast's eyes aimed straight for Vincent who is currently recharging his magical black staff with ravenous intent. No, Aliathra yelled out. With a sliver of recovered vigor, she conjured a hastily albeit weakly conjured force field with her and Vince under its protected influence. The sea devil let loose a water jet from its mouth aimed at the two. It impacted Aliathra's force field in full force. Although it dampened most of the dangerous physical force of the water jet, the elf and the fair-faced humanoid were still knocked back down to the ground by the remaining force of the jet but were ultimately unharmed except for a few bruises from the resulting impact. Vincent, whilst he recovered from the blast briefly turned his head to Aliathra face sketched in astonishment. Why did I protect him? The princess, in a brief moment examined the demon's features. His face was indistinguishable from a human male's in comparison. He had dark brown eyes a rounded nose and a firmly chiseled chin. When he grinned his teeth, as he struggled to recharge his staff, instead of ebony-colored set of fangs compared to the common depictions of demons among the shared lore of the world, Vince's teeth were of a normal light yellow glow with the teeth shaped ordinarily compared to the humanoid races of Gleesia such as men, elves, and dwarves. Cover your ears and stay behind me, Vincent yelled to her. A loud clicking noise from a movable part of his black thunder staff below its snout from a thrust down and then up with his hands. The fair-faced one aimed his black thunder staff at the offending creature and discharged a mighty blast that just like his previous victims, inflicted a large explosion that created a giant bloodied cavity on the beast's center mass. Adrenaline began to surge through the elf's body rejuvenating her systems to fight for her life. Her mana energies slowly recharged within her with the princess ready to fight for her life. She couldn't believe that her own safety now falls between the hands of these two demons. She doesn't know if she will have to report this back to her slay agent colleagues over this predicament. If she survives at all today. Shit. The voice of a Bedaya rang on her left side. One of the sea devils managed to get close to the bearded humanoid and managed to slip its claws at his right thigh, lacerating it before narrowly dodging away from a complete amputation of his leg. Reflexively, a Bedai fan fired his strangely shaped metal wand at his attacker and gave a clean headshot to the sea devil, killing it instantly. The bearded one then leaned over to the sea devil carcass from earlier in pain. His hands began to remove the gloves he wore exposing his fleshy white skin and pressed on his wound. Blood was beginning to spurt out of his wound like a geezer tainting his hands as it desperately tried to impede the bleeding. This demon is bleeding. But I thought demons can't feel pain. Aliathra's eyes widened as she looked at Obedias wound. It was bleeding profusely and if he doesn't get attention now he will pass out or even die from blood loss. Should I save this one? The demon was unlike anything she had ever read. Was her hypothesis of these aliens who set foot on the Empire's lands wrong? Her head tells her to save herself and flee away yet her heart says to help the wounded and bleeding. Her thoughts splitted into two directions, show compassion to these demons who could have easily killed her but chose not to and even one of them went out of his way to protect her by yelling to stay behind her while he valiantly fought the monsters or flee with her back turned and leave them to their fate. Ag, Abidaya groaned in agony as he clutched his wound. The bearded one could barely stand straight as he pushed the weight of his back to the carcass and opened fire with his metal wand. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I lack nothing, he makes my lie down in green pastures and the quiet waters of heaven, refreshing my weary soul. Abediah began to pray, fighting back the painful tears inflicted by his wound. His voice began to fall into soft grogginess with every breath he exhaled. Even though I fucking hell walk into the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Abediah continued. He let loose a couple of shot from his wand that took down another sea devil, rupturing its flesh with its explosive magics, and A.A. will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. He finished his panicked praying and opened fire another couple of shots at another sea devil, taking the beast down with his wand. The strength of his arms began to waver as it shivered, struggling to be kept raised. The bearded one began to limply sink down his back on the carcass until he was now sitting on his hinds above the surface of the wetlands. Still covering his wounds and barely keeping his hands pointing his wand, Abediah turned to Vincent. Diaz. Vincent, if I die here today, tell my family, Leah. April. I was thinking of them, he muttered faintly. This demon has a family? No this can't be true. This is all a ruse to trick me into healing it. Don't go. Don't do it Haley. You are not going to fucking die in this shithole you hear me. Vincent protested hoping his words can encourage give the bearded one the will to live. Don't heal him. Don't heal him. It is a demon. Leave him. Run. But it has a family. So, what? They are just as evil as he is. They tried to take what is yours. But he will die if I leave him. It doesn't matter. I am no better. Just as evil as them if I leave him. Don't you dare try. What would your family, the rest of your nation say if they find out that you healed a minion of the abyss? This isn't fair. Don't you dare Princess Aliathra Letha of Ethylon. Don't cease this lunacy. No. Aliathra beat back her inner consciousness, moving aside the mental barriers of prejudice she has learned throughout her life. The haughty pride of elven superiority and rushed towards a bee who was slowly succumbing to his wounds. She knelt down in front of him and caressed his cheek with her hands. Please, look at me. She gently spoke to the bearded one. Stay with me. Everything will be alright. She lulled. A bee debilitated eyes moved sluggishly until his grey old eyes met with Aliathra's ocean blue ones. A glimmer of hope has appeared in front of him as if an angel miraculously descended from heaven to rescue him. What the hell are you doing? Vince turned his head behind him. I can heal him. Shield me. The elf cried. Fuck me. Fine. Vince roared. He continued to open fire from his black thunder staff covering the two. With her security assured, Aliath returned back to a bee dire who was life is now hanging by a thin thread. His muscles began to fall limp and his body temperature turning cold as the blood of the reptiles whose corpses surrounded them. O oh, Ethaniel, mother of all life and creation, please heal this one of his ailments so that he may live to see tomorrow's sun and and bask in your wonderful garden that in your infinite love for all, gifted your holy blood and flesh so that we may live in harmony. Aliathra whispered. She firmly placed her to hands and closed her eyes. Magical energies began to concentrate around her hands in a radiant green glow. Her eyes also matched the colors of her magical energies as she repaired the rupture on a bee-dyer's thigh. Be healed. Her voice ran like an angelic tone that resonated at his ears. His leg began to mend itself back together. The broken blood vessels in his thigh reconnected with each other via rapid regeneration thanks to the healing powers of Aliathra. The incision that had breached his skin also reconstructed itself back to its original state, closing off a bee-dyer's bleeding. Aliathra scanned for the bearded one's vitals. With her magic she can see through the epidermis of a bee-dyer and examine every nook and cranny of his body. To her surprise, this demon had the similar anatomy and physiology as any other humanoid race. The demon had a brain of its own complete with a nervous system, a respiratory system, a digestive system, a urinary system, endocrine system etc. Things she has learned from her restoration tutors back at home. No demon could ever be as alive as this one. The princess examined Abedaya's cardiac system and to her alarm she noticed that the heart was slowly failing to pump blood throughout the mysterious being's body. Placing her hand on his chest, 
Aliathra prayed to Ethaniel one more time before she expended more of her restoration magics. The energies began to flow out of her lithe hands and pierced through Abedaya's chest harmlessly, seeping into his inner body. The energies manifested itself through Aliathra's will into a hand that gently grabbed Abedaya's failing heart. Aliathra willed herself to carefully resuscitate Abedaya's heart rebooting his blood circulation gently. Please stay with me, she whispered quietly to his ears. She continued to manually pump Abidaya's blood, hoping beyond hope that he will live. Ak, Abidaya spatted as he jerked his body. His eyes returned to life as he quickly inhaled oxygen and grabbed his chest. Aliathra successfully pulled out the demon from death's door, saving it. His life, it is done. You are safe now, I saved you. As Abedaya slowly stood back up with the gentle aid of Aliathra, Vincent was able to kill off the rest of their monstrous attackers. Abed. Thank God you're alive, he joyously exclaimed. You. You. Saved. Me. Abedaya turned to the angelic elf woman who rescued him from death. Thank you. Aliathra replied. She didn't dare say another word after whilst her mind was still clouded with the doubt of her decision. The two strangers after they managed to get their bearings in order observed their surroundings. The swamp floor was littered with the cadavers of seven sea devils who will no longer trouble the good people of Tyrian. From estimated what the bounty has promised, the monsters can fetch a over 700 ducats in total. Fine day we had today eh? Abedi lightened the mood. Really? You almost fucking died for fuck's sakes Abed. How am I going to tell your wife about this? Vincent asked. We don't. I don't want her to stop me from going out to hunt if she finds out of this shit. Abidaya answered. Well okay, let's cut up these tongues and the get out of here. And maybe we can give some of the tongues to Blondie here. Vincent pointed to Aliathra. Quietly, the elf leaned over to one of the corpses and recuperate herself while the strangers began to cut out the sea devil tongues for the bounties. Aliathra reflected on her actions earlier as the thoughts began to fly around her. Did I do what is right? The demon can go back to his family now. Will the gods punish me? Did I allow myself to be exploited by them? Should I run? No, I can't. Too weak. So. Hungry. That's all of them. Abedaya said. He carried over seven tongues from the monster's mouths and alongside Vincent, walked towards her. Yet Aliathra couldn't help but feel dread as they walked closer to her. This it. They will tie me up and enslave me have their way with me and maybe even extract my powers for their evil whims. I am sorry. Everyone. Okay, two for you, two for me and three for the girl. Abedaya said, presenting three trophies to the elven princess. The scent of saliva and blood still fresh and dripping from the flesh. She couldn't believe that she was given the largest share of the trophies. All she did was heal and protect the demons while they slay the monsters. Was this the demon's way of thanking her? She didn't muster the courage to take her prize. She didn't even have the will to even move due to her exhaustion and panging hunger. You seem quiet. Abedaya commented. The elf princess subdued any emissions of sound from her mouth still too flustered of what she has experienced. Everything she knows about demons are now coming into question with every moment she spends with Abedaya and Vince. She couldn't think straight off of whether she should take what the bearded one is generously offering to her or pass it off as a demonic temptation trying to make her stray of the path of her principles and virtues she was taught by her mother when it comes to being a role model as a princess. The hunger on her stomach emitted a gastronomic growl causing her to wince then pat her stomach to comfort it. You hungry? Abedaya asked her, food, we got some food on a bed's truck if you want, it's my way of thanking you if you would join us, it's not every day I get a pretty woman like you to dine for lunch, Vincent flirtatious said, yeah, I think we got some food, would you like to have lunch with us miss, Abedaya asked again, I can't take it anymore, I need nourishment, yes, I would like to, Aliathra answered, well good to have you, Get your gear and follow us. Abedaya smiled. Later near the edge of the swamp. Fuck. Abedaya what would an elf eat? Asked Vincent. I don't know. Aren't them fantasy snots or maybe vegetarians? I mean being hippies and all. Most of my food here is chili and chicken soup really. Hang on. Abedaya answered. 
He reached into the trunk and grabbed a red-colored can. Smiling, the bearded one walked to the fireplace that they set up a metal pot over. Placing some water from the canteen, he then poured out the contents of the can to the pot. Aliathra can hear the simmering and bubble popping of the food being cooked inside the pan. Then she smelled the aroma that was released into the air. It was an earthy yet citric smell like freshly picked fruit from the orchards outside her home city of Ethylon. Smells like home yet so exotic at the same time. For the first time after leaving her homeland, Aliathra felt delighted over the scent of lovingly made food. After ten minutes being teased by the smell, Abidaya walked to the pot with a ladle in a bowl at hand. He used the spoon to bore through the metal cooking vessel and picked up a couple spoonful of the pot's contents. He then passed the bowl to her as she got a closer look at her meal. The dish she was served was a wheat-colored dumpling of sorts shaped like a person's belly button covered in a red sauce where the source of the earthy yet citric smell came from. A strange cuisine these ones eat. It looked like one's belly button. And the sauce. It's like blood. Do they? Eat? People? Aliathra perception caused her to nervously think over her prejudged assumptions of the alien meal she has on her lap. Her sensory organs began to go into overload as she shivered frozen in fear. Then a loud thunder erupted to her ears. Aku. Vincent sneezed. Ag. Aliathra screamed. Her sensory overload overwhelming her and nearly causing her to spill her over. Wha what? Oh. Sorry miss. I got a sneeze. It's okay, Vincent reassured. The elf began to shed tears in her eyes and her nostrils began to clog up as the princess desperately tried to regain her posture. Hey, hey, girl don't cry. I hate seeing pretty ladies like you cry. Here, Vince soothed her. He grabbed a piece of cloth from his eating tray and placed it on Aliathra's eyes, gently rubbing away the tears. What? Is this food you have given me? She asked. Cheese tortellini with some tomato sauce. If you're a vegetarian, don't worry. It's just wheat, cheese and tomato fruit alright? No meats. Come on, try some. A bee diaried that can then invite a Aliathra to take a bite. Must. Gain dot nourishment. With a provided spoon in hand, Aliathra scooped the belly button shaped dumpling and a few particles of the tomato sauce and slowly placed the utensil on her mouth. When the foodstuff made contact with her tongue, Aliathra felt an explosion of flavors that danced with her. The fruity and acidic tomato complemented with the viscous texture of the melting cheese heartened her. The food, despite its alien components felt just like she is eating back in the royal dining table back at her home. You like it? A bee die grinned. Yes, very much. Aliathra answered. So, you lady. I am sorry about earlier but if it wasn't for you I would be dead. Thank you. Yum. What's your name if I can ask? A bee die asked her. Should I lie? What if these demons can detect me lying? No point hiding. But I should hide my lineage unless they know. Aliathra? My name is Aliathra, she answered. Wow, that sounds beautiful, Vince said. Well, what do you expect from an elf, Hadias? An elf calling herself Debbie, Fred, or something? Abidar playfully chided. You are called Abidaya. And you, Vincent? I never heard of these names before. Are you not from the Empire? Aliathra asked. Oh shit, you. Yeah, Vince. Ah. Uh. How do we explain it to her? Abidaya asked his partner. I don't know. What if she can't take it? Vince reasoned. I will try. Please indulge me about yourselves. Aliathra politely requested. Well, if you insist elf lady, we'll keep this brief as possible. I bet you start. Vincent sighed. Okay, so me and Vincent come from a land. Very, very, very far away, Abidaya said. How far is it? Maybe I know this place, Aliathra stated. Ah, uh, I don't think so miss. You see, we both come from M. You won't believe this but, we come from the sky. We are like sky people, Abidaya said. Surely you are jesting. The elf blushed. No, we aren't. We do come from the sky, Vince spoke honestly. The elf's playful mask descended into bewilderment as she his words. You come from the sky? She asked pointing upwards with her index finger. Yes, we do. Vince nodded. Are you gods? Angels? She reluctantly and curiously asked. 
What no? We are as human as... You. Yeah. As human as we can get. Vincent placed his arms on his hips in offended irritation. But your magics and clothes are so... Otherworldly. Surely your gods or some sort celestial being? She pressed. God damn it to bed. I don't think she understands shit. Vince snapped. Excuse me? I am not some filthy peasant. Aliathra roared. Whoa. Whoa hold it there. Hold it right there. We are friends here everyone. Abedia restrained them before it escalated. Miss Aliathra. I am sorry for my partner right here. How about we change the subject for now? I don't think we can properly explain to you our... You... Origins without confusing you. So, let's engage in some small talk. Shall we? So elf woman, tell me. What brings you here? Do you live nearby? Abidia asked. I am an adventurer. I live in a camp not too far away from here. I am on a journey of sorts that I cannot reveal the details of Aliathra hiding the details of her mission to the two. She has begun to express doubts that these people are demons based on the events of the day. Yet she isn't so certain of her rationale right now. She needs to gather more intelligence of these strange people for now before she could push any kind of conclusions. The princess wonders if she will get any word back from Herring Point for further orders any time soon. But for now, she will play it safe before doing anything risky. Well must seem like a very grim life am I correct? You making ends meet? Vince asked. Yes. But food is sometimes hard to come by in this part of the empire. The farms here barely get any yields in return. I am right now reduced to eating game meat and the occasional loaf of bread. But today, I really appreciate the food you made. A little break from my normal diet reminds me of the finer things in life. She sighed, reminiscing her home for a brief moment of absent-mindedness until returning to the conversation at hand. You must be a long way from home if you spoke it like that, Vince said, sharply detecting her facial movements and eye contact. My home, Alfel Nora, a nation of the elves. It's a paradise compared to the human continent of Zanigrad, which is here where we stand right now. Fertile fields, beautiful gardens and majestic cities oh how I miss my home. She loosened herself, must be a really touristy place. Might actually wanna check it out if I get the chance. Vince suggestively said, oh, I don't think they will let you in. We elves tend to be very protective of our lands. Aliathra denied. Fucking shame. I bet my boss Samantha would love to take her camera and shoot the place. Vincent said. Your friend is an archer like me. I don't think we would let you hunt there let alone be there. Oh no. A camera isn't a weapon. It's a. You. Okay this is much easier to explain. A camera is a device that is used to capture images so it can be transformed into what we call a picture. It's like a very well-made painting that it can make in an instant. You following me? Abidia said. It can paint in an instant? Aliathra asked. Yes, I have a camera on my smartphone. You. Yes I have camera. Would you like me to demonstrate? Vince proposed. Well sure. Please entertain me with this camera of yours. She said. The fair-faced sky person grabbed from one of his pockets of his olive-colored clothes and picked up a rectangular object whose surface reflected the afternoon sunlight. He twiddled his fingers as if he was casting a tiny spell on the object to be able to cast the Awin and no magics. After a moment, Vince faced the rectangular gizmo vertically towards Aliathra's direction. Hey! Face me, Vincent said. Turning from the camping chair she sat towards the fair-faced one. The princess sat perfectly still as the Awin and Nur begins to paint her image. Can you if it's okay with you, smile? Even just a little bit? I mean you're a beautiful woman and all. And it's our first time ever seeing an elf before. Not to sound too creepy but the picture I will be taking would look better if you smile. Even just a little bit, Vince requested. Nodding to his appeal, Aliathra gave a graceful but softly curved smile from her perfectly proportioned lips. Vince then zoomed his face closer to the rectangular gizmo and a loud clicking noise followed. And done. Really? You made the painting that fast? Aliathra asked. She couldn't contain her surprise at the speed that Vincent said he would paint. It's picture miss. Picture. P. 
P-I-C-T-U-R-E. Picture okay? Here take a look. Vince corrected. He presented the opposite side of his gadget to the elf. The image was a perfect copy of her body. Attire and surroundings behind her. The princess face. The epitome of elven beauty from her homeland was slightly tainted by a few stains of dirt and sweat that Aliathra reflexively touched herself to wipe it off to maintain her superficial image. She was alarmed accuracy of how the camera painted Aliathra in such terrifying speeds that it's almost uncanny. It's perfect, too perfect. I look well. Perfect. But it feels so. So. Aliathra stuttered. Eerie? Vince asked. Yes. It's nothing like a painting. Aliathra admitted. Oh, okay. Give me a second. I can apply a filter. 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 Ah yes. How about now? Vince twiddled with his gadget for a moment and then presented again a new version of Aliathra's photo. The new picture was much more art-like with paint-like strokes that detailed every inch of the elf's elegance and background that she can easily mistake the image for a painting made by Eth Island's most esteemed painters, especially the one who painted her for her royal portrait that is pasted to the palace's walls. Much better. I, I, can't contain my... My, she struggled to find a word to say to the Awanana. She had always thought that the people outside of her homelands were backwards in technological, magical, and cultural advancements. But when she met Obedia and Vince, her stereotypes were shattered into millions of pieces. She shed single euphoric tear that slowly fell down on her cheeks. You impressed? Vince asked. I am very impressed. Thank you. Can I keep this? She asked. Oh. Sorry now this camera is only digital right now meaning. It's not a real image. Just a fake virtual one. Although if you come to New Albany, I can arrange you a session with a professional photographer. I'm sorry, painted to make a picture of you. He proposed. I don't know. I normally have to spend my days hunting for my food in the forest. I don't know if I can get the time to go to your home. It's the strange looking metal city that the locals here call right? That's what they have been calling New Albany? Well since you need food, how about this? I also happen to own a farm in New Albany called the Root Family Farmstead. I grow grains and vegetables there. Just walk up to one of the guards and tell them I sent you and he'll point you to my place. Plus, my wife and daughter would love to see you, if we can make up a deal with the food. I think you could get yourself a healthy supply of my produce. A B Dyer presented. Plus, I can take you to a photography studio to get your picture taken that you can have for yourself. I can even tour you the town. Although me and a B Dyer can only do that during Saturdays when it's our day off of our jobs as soldiers, Vince said. What is a Saturday and you also happen to be soldiers? Aliathra questioned. First answer. We interpret time differently from you. To make a long story short, every seven days from now is a Saturday. For your second question, yes, we are soldiers. You and we are more of a study and observations team. We investigate and survey the lands but also fight any threats that come our way. It's a dangerous but very rewarding job. Abidaya answered, I pray for your safety then. She softly gestured in a prayer. But now I must turn in these seed evil tongues now. Thank you for the hospitality and meal Abidia and Vincent of the Sky. Thank you so much for meeting you too Aliathra. So are you interested in visiting New Albany seven days from now? Vince asked. This is most fortuitous. An opportunity to infiltrate the demon. Or a win in a settlement. I can't pass it up. Yes of course. I will be happy to visit you. She bowed. Well farewell then elf woman. I can't wait to see you again. And remember, ask the guards for where I live since I technically don't have an address yet for my home. I'll make sure they know ahead of time of your arrival. We'll turn in hours probably much later after we take away the camp stuff here. A bee hand waved. You're gonna love the photo studio too. Vince added. The elven princess waved farewell to the two Awananair and carried her trio of sea devil tongues and disappeared into the shrubbery of the forest. For the elven princess, today was the day she truly opened her eyes to the outside world. Her naivety and innocence slowly degrading within her, 
forging her into maturity and experience. Her doubts about these demons invading the planet began to wane after she met a Root and Vince Diaz. Were the Conclave's visions of a destructive future wrong? These Awen and Noah don't seem to be violent, they are, at least from her first impression, assertive but their hearts are in the right place when you get to know them better. As for the two youth soldiers on a hunting trip all they could say was that meeting an elf for the first time was the most charming moment of their lives for a very long time to them, especially Vincent Diaz. It's like they have met a goddess thanks to Aliathra's sublime beauty. Little did they know that her beauty was inherited from a long line of Alpha Nora's most prestigious family, the Lytha royal family. But now, what happened to the other half of Stider group you may ask dear reader? Chapter 11. The Jubilation of Cool Dust La A E Jack. It was mid-afternoon that day in Tyrian, or more specifically, in the drunken bastard. Luthia Amirian is currently busy coordinating his staff in establishing festive decorations for his establishment. The pub was being adorned with colorful banners, paper lanterns and displays statuettes of the Empire's pantheon of gods. Samantha, Crocker, Ken and Iris had to navigate through the half-assembled main hall with the pub employees scrambling to fulfill their duties on time just to reach the dwarf. Greetings again Mr. Mirian. Samantha greeted. Lieutenant Rose, what are you doing here now? The festivities won't start until sunset, he said turning his stout body to the earthlings. Oh, we are not here for the festivities we are here for some extra work, we are taking on your bouncer quest. Samantha answered. Really? Does that Governor White fellow approve of this? I mean you are professional soldiers after all, the dwarf questioned. Well we got orders from Polonsky to take up these quests from the Adventurers Guild so we can immerse ourselves into the land and gaining the trust of the locals. Samantha replied. Well I will definitely appreciate the help. A lot of good men tend to be scared of being the muscle for my event. They will mostly be missing the festivities and no one else I know is willing to pass this day and be the bouncers. I was getting desperate that I was paying quadruple the rate for anyone willing to be the security he warned. What makes you say that? And second thought, what kind of job are we getting into? Samantha asked. Well you see today is the jubilation of King Kuldalstla Aija, the founder of the empire. Every five years we celebrate his triumph against Dorbone the Steel Butcher. I have hired a bard and his actor friends who will do their thing. I need you to be security as this day tends to be much more of a ruckus than any other day here. Luthera said. I agree. Festivals are a hotbed of crime. What can we expect? She asked. Well there's the usual drunken brawling as the bar will be open. There might be a cut purse lurking in the crowd trying to steal someone's coins. Oh, and there might be a heckler trying to climb the stage and interrupt the play. He briefed. Nothing we can handle. Croc are you ready to get physical anyone? Samantha turned to the Brit. Yeah fine. I just hope there's some food and grub by the time our gig is up. I mean, do you smell that? The food you are cooking up must be delicious. Lewis complimented. Thank you, Olga Breaker. Today's menu is going to be roasted suckling pig, mushroom soup, mashed pumpkins and all the ale in the world. I promise to give you a share later during the revelry so you don't miss out. Luya promised. Throw in some mandarin salad and you got a meal. Ken added. With gratitude Mr. Mirian. I'll have my men get used to the place so they can easily do their job. Samantha saluted as she and the rest of her squad moved out. The Stider group split up so they can walk around the establishment detailing every corner from tables, the bar counter, the entrance, the liveratories the stage and kitchen. They establish themselves where everything is so that they can easily coordinate their security measures on any disturbances. Samantha made sure that everyone including Iris is given a walkie-talkie radio since they will all individually patrol the drunken bastard. She has also drilled her men for their wading through the expectedly thick crowds of celebrants with the busy body and staff as practice so they can efficiently navigate the end during the jubilee. At first, Iris was nervous when she was given a piece of modern technology to her for the job due to her unfamiliarity with the device and her culture shock. Thankfully Ken was able to instruct her how to use the device easily which the vampire which heavily appreciates the Nigerian's help. 
After much familiarization of the establishment, the team felt confident that they can keep Luyas insecure during the festivities. They rested themselves on the edge of the stage just as the staff were about to implant the finishing touches and the sun was slowly starting to descend across the horizon. So, I am guessing you're ready for later? Luya approached them. Yes, had my men get used to this place and I am confident they know you're in just like they know their own home. Samantha said. That is reassuring and creepy at the same time. Luya called her out. Yeah like know their own home thing. That's pretty creepy coming from us. Crocker reprimanded. Sorry. Don't get any ideas about us. It's just a bit of wordplay. But you can count us. Samantha heartened up. I am quite curious though. What exactly is the plot of this play that you are hosting? Ken asked. It details the exploits of King called Elstla A.E. Jack on his journey to defeat the evil Allbone the Steel Butcher. Iris explained. So, what's the story? Samantha asked. Iris took a deep breath inhaled the oxygen needed for her to be able to tell the legend of called Elstla A.E. Jack. About 200 years ago, Caldell was born over about 200 years ago when the Jeltogaz Comet, whose passing for a great change will ripple the entire world of Gleesia changing the course of history for good or ill. Clan Stlaeja, ancestors of the Stlaejan Empire, used to be a tribe that lives by the bay where it is now known as Herring Point. Caldell's further was the king of the clan and the elders of the tribe, after seeing the comet's passing foretold that the infant was destined for great things. Back then, magic users in Sainagrad wasn't as policed and regulated compared to today. There were many unfettered mages who became warlords in their respective territories, ruling the land in fear and right of strong arms. At first, Prince Kaldel initially ignored the outside world of feuding tribes and tended to focus on the development of Clan Stlaeja. However, one day an evil warlord named Albone the Steel Butcher invaded his land and captured Caldell's beloved, the beautiful maiden Erin. It is said that the legends say that Albone made a deal with demons to become powerful or a demon possessed him so it can wreak havoc upon the mortal world. Their Steel Butcher he was called for he only lived to conquer and enslaved. He needed Erin for she was born with exponential magical power which Albone needs for his charge of world domination. Uniting many of the scattered human tribes across Sanigrad and allying himself with the elves and the dwarves, Caldell faced off against Albone with his demon-chosen legions cladded in their resplendent rune-forged armor which legends say that it is permanently bound to the souls of their respective bearers. It was a bit a battle that many bards to this day sang as if it was the climatic battle against the forces of good versus evil. Many warriors, friends, family, brothers, fathers and sons died, but in the end, after what looked like all that all hope was about to be snuffed out from existence, Caldell managed to slay Allbone before he could deliver the final blow. They say, in his dying moments, it drove him mad, the shame of his first defeat with his dying breath, he said that one day, he and his armies will return from the grave to exact vengeance upon his land, that when Jeltogar's comet returns, he will rise again from the ashes and challenge him once more for dominion of all life in Gleesia. The Strider group who were listening to Iris intently was struck with amusement by her story. I got to say Iris, that sure sounds like an epic tale. Samantha complimented. I agree. Just slap the one ring and you got yourself Tolkien. Ha ha. Crocker laughed. Tolkien? One ring? The vampire asked in a dumbfounded expression. It's like what you told you told us Iris. Look up the movie or the book sometime. You got to see it. It's a classic where we come from. Ken said. You have dwarves and elves back in your world. I mean worlds? She asked. Oh no, real ones. They are all purely fiction where we come from. Like legends. No offense to you and your kind but some more are quite a big number of the non-human people you have described about are made up from our world. Fictional figments of our imagination. Samantha explained while she cracked a playful smile. Really? You have come up the concept of us without actually meeting any of us? Surely you are just jesting to spend the time. Iris chuckled. Oh no, we aren't lying Iris. We are indeed telling you that we do have to concept of fantasy worlds in our home. Although, based on now, 
I don't think we can call the fantasy genre a fantasy anymore. Samantha said. Oh, do tell me blood hair. What did your imagination think about us? The vampire inquired. Well starting with you Iris, we think of vampires as blood suckers who hate the sun. Yet I do notice you can freely walk around in a day and you have never tried to bite one us. What gives? Well, when it comes to the sun, it is true that sunlight does hurt us and hamper our abilities to cast magic. We vampires have found a magical means to deter the sunlight. We cast a special ward around our bodies that obstructs Malinari's light. Iris answered, Malinari's? You mean the sun, right? Samantha asked, her golden lady and the bane of all of my kind's existence. Iris confirmed, the ward is like a sunblock judging by how you say it. Ken added, a sun what? Sunblock. It's a lotion we apply to our skin whenever we have to expose ourselves to intense sunlight so we don't get burned or get skin cancer. I might actually look into the nightman. Thank you. The vampire nodded. Now as for the blood. Yes I do need blood for magical and nourishment reasons. Yet I have practiced discipline for the past fifty years when I was living in the forest. Disciplined how? Samantha inquired. I feast on the animals, deer, rabbits, bears, the occasional beast man and in rare cases a dead adventurer. The lieutenant's face went white with fear over the implications of Iris' words. She has so far got well acquainted with the vampire for the past few weeks but she still has fears about her and her haemophiliac appetite. Have you ever thought of, well, feasting on any of us? Samantha fearfully asked. Oh no, never. Unlike most of my kin, I detest the prospect of having cattle. Mostly the reason being I have to feed and clean it every day. Additionally, I hate the screaming they would make every time I bite them. That's why I prefer animals and the newly dead to feast upon. Iris answered. That is both relieving and disturbing. Crocker commented. I hope you can keep the discipline of yours. Living in isolation as a vampire then suddenly thrust into a new place where there's blood bags everywhere is concerning. Are sure you can live with us? Samantha concernedly questioned. Well I did sneak inside the medical cabinet behind Dr. Hana's back to taste this bag I found called hematopoietic stem cells. Sipped it and I like the taste of it, but it feels like something. Something is missing. It's not like the real blood I normally drink, the vampire confessed. You drank a blood substitute? Samantha said. It tasted like blood but not as wholesome as the real thing. Hold on. Did you say, substitute? Iris inquired. Yes. It's a substitute for blood. But it doesn't have the oxygen inside it yet and all but. Where did you get them? Iris grabbed Samantha excitedly. Her eyes twinkled with fascination. A pharmaceutical company or a group of people who makes medicine, made the hematopoietic stem cell and, you made the blood? Without hurting anyone? Iris exclaimed. Yes. Samantha cut to the chase. Do you know the implications for that? For me? Iris said. You. Wait. I. Don't. You. No. I don't get it. Samantha said. It means if I can get a steady supply of this hemopoetic whatever stem cell blood bags, I can fulfill my blood hunger without worrying about having to go out and hunt for it, the vampire explained. You know what? That actually sounds like a great idea. Ken nodded. Me too. If I don't have to worry about Snow White here trying to bite me then I second this shit. Crocker added. Well okay then Iris. Let's discuss about this with Dr. Hana back at New Albany, but you need to apologize to her. That is her blood bags after all, Samantha reprimanded. I see. Thanks for considering. Iris lowered her head in shame. Attention everyone, the festivities are going to begin in five minutes, yelled one of the managers of the inn. Welp, let's get to work shall we lads? Crocker rallied. Let's go. Huddle up, Samantha said. The Strider group gathered themselves together and placed their hands on each of their own at the center of their makeshift circle and cheered themselves. Poroterra Team Strider. They pumped themselves up. Iris could feel a warming feeling in her cold heart that slowly melted the ice. These earthlings made her feel welcome and accepted. And right now, she wants to continue pursuing her relationship with the oof. She still cares for her family necklace that Colonel Polonsky is holding but now. 
she is considering after re-obtaining her necklace of extending her working contract with the youth. Dash during the jubilee, dash, the drunken bastard was overflowing with life, joy, merriment and laughter as scores of people from all walks of life gathered into Lulia's establishment for a night away from their daily drudgery of work, farming and mundane chores. There were men drunkenly singing songs by the bar counter, beautiful and voluptuous dancing girls twirled excitingly to the crowds and delicious foods were on display at a designated table that people lined up to get a portion of. For Ken, however, it was pure torture. The very sight, sounds and smells of the Jubilee gnawed relentlessly on his own disciplined psyche. He has done several patrols around the perimeters of secured areas before but unlike the drunken bastard in, they were mostly just circling around a military installation with the occasional investigation of anomalies and possible security breaches, but nothing has prepared the engineer for this. I would love to have a piece of that, Cain muttered to himself as he drooled at the roasted chicken whose cooked flesh was being proudly displayed with a garnish of boiled vegetables. The poultry tempted him in all of its made delights that he is slowly succumbing to it. As he began to willfully march off his ordained patrol route, a score of eager people rushed past him towards the table where the roast chicken is. Before he knows it by the time the people have left, all that was left on the dish was the disheveled garnishes of green vegetables and a handful of chicken meat scraps. Disheartened, Ken sat down on one of the chairs nearby to drink a sip of water from his canteen. He sighed sadly as he let the cold water soothe his stressed out body. Greetings again, Nightman. Iris' voice said, drawing out from Ken's depressed mood. Oh, hey Iris. How's the west perimeter? Ken asked. Nothing out of the ordinary. Iris replied. Just the same old ruckus and all. I did pass by some women who are wearing some very fashionable dresses which makes me so green with envy. How about you? It's the food and all the fun stuff happening around us right now. Last time I saw a party as big as this was my 20th birthday when I last saw my family. Ken admitted. Well you shouldn't feel too bad. We can enjoy the food after the party is over. Iris said. She then tried promptly pull out Ken from the chair but the Nigerian stubbornly glued himself to the furniture. I need some time please before I can go. Ken protested. I can't allow that nightman. You will make me look bad in front of Lieutenant Rose and I don't want that. Stand up, she asserted, pulling Ken harder, yet he still is clinging to the chair as if for dear life. Stop calling me that, he called out. The engineer began to start getting annoyed by the embarrassing nickname that the ivory-skinned vampiress calls him. It wasn't a race problem but more of a case of identity and he hated being reduced to the color of his skin. Get up, Iris yelled as she drew her strength at her arms and with a mighty pull, forcefully dragged out Ken from his chair, but the sheer force of her draw caused her to lose her footing and the heavier weight of the engineer caused both of them to fall down to the tavern's wooden floor. Snapping back up to his senses, Ken tried to rise up from the ground but soon his ebony eyes met with Iris's amber eyes. For the vampire, she blushed at sight of Ken's obsidian frame that towered over her pearly body in a complementary mix between the colors of black and white. For the Nigerian however, it felt awkward laying on top of Iris. He does admit that the vampire is very attractive for a woman he normally sees back home yet he would never imagine going this far with the woman who he just met a more than a week ago. It felt too fast and ethically wrong for a man as professional and logical for him. Oh. Get a room you two, cheered one of the Jubilee's patrons. Hands seized both Ken and Iris as a crowd of elated celebrants dragged them from the ground and forcefully moved them away from the party. Whilst in the act, they began to sing a very merry tune that sounded like it was dedicated to them. What are they singing? Ken yelled to Iris. Folk song. About two people together Iris spoke fragmentedly. She tried to shake of the people who firmly gripped her but to no avail. A love song? Ken questioned. Before he could protest further, the two were carried over upstairs to one of the inn's rooms. They were then forcefully pushed inside one of the rooms. Before they tried to escape out of their predicament. The door was slammed shut then followed by a sliding sound of something heavy being made at the other side of the door. 
Kayan attempted to force open the door with a few strong shoves with his shoulders but the door remained barred. Damn it. We are locked in. Iris. Can you use some of that vampiric powers of yours and break us out of here? Kayan turned to her. For the vampiress, she softly sat down at the one-man cot of the room. Her arms spread apart as it probed the softness of the bed. Her eyes directed to the engineer with a solemn smile. Their immediate surroundings were a simple layout of consisting of the bed, an empty chest and a single wooden chair. For all her accounts this room is meant for travelers who are staying in the inn overnight and is seeking accommodations whilst in a tight budget. A small window across her let out the cool night breeze to temper the room and the moonlight to dimly illuminate the room in a soft glare. There was also an unused candle that sat idly by the chest adjacent to the bed's feet but other than that, the room was relatively dark saved for the aforementioned moonlight. I am afraid I cannot risk it you know. There's dozens of people downstairs right now. If they hear the noise I would make when I try to breach open the door, my cover would be blown. Iris said, roughly scratching the back of his head. Kane let out a loud roar releasing all of the backed up tension within him. Screaming at the top of his lungs he settled down at the cot beside Iris. After a brief moment, Kane calmed down and rested his back on the wall in a relaxed posture. Just what did I got myself into? He asked to himself. It's a game, an adult game that some older children play. It's called 15 minutes in the bliss in your language, roughly translating. Iris said. Defined bliss, Ken inquired. He feared the implications of Iris' answers. It's when two couples go into a dark room and they get intimate with each other so they can cop. Okay, I get it. It's basically seven minutes in heaven. Shit, I am in a game of seven minutes in heaven. Ken distressingly said as he soon realized his circumstance. Well, I don't mind doing it with you. Iris confessed. Really, Iris? You and me? Together? Ken said bewildered by the vampire's statement. Iris leaned closer and gently cusped Cairn's hand with hers. She stared her amber eyes to the midnight-colored eyes of the engineer lovingly with desire. The African was deeply mesmerized by Iris' feminine grace as he felt his soul being slowly wrapped to her whims. No, 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 you won't seduce me like last time. I beat you once. I can beat you again vampire. He snapped back to reality to protest against her alluring advances. Seduce you? No, I am not even trying to my dear Nightman. I don't even have to mesmerize you with my powers to wrap you around my little finger. I saw it in your eyes. You desire me. You want me. You need me. Iris continued her tempting assault on Cairn's purity. I rather throw myself headfirst off that window right now. Cairn objected. Don't even try my dear Nightman. I can just gaze at you right now and have my way with you, then leave your corpse to the rats. She taunted. You. You wouldn't dare. After all you have done and all we have done for you, you would just throw away all that good will away for a snack on my blood? Lieutenant Rose will know of this, then the youth would know of this. We will never forgive you. How could they suspect me? All I had to do was feign naivety and act all bewildered by your wondrous technologies to gain your people's trust. Besides, there's thousands of rogues, monsters, and other unsavory individuals roaming the streets tonight as we speak. Terrors. With a much worse sense of humor than mine. Iris sneered. Ken recoiled further away from Maris as he absorbed her proclamation, until he soon realized that the vampire was actually trying to banter with him in an exchange of pleasantries. He then erupted in laughter as he couldn't believe that the vampire which is capable of producing such a clever play on comedy. For a second Iris, I thought you were serious on biting me again. That was great. Excellent Iris. Bravo. Ken chuckled clapping his hands to congratulate her. Do not worry, my dear. I will only bite you if you agree to it. I don't want to see such a handsome fellow like you go through such pain from a vampire's bite after what I saw you go through. Are you really that concerned for me and did you just call me handsome? Yes, I mean no. I mean, yes, I do find you handsome. Really? Well, let me just say, remember the first time I bet you? Yeah, back in your old place. I was the last man standing in my squad and I was holding out for help to arrive. Ken recalled. When I bet you, 
I also added a special magical effect on my bite that allows me to see through the memories of the person I am biting. You said that on Dr. Hana's report. Go on. Well I saw your memories. Your days with you family so lovingly to observe, your days in college on how hard you worked on that thesis of yours, that competition on theoretical engineering that you won the penultimate prize to. I was kind of disappointed I didn't win best prize. But the judges told me it was pretty close. Then I saw the hard work you have underwent during your basic training and after that, how much you risked your life one day to shield a friend. You saw it didn't you? The Battle of Perun's Pass? Yes. Yes I did. It was so brave of you to dig a trench for him while you were under fire, but he died on my hands. I could still remember the blood that day. His mother blamed me for his death. Ken despondently raised his voice. He couldn't bear to relive that moment. The man he dug a trench for had his whole life ahead of him, just like him, only to be snuffed away by a burst of rifle fire. He began to return to his previous frazzled state clutching his hands and roughly scratching the skin of his head. Before he could let out another scream, Iris placed her finger on his soft cherry-colored lips. But at least he didn't die alone. Most people here in Gleesia would have flee at the sound of your guns. Yet you didn't. You were there on his last hours. That is very heroic of you. She cooed. Ken began to crack his eyes with drops of tears as he sat on that bed emotionally breaking down from the shell shock from his experience during his previous tours of duty. His memories were all overseen and relived by Iris and her magical memory melding biting powers that he came to the conclusion that Iris is trying to manipulate him. So what now? Am I now your thrall? Your slave? Do I have to feed you fresh cattle every day? He mockingly asked her whilst he fought his tears. No, you do not have to do all of that. I would never ask you to do that. Iris grabbed Ken's chin and made him turn his head to her direction so she can make eye contact. You remind me of me. I reminded you about yourself? Ken asked. I am a very studious woman just like you. I gathered as much knowledge about the magical arts just as you studied how your machines work and how to build them. I had a caring family until my father and mother were killed by hunters just as the same when your parents died one by one from sickness. I could feel the same amount of loss just like yours or perhaps maybe much more than your lost back in Perun's Pass. Remember that necklace? That used to be my father's. You know nothing about us. Ken roared. Then teach me about you. All of you. Iris assertively demanded. Why should I? Ken continued to roar. Because I love you. You clever night skinned piece of ass. Iris confessed in a loud shout for her. She needed to get her bottled up feelings out to there. Ken couldn't believe what he has just heard from her. This Gleesian, this alien, this vampire, Iris Kadahagan is in love with him. Her brief stay with the youth soldiers and she has begun to develop feelings for him. He has to admit it but he does notice. Based on what she told about herself they shared the same life story. And now they are both together now alone with their own vulnerable emotions in display with one another. Is that all true? Ken asked. His tone of voice descended from its bitter roaring to a soft quiet hush. Yes, my love. Come here. Iris caressed his cheek and leaned over and threw her lips with his. For one long minute, the two enjoyed each other's caress. Every waking moment they slowly grew closer their arms grasping for the other's body as they pulled each other closer till they could feel each other's heartbeat that rhythmically beat rapidly the longer they stayed close to one another. You have a heartbeat, Ken whispered to her ear noticing the supposedly undead creature is anything but dead. It beats for you, Iris whispered back. Perhaps you aren't dead inside after all. He softly beamed. I also do enjoy playing around with that grenade launcher of yours. It was so much fun shooting magical grenades out of it. Especially when I was doing with those damn burning horsemen. Perhaps I will lend it to you again since you're the magic expert here. He giggled before deepening his embrace with Iris. In Ken's thoughts right now. Perhaps being kicked upstairs for some 7 minutes in, or 15 minutes in bliss was a blessing in disguise. He has found a significant other who intimately in a rather creepy way shares his sentiments. 
feelings and values, and also, he is now away from the noisy ruckus of the jubilee below. The party. We need to go back. He alarmingly shouted destroying the tranquility of their intimate moment. Oh come on, we were just about to get to the fun part. She teased. Well, we both don't want to get in trouble with Samantha. Plus, you still need to kiss up with high command to get your family necklace back. Ken reasoned. You are right. Iris admitted. Perhaps another time we can share ourselves alone. Agreed but let's keep this between us. I don't want anyone else to know. Now how the hell are we going to get out of here? I don't trust these Tyrians to come back and unbar the door for us. Ken said. He began to examine his surroundings for a logical means of escape. He tried to force open the barred door in the hopes the obstruction would have weakened over time through brute force but to no avail. He then walked across the small room towards the window which is small enough for a him and anyone smaller to jump out from, but the fall was about 5 meters which would most likely risk a moderate injury. He turned back to the cot the room had provided and tested its soft thickness. It was no good, it was a shoddily made bed my earth standards and would do little effect on cushioning his fall. My dear Kane. May I ask is there anyone outside the window that could see us from the streets? Iris asked. He turned back to the window and scouted out the streets below him. It's all clear, he said. The vampire stood up from the bed and walked next to him and grabbed his hand. Close your eyes and take a deep breath dear. Iris softly told him. With his eyelids embracing the delicate surface of his irises, Cain prepared for whatever magical spells the vampire has in store for him. Conjuring a discreet amount of mana from her body's reserves, it swirled around Iris and due to her holding his hand, also surrounded the Nigerian. She looked down to the streets beyond the window and focused her gaze on a spot of the cobblestone road, with a thought of her will, Iris alongside Cain magically teleported themselves down to the streets below safely. After they have landed and gained their footing, Iris quickly turned her head around her surroundings to see if there were no witnesses to her magic. Fortunately, there was not a single soul in sight that she could detect with her senses. Relieved she turned back to Cairn. You can open your eyes now. Iris said. I felt like I was flying for a second. Hey we're on the ground now. Cairn commented. We must not keep Samantha waiting. Let's go. Iris said as she pushed open the front door of the drunken bastard. Dash meanwhile, earlier downstairs by the stage, Dash. The play retelling the legend of King Kool Delstla Aija was going fantastic if Samantha judged the crowd's expressions correctly. The hired entertainment that Luna hired for the show were doing a superb job diverting the masses away from their daily worries. The bard would hum witty rhymes that matched seamlessly with every verse. His songs and poems of heroes and legendary beasts would be complemented by the theatre troupe's artistic renditions of the bard's words. Our hero waited, till the time is true, then twirled and spun, struck Hallbone right through, recited the bard. In guard Hallbone, said the actor playing as King Kuldel. He began to slash his wooden sword to his taller colleague dressed in intimidating grey armour that is shaped to form a skeleton's ribs complete with a matching helmet to formed like a skull wearing a sinisterly crafted crown. His sword play was less of a martial art or any form of a practical fighting style and more of an elegantly choreographed dancing with a sword most likely used to entertain the crowd rather than have any value in a real fight. Ha, huh, your might is no match for me King Caldo. After I beat you, I will turn all of the people of this world into my slaves. The actor playing Allbone haughtily declared, as expected the audience jeered to the villain. He thrust and slashed his sword crude movements due to the limitations of his bulky armor but the act made up for it by making it look like that his sword playing has emphasis on sheer brute force rather than speedy finesse, a classic contrast. As Allbone barbarically swung his sword wildly, Kuldel dodged the wooden blade via delicately timed weaves followed by a spectacularly impractical backflip. However, as the act positioned his feet for his landing, me misjudged his timing and the distance between him and the ground, his feet landed clumsily and misaligned to the proper footing. Caldell's face was painted in the state of being struck with sharply inflicted pain as he knelt down clutching his sprained leg. His colleague, 
who was still performing the fencing moves, clumsily tripped over his massive body on top of his colleague, landing arms first. The audience let out a loud gasp as they saw the actors collapse to the ground, their facial and body language betraying their broken state. The bard's playful rhyming and strumming of his lute was abruptly stopped as he rushed into the stage and grabbed his colleagues. Ah, intermission, please have a snack and a drink, we will all be right back, the bard declared. A stage and hurriedly pulled the mechanism for the makeshift theatre drapes as the bard and Luya rushed in to aid the fallen actors. Crocker and Samantha also intervened by lending their strength as they carried the injured to the backstage. Ah, 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 my leg. It hurts, winced the Caldell actor as he settled down on a chair. He kicked up his feet and pointed to his right foot to indicate where the damage was. My hand, I can't move it, the burly Auburn actor complained. Just use your other arm, the bird ordered. You know I suck at holding things with my left hand. I can't do it boss. I am sorry, the actor reluctantly apologized. Oh no, we were just about to do the finale. Luya dreadfully said. He began to walk around the tiny backstage room worriedly. Hey, LT what hap? Ken and Iris barged into the room unexpectedly behind them. SHSH shut up. I need to think. Luya snapped. The youth soldiers were taken aback by the suddenly embittered dwarf, slowly stepping back by his rage. Sam knew it is wise not to try and reason with the dwarf lest she risks escalating his anger, at least for now. As she stepped back, Samantha examined the rest of the backstage. It was makeshift space with a drawer and a mirror that the entertainers would use to groom themselves before their gigs. There was a rack filled with the various outrageous costumes the actors would wear on stage. Alongside the clothing were the props that were dumped carelessly into a disorganized pile. She turned her eyes to the actors. The man in the Auburn costume was around the same build as Crocker's body and the Caldell actor had sported a red-colored short-haired wig. Then it dawned at her. I got a crazy idea, Samantha proclaimed to everyone. What? Like that fire golem last time? Ken asked. You fought a fire golem? Luya added. Yes. And yes everyone. Crocker. She pointed to her second in command. You and the big guy are around the same body build am I correct? The Auburn actor stood up from his chair and walked beside the Brit to compare themselves. He is a little bit beefier than me if I say so myself, but yeah, around the same build, the actor nodded, and Caldell is a redhead so I presume? Samantha asked. Yes, that's what the legends and the historical accounts depict him as. Redheaded, the bard confirmed. Okay so here is my plan. Me and Crocker will take your actor's place for the last stretch of the play. She proposed. Really? But you barely know the script. Luya replied. Well there isn't really any much dialogue from here on out anyway. The bard argued. The audience outside began to roar and shout from the other side. Bring em out. Bring em out. They chanted. Well it looks like we don't got much of a choice then. Give them your clothes quick. Luya a caved. Dash some hasty costume changes later. Dash. So, how's that dress of yours? Crocker asked, now cladded in the all bone armor costume. A bit loose on the arms but breathable. How about yours? Samantha said. She a grayish colored gamson with a few pieces of maneuverable leather armor that covered her elbows, legs, and chest. I hate this shit. I can barely move a muscle. Crocker complained. All right, actors. Get on stage, pushed the bard. He physically shoved the two outside the coverage of the stage's curtains exposing them to the audience who were eagerly awaiting the continuation of the play's finale. And so, our hero battled Allbone with all of his bravery. For the fate of the world is in the balance if Allbone triumphs to feed on his vain glory, the bard sang. The two began to swing their provided prop swords at each other to simulate fighting. Yet Samantha, Deep down inside felt like something was missing. Their sword play wasn't as elegant and choreographed as the actors who they replaced. Instead it was more of a mundane blocking and parrying drill for men-at-arms. Even the stoic stares from the crowd compared to the joyous cheering confirmed her fears, like a bow who leaves after love's first spurt. So the cool Dell would all bone. Then its foul heart hurt, the bard sang. Taking from his prompt, 
Samantha lightly thrusted her wooden sword to Crocker's chest. Upon impact, Crocker feigned injury, stepping back from the sheer force of the blow. You think you could take me down that easily? Take this. Crocker awkwardly improvised an intimidating voice. His normal guttural cockney growling was broken down like if he was being struck with some stage fright. She couldn't blame him. She had to order him to wear that bulky armor since Luna had threatened them earlier during their costume change of cutting down their pay if the night ended in disappointedly. The soft hooting of jeers grew slowly louder at their mediocre performance. Samantha's resolve began to tremble as she continued to parry Crocker's attacks. She could see Luna, who is hanging behind the curtain's crack and sheer red embarrassment in his hasty decision. Ken and Iris' faces were of awkward smiles that they tried to encourage her with, but she could easily see through the ruse. The lieutenant quickly deterred one of Crocker's slashes so she can reach into his arms and pull him close for a deadlock. We are losing them, Samantha whispered. Well it was your idea, Crocker mentioned. I thought it was good idea at the time. Samantha defended herself. Well it was a shit idea. Any ideas? I don't want to run back to New Albany while being pelted with tomatoes. It's bad for PR. Crocker closed his eyes and thinked of a way he can salvage this problem for his team. He would be damned if the team does indeed get pelted out by the Tyrians who they are just beginning to make friends with. If only he could just be ridden of the stupidly unwieldy armor he is wearing. Rag, I want out of this goddamn clothes. He roared as he broke of the deadlock and backed away from Samantha. The Brit began to viciously tear off his armor piece by piece, starting from his helmet, gauntlets, chaucers, breastplate and then finally his greaves until he was left shirtless and barefoot with only apparel he is wearing is his camouflaged pants. The audience gasped at the sudden change of events. Their jeers stopped as their emotions were replaced with utter dread with a sense of curiosity of this unexpected theatrical twist. Crocker. Stay in character. Samantha whispered. Even she is flustered by Crocker's explosion. I all bone the steel butcher do not need armor and a sword to kill this challenger. Crocker yelled. Come, King called all of the Stlae agents. Let us settle this like real men. He proudly declared whilst sneaking a wink directed to Samantha. He began to flex his muscles to the crowds in a show of masculine exhibitionism. The sweat that was excreted from the cumbersome armor only further highlighted his sculpted muscles and marry tattoos. Go Ogre Breaker rooted a young commoner woman from the back. She was clearly infatuated by Lewis' macho figure. Other women just like her followed her cheering until every woman, young and old, noble and commoner began to whistle to her tune. For the men. The grown-ups grew green with envy over his muscles whilst the children daydreamed of having a body such as Crocker's. He almost got caught up at the moment if it wasn't for Ken heckling him to get back to the show. Before I continue on with battle, I believe we need some more, appropriate music for this monumental occasion. Crocker humbly suggested. He reached into his pockets to grab his smartphone before twiddling his fingers to the music player. He tapped on one of his playlists called Fight Slash Workout Music and tapped one of the songs he deemed the most appropriate before passing the phone to Kane. Play this on your drone. Now, are you sure about this? Kane asked, still clueless to what exactly his brother in arms has in planned. Just do it. We can't lose the momentum. Crocker demanded, his voice nearly being blanketed by the roaring of the crowd. The engineer immediately grabbed Crocker's smartphone. He connected the phone to his drone via Bluetooth connection, the wireless means of communication for his droid which is based off of a police surveillance drone was meant to connect the droid through a Bluetooth microphone which a speaker can talk through such as declaring police ordinances, announcements and yelling at criminals that they have spotted them committing a felony. After a momentary connection, Kane played Crocker's chosen tunes. It was a strong and intense symphony of strings and drums that flow like a raging storm in its strongest fury. Perfect for a climatic clash as the play depicted. You know Caldell, I could have easily killed you from the very moment you were born. Crocker, 
speaking as Auburn said. Then why wait until now Auburn? After I have gained the strength and power to defeat you? Questioned Samantha playing as King Caldwell. She is still struggling to understand what exactly Crocker's plan was and how exactly is the music from a classic fighting video game is going to help them. But if she can admit about anything, his plan is working since the audience is at a lively mood thanks to Crocker pumping up the crowd, so she might as well play along. I was waiting for you to become stronger. Crocker menacingly said, he postured himself into a fighting stance, slightly bending his knees and bringing up his fists. Samantha threw away her prop sword and followed suit with her own battle stance. Meanwhile the bard was flabbergasted at the abrupt deviation from the script. He couldn't believe that the new understudies would improvise their lines so bizarrely to the point of being completely alien. Maintaining his professionalism, the bard continued to sing his verses from the script. Alas, Steel Butcher, the demon heaved its foul girth, let loose a roar and knocked any soul down to the earth. The bard sang whilst playfully plucking his lute. Crocker approached Samantha with a flurry of jabs aimed for her. With her instincts kicking in, Samantha blocked her head with her forearms. Every strike was thankfully softened with a split-second hesitation so that the Brit doesn't actually hurt his commanding officer, but to the Tyrians, who have never heard of the term stunts it looked so uber realistic. Having enough of his punches, the lieutenant invoked her hand-to-hand -hand combat training, and began to redirect Crocker's avalanche of punches and twisted bot of his upper limbs inwards to his body in order to demobilize his offensive. Tekken? That fighting game? Really? Samantha asked. Yes, do you know any martial arts CO? Don't worry. I can take them. Crocker asked back. Some Krif Maga and a bit of gymnastics for flexibility. She answered. Good. Crocker smiled. He pushed Samantha away with his shoulders, breaking her arm lock. Recovering from the forced push, Samantha recollected her thoughts and reviewed her scenario again. If Crocker wants to fight like a fighting game character, then she might as well fight like one too. She reformed her stance by putting her left foot and arm forward proudly while in contrast reserving her right arm and leg in a more relaxed position. Then she made her approach by unleashing a flurry of her own fists, albeit also slightly hesitated so she doesn't hurt her second in command back. Crocker weaved through Samantha's attacks with alarm. He didn't expect his CO to shoot out so much fisticuffs in such speeds. He had to back up a few steps to get some room between him and Samantha due to his longer reach, before he could feel like Samantha was about to let up her attempt to poke at Crocker's defenses. Samantha let loose a flying overhead kick with her right leg, catching him off guard that he became unbalanced and he tripped down to the ground. The crowd began to roar louder at the exciting fight being presented to them. What? Too much for you all Boone? Samantha acted. Spitting on the ground, Crocker quickly got back up to his feet and reformed his posture again. Impressive, but you will die here slay Aegean. Crocker vainly said, he grappled Samantha's arms to leave her body open for a dosage of several boxing punches before pushing he pushed up his brute strength for a devastating throw. Remembering her hand-to-hand -hand teachings, the lieutenant relaxed her body muscles, breathed out and went with the flow of the force of the throw as her body crashed to the ground. The fall didn't hurt as much as it should thanks to the Yukimi technique and to be fair in her situation. The fight was staged after Crocker unhanded her. Samantha kicked her feet up enthusiastically showing to the astonished crowd that she wasn't in any way hurt by the throw. The Tyrians have never seen someone take such a brutish attack and come back from it like if it was nothing too damaging. Ah, I will, never give up, Samantha cried. The heroism she displayed under the hat of King Caldell was returned with even more uproar from the audience. Crocker roared again and charged towards her. In character to the relentless nature of the steel butcher in his quest for blood and murder. Scorpion Sting. Samantha shouted. She moved her right leg backwards in almost 180 degree curve that the heel of her foot would make contact with Crocker's unguarded chest. Stunned by the clever attack. He stumbled backwards, leaving himself open once again to another barrage of Samantha's attacks. With the cheering starting to get into her, Samantha decided she is going to end the epic final battle with several spectacular moves. 
she started her finishing combo with a right leg roundhouse kick followed by a downwards axe kick that stomped the ground so thunderously that it caused the stage to emit a tremor. For her second attack, Samantha swapped downwards before thrusting upwards for an uppercut that she took care to only graze Crocker's chiseled frame. The Brit recoiled backwards at the force of the blow before he collapsed on his knees. Allbone the Steel Butcher, begone from this world and never come back. Samantha yelled to the top of her lungs. She was starting to immerse herself very deeply to the heroic character of King Caldwell to the point she was enjoying her acting debut more than she had initially expected. She quickly grabbed the prop sword she had discarded earlier. Then with a quick swing, she decapitated Crocker killing all bone once and for all. Lewis collapsed to the wooden stage floor limp as he played dead. End of block 1